Senators. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? President, I, I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? I call the clerk. Yes, President. Committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. Uh, Minister. Uh, thank you, President. I declare that the Climate Change Bill 2022 and the Climate Change Consequential Amendments Bill 2022 are urgent bills, and I move that these bills be considered urgent bills. I understand because this is an urgent motion, it needs to be put immediately, so it's my intention to move that. So the question is, um, Senator Birmingham. Pre President, can I just, uh, for the benefit of the chamber, um, just seek uh, the minister to provide an explanation of the consequences of what the motion means? Yes, I believe the minister can do that by leave if she so chooses. Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, President. Um, the consequences of this motion are that we would be able to ensure that the uh, bill, um, both of those bills, progress uh, within the standing orders. It does us, allow us additional um, procedural flexibility, but within the standing orders, to ensure that these bills are dealt with in a timely fashion. So the question is that the I mean, uh, Senator Birmingham. President, again, if I can uh, just seek indulgence in terms of a little further um, understanding of what that procedural flexibility may be. I note these bills are listed as the first item of government business for the day uh, already, uh, and, so, uh, and so this is clearly not a motion to change uh, the order of government business, uh, and, so, uh, and so it's not clear uh, entirely from, uh, from the manager of government business in the Senate's answer. Uh, as to or explanation as to precisely what flexibility they are seeking to utilise from this motion. I'll advise the minister that she can once again seek leave. Thank you. Well, it's also are you, uh, uh, minister. Sorry, sorry are you seeking leave. I am seeking yes, leave. Thank, thank you, you uh, thank President. Uh, this uh, having the bills declared urgent bills means that within the standing orders, we're not seeking to extend uh, time at this stage. Although we will would note that we did not. Um, yesterday during the, the day that we usually get the most government time get to these bills at all. Um, we do want to send a signal to the chamber that we are going to progress these bills, that we will progress these bills. This allows us some capacity, if needed, if, if we are not progressing these bills, to manage that within the standing orders. But we are not seeking to gag or, or take away anyone's ability to speak on the bills, but we do want to send a message that we are serious about getting these bills done. Uh, and this allows us some flexibility if we were uh, to uh, need to um, move motions to progress the bill. We would have to win those motions uh, as they were put, um, but it does give us some procedural flexibility for that. So the question is, as Senator Roberts. More explanation, please, from the minister on what that flexibility would, could entail. Uh, Please. The minister is free to seek leave to um, give that explanation, Senator Roberts. Minister. Please. Yep. Um, leave well, is granted. Again, uh, I, get, I guess the example I'd give you: if the bills are not progressing, i.e., you know, we are having a filibuster going on, we would have some flexibility within within the standing orders um, to progress that, or to move motions to try and progress that and keep the bill going. That's essentially what this allows us to do. So the question is, the, uh, Senator Birmingham. 
Thanks, uh, thanks, President. Uh, am I able to speak to this motion? Uh, you can seek leave. I seek leave to uh, to make a short statement. Then, if there is not is, uh, uh, one minute, is I believe has been leave has been granted. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bennett. President. I thank uh, I thank the chamber. Uh, well, President, this is quite an extraordinary uh, motion for the government to come in and move at these very earliest days of consideration of legislation from the government. Uh, the Senate sat for the previous two sitting weeks, uh, during which uh, we largely dealt with ceremonial business, we largely dealt with address and reply business, uh, and, uh, and in that time uh, we cooperated indeed with the government for the passage of one urgent bill that uh, they had identified. We're now just really only on the second real sitting day uh, of the Senate getting down to genuine business, and the government is coming in uh, seeking in an opaque way, without prior notice, uh, to seek to put in place arrangements that it says will give extra flexibility, then saying we're not intending to use that at present. Well, President, we should just be getting down to business. It's on the notice paper, getting into debating the bill. Uh, and then if the government wants to move motions later, they should do so in the ordinary way, uh, not through this very unconventional practice. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. So the question is, a motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, I call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one, Climate Change Bill 2022 and an associated bill, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Dunham. Thank you, uh, President. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> following that, uh, which, as the leader of the opposition in the Senate, characterised um, it's uh, you know my opportunity to put on record the coalition's position on this bill. Uh, but um, having, as has already been pointed out, the opportunity for two weeks to, uh, in the last sitting fortnight, to examine such matters instead of others, we now have this being considered an urgent piece of legislation. But uh, that is passing strange, given. Uh, what this legislation actually does. I think it's important to reiterate points that have been made in the other place by the Shadow Minister for Energy, Ted O'Brien, on this, and that is that this legislation is bad legislation and indeed reflects bad policy. Um, how this legislation is characterised by those opposite and those who have supported it is misleading to those in the community uh, calling for action on climate and indeed the actual impacts this legislation will have on the matter around climate change and uh, what uh, the impact of carbon emissions and the amount there is in the atmosphere uh, is also misleading in the debate. Um, I think as we consider the legislation that uh, the Labor government has brought in, it's also important to consider that the promise around legislating an emissions reductions target of 43 per cent, uh, which we oppose legislating. Uh, there was another promise made, and that was a promise around cutting the cost of electricity for Australian households and Australian businesses. A promise that, uh, as soon as we arrived here to start conducting business on the first day of Parliament, uh, this 47th Parliament, it was a promise that was abandoned. $275 a year by the year 2025, something pledged 97 times in the lead-up to the election and not mentioned once since. So, two promises, one on emissions reduction being legislated, a target being legislated, and the government is delivering on that promise by legislating it. It is something we said we would not do and therefore oppose, uh, for reasons I'll outline shortly, uh, enshrining in legislation. But another promise concurrently which has been abandoned, completely wiped off the books, as if no one will notice. And today of all days, of course, when the Reserve Bank of Australia will no doubt hand down a decision which will spell out further pain for Australian households when it comes to their monthly budgets, mortgage rates going up, power prices going up, food, fuel, all of those going up, but instead we're focusing on legislating a target to reduce emissions, which, frankly speaking, won't do what those opposites say it will. So it does really, though, demonstrate uh, the priorities of this government and, indeed, how close to the dining table conversations, the living room conversations uh, that are taking place out there in Australia. Um, you know, I'm pretty sure that households universally are talking about the impact on their weekly budget, uh, that power prices are having, uh, that 
fuel prices are having, and they want a government to act on those things. But instead, here we are in this first proper sitting week where we can deal with business talking about this issue. And as I say, that broken promise around not dealing with power prices but instead only dealing with a reduction in emissions being enshrined in legislation uh, is going to be extremely evident to all as time marches on. And every time people look at this legislation and the debate that's taken place, they'll be reminded of it. So, uh, it is very telling that, of course, uh, Labor have abandoned that promise and, in doing so, abandoned uh, most of Australia, those people who are going to struggle with those bills. And we know already that power prices, as of June this year, are $208 higher than they were in the same month last year. And, of course, it's going to get much worse. Um, it's also important to point out a couple of the points that were made by uh, my colleague in the other place, Ted O'Brien, the member for Fairfax and Shadow Minister for Energy, that this, this bill isn't needed at all. And it's a point that was actually made by uh, the relevant minister, the Minister for Energy and Climate Change, Minister Bowen, who said, and I quote, we do not need it, referring to this legislation. And we've also been clear that this legislation is not required. Points made by the government themselves in relation to the necessity or otherwise of introducing this bill. It's symbolic. It's tokenistic. It was a point that was made by the Greens environment spokesperson in an interview yesterday, that this is purely symbolic. It doesn't actually do anything, at least insofar as the primary bill is concerned. So that being the case, not needing to enshrine it, why are we doing this? Um, there's a lot of things that this bill doesn't do. Sadly, um, one of the things it doesn't do is it won't e end green lawfare. Uh, we only saw yesterday in the Australian Financial Review the Australian Greens have said that uh, the 43 per cent target being enshrined in legislation won't end climate wars. And uh, Again, I refer to the uh, comments of the Greens environment spokesperson, S uh, Senator Hanson Young, who said the climate wars will not end this week with the passage of this climate bill, which was something we were promised would happen. We're going to end the climate wars so long as climate, the Labor's climate bill uh, keeps approving new coal and gas. End of quote. So there's another thing this bill doesn't do. Um, it doesn't reduce emissions. It doesn't end the climate wars. It doesn't bring down power prices. In fact, quite the opposite, I expect, Mr. Acting Deputy President. So, having looked at those things, this bill doesn't do, despite promises made before the election, promises made during this debate. Let's have a look at some of the things it does do. And one of the great places to start looking at some of these issues is in the dissenting report handed down by coalition senators uh, on the Senate inquiry into this bill. And I think it's pretty important to note that this bill and the consequential amendments bill will be pretty damaging uh, when it comes to the economy um, and particularly regional Australia. It's going to have a massively adverse impact on jobs, on infrastructure, on major projects, on national security, on the well-being of rural and regional communities and even the day-to-day -day existence of many Australians. Household budgets, like we were talking about before. It's important to point out also that they've, uh, the government, in drafting this legislation, have ignored, patently ignored the experience of other jurisdictions that have gone on to legislate emissions reductions targets. Um, you only have to look at uh, Europe to see what has happened there, and there are a range of examples uh, again, outlined in the Coalition Senator's dissenting report to the uh, committee inquiry, um, where in the United Kingdom um, we've seen a range of critical infrastructure projects either delayed or uh, completely blocked because of green lawfare, something we knew would happen. We've predicted this and we are warning Australians when this bill passes this is going to be a green light for this sort of activity. In the UK, crucial projects like their HS2 high-speed rail network delayed because of legislated emissions reductions targets, major road projects, the third runway at Heathrow Airport delayed for years because of enshrined legislated targets for emissions reduction. In France, of course, we have their sovereign government being told uh, that they'll be subject to penalties if they don't take necessary measures on climate change by the end of 2022 uh, by one of their courts. So we have the judiciary telling the legislature and the executive what to do. And it's no different in Germany, 
uh, when in April of last year German courts ordered the government to increase its emissions reductions targets. So you've got courts who are not elected, as far as I am aware, uh, by the people telling those elected by the people what to do. This is the byproduct of legislating these targets, and this is why the coalition has sounded the alarm bell and uh, opposes these moves. Um, I think also another telling uh, factor in this debate is the fact that no modelling was actually undertaken um, by government departments in preparation for the introduction of this legislation. Uh, one of the signature promises by the Labor government alongside that $275 power price reduction that was promised but abandoned. No modelling. The Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry um, and also the Department of uh, Climate Change, Energy and the Environment each testified and, astonishingly, none of them. Neither of those departments were asked to do any modelling on the impacts on rural and regional Australia or the economy. What a revelation. It's uh, unbelievable. And indeed, the Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry was not even formally consulted on the consequential amendments bill prior to its introduction. Evidence tendered at the committee. Infrastructure Australia has also admitted to the committee that it could not yet even explain the consequences of the two bills and how they should make, the decisions, make decisions when trying to balance environmental and economic impacts, something I think Australians expect us to do to maintain balance between economy and environment, because of course we need a functioning economy to live, as well as a healthy environment. And of course, then turning to the uh, entity Export Finance Australia, uh, who are certain to struggle now when it comes to its vital work um, in supporting projects in countries right across the Pacific, something we as a nation here have a responsibility to do. And the same could be said of the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility too. So with that little amount of work done, um, no consultation, no regard for unintended consequences, uh, no concern for the people of rural and regional Australia who will likely bear the brunt of these enshrined targets and uh, the increased cost of living, the impact on jobs and the economy. Um, and indeed, perhaps, of course, people who are going to be forced into energy poverty as power prices continue to skyrocket. And again, I remind senators and those listening of the broken promise to reduce power prices by $275 annually by 2025, a promise broken so early on in the term. And of course, there are other considerations related to the government's response to managing the environment, be it the 30 per cent of land locked up by 2030. How are they going to do it? What are they going to do to assist in reaching these enshrined targets? What impact will that have? on farmers and other land users, how are they going to manage these uh, uh, commitments they've made and the impacts that they will then have on Australians seeking to make an honest dollar to pay their bills, the bills that are going up. These things have not been considered at all. And the National Farmers Federation President Fiona Simpson said in relation to this land lock-up proposal, locking up land is not the answer. It has the potential to have a reverse effect on biodiversity and with a lack of land management allowing feral animals and plants to flourish, uh, heightening the risk from fire, drought and floods. And of course, we know fires are a major contributor to carbon emissions. Uh, and so we need to um, consider these things, which I just don't think the government have done. So look, uh, as was stated by um, the member for Fremantle in the other place, uh, the government have made it very clear this is the beginning and not the end. And that, I think, is an important note for us to hover on. I've outlined my concerns and the, the opposition's concerns around this legislation. Um, they say it's just targets. It's just targets in legislation. Don't worry. It'll be OK. We've heard about other jurisdictions uh, where targets are enshrined in legislation, and we know what impact that has. They're not made up examples. They happened. There are courts ordering governments to do things which were not part of a mandate, which have not been tested by the people of those countries. They are things being forced on governments. They have an impact on the cost of living, something we should all be concerned about. There's not been much debate in here about this. 
The government hasn't brought forward legislation to deal with those issues. Singularly, we are dealing with this, enshrining targets in legislation to reduce emissions. So, as the member for Fremantle says, this is beginning, not the end. What's next? Where do we go from here? When do we start striking a balance with concern for people's ability to pay their power bills, which are going up in my home state of Tasmania, 12 per cent increase in one hit? And we're a renewable energy generator in Tasmania. Hydro, wind, solar, that's what we rely on down there, but we've got a 12 per cent increase. Where does it end? Where do the targets end? You only have to have a look at other, other uh, policy proposals, uh, legislative proposals that are being considered at the moment around, say, the safeguards mechanism. I'd love to hear the government provide a guarantee that not one job will be lost in some of those uh, trade-exposed and emissions-intensive industries, in some of those emitters across the country, particularly in rural and regional communities. In northern Tasmania, we have five or six of them that uh, cumulatively employ 2,000 people. I'd love a commitment that not one job will be lost, but instead I don't think we will get that. I think we'll have a focus on bringing emissions down with no regard for the economy, with no regard for those jobs, and indeed, as I've outlined here, no regard for what impact this will have on Australian households, their ability to pay their bills, to keep the lights on, to keep warm in winter in places like Tasmania, to keep food on the table. This bill, sadly, is worse than it seems, both sets of bills, uh, and I warn senators to consider carefully before they cast their vote. We will oppose this bill. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Deputy President. I rise to speak to the climate change bill, and I note the presence of school kids um, up in the gallery because uh, this is relevant for them as it is uh, for all of us and the species we share this world with. From the day that this climate change bill was released, the Greens have been warning what happens if the 43 per cent passes today and new coal and gas fields are opened up the next day. In the month between this bill passing the House of Representatives to this first day when it's now being debated in the Senate, the Minister for Resources, Madeleine King, has released 10 new oil and gas leases, covering 47,000 square kilometres of our oceans. And then, straight out of the climate change deniers book, she described carbon dioxide as, quote, the bubbles in your soda water or out of your soda stream. So, you know, we've got to keep it in balance how we think about carbon dioxide, end quote. Secondly, the Minister for the Environment refused to block a gas-fired fertiliser plant in WA's sacred site of the Burrup Peninsula, whose chemicals would erode the 40,000-year-old rock art made by Murujuga ancestors and preserved until the present day. Now, of course, the Greens remain committed to the fact that we cannot have climate justice without First Nations justice. Thirdly, just last night, the Prime Minister told a Minerals Council dinner here in Parliament House that the government will deliver a predictable transition while giving a nodding reassurance to the fact that Australia will keep selling coal and gas to the world, well, it's predictable, all right, but it maintains the lie to workers that nothing is changing. <laughs> and of course, he went to that dinner instead of the Clean Energy Council function, which was on at the same time. Fourthly, since this bill was introduced um, in the House of Representatives, the Queensland Labor government has approved the expansion of the New Ackland thermal coal mine northwest of Toowoomba on some of, us, of Queensland's richest agricultural soil and farmlands. Now, that approval would increase the mine's operation by more than 60 per cent and would extend its lifespan to 2034, a thermal coal mine. Now, this is a destructive project that will trash some of our best cropping land. It would threaten farmers' groundwater supply and all the while contribute to dangerous climate change. The project has been fought by farmers like Sid and Merrill Plant, who I've personally visited several times. They've fought this uh, proposal for over a decade. Um, they and farmers like them, who've seen their communities gutted, they've ridden the emotional and economic roller coaster of watching their land first racked with drought and then their crops flooded. It's those farmers that should be supported by government. And instead, the Queensland Labor government continues to bend over backwards to appease the fossil fuel lobby. So how any of this squares with Labor's so-called commitment to net zero is an absolute mystery. 
The fact that the Queensland Resources Minister announced the decision late on a Friday with a two-line release shows that they know how shameful it is. But of course, you then remember that both the opposition and the government receive over $10 million in political donations from the fossil fuel industry over the past decade. And you recall how many former ministers and senior advisers go to work in grossly overpaid lobbying roles for fossil fuel companies. Maybe Labor approving more coal and gas mines and neutering their own climate ambition isn't such a mystery after all. Ban political donations from fossil fuel companies and we might get science-based decisions. Because remember that the International Energy Agency has said that Labor's net zero target by 2050 can't be met if just one new coal or gas infrastructure or mine is built. Not one. There are now 114 new coal and gas projects in the development pipeline. So the message is simple. No new coal and gas. Everyone from Twiggy Forest to the Pope is saying it. You can't stop the climate crisis by opening up new coal and gas mines. The Labor Party's target of 43 per cent was set in consultation with political scientists instead of climate scientists, and it's at risk of failing because of new coal and gas. The committee into this bill heard evidence of how setting a 2030 target below what the science requires jeopardises that subsequent net zero target. And because this 43 per cent target aligns more with two degrees of global heating and is not consistent with the Paris Agreement, that pushes more work into later years. If we are wasting more of our very limited carbon budget now, 43 with a weak 43 per cent target, we will have to have faster, deeper emissions cuts later. Even for the risky two degree scenario, Australia would need to reach net zero a few years before 2045 according to ANU climate scientist Nerily Abram, who gave, uh, professor who gave testimony to the committee. Because 43 per cent is not science-based, the knock-on effect of that is that the net zero by 2050 is also not science-based. For that reason, I'll be moving committee of the whole amendments to the bill that will align Australia's targets with the science of what is needed to limit warming to one and a half degrees. And this will eliminate the chance of runaway chain reactions on our climate system that we can no longer rein in. If we aim for two degrees, we're rolling the dice. And there is a very real risk that by releasing that much more heat-trapping energy into our oceans and atmosphere, that we could spark chain reactions beyond human control to rein in once they're unleashed. The bill that we're debating is set above that dangerous two degree limit. So the Australian Greens amendments that will move in committee stage will change the national target to 75 per cent reduction by 2030 and net zero by 2035. That's what the science says we need to do. That's what this parliament should do. We will pass this bill, but we want to see targets increased within this term of parliament. We want to see Australia sign up to the global methane pledge that will see this potent but short-lived greenhouse gas reduced by 30 per cent by 2030. That would be an important first step to prevent the early onset of dangerous planetary heating. Now, the Greens worked with the government to ensure that this bill introduced into the parliament included a no backsliding provision. We wanted to ensure that this legislation was Dutton-proof. And just like we worked with the Gillard government to make ARENA and the CEFC Abbott-proof, and that stood the test of time. We also secured agreement with the government that the climate change authorities' work had to be guided by the temperature goals of the Paris Agreement, not just a mere consideration, which could be trumped like politi by politics like the 43 per cent. Importantly, we ensured that when funding agencies like the Export Finance Authority, Infrastructure Australia and the Northern Australia uh, uh, Infrastructure Facility, when they consider granting money to projects, that they will have to have regard to these targets. This makes it harder for public money to be used to further subsidise coal and gas. Next stop, we'll be tackling the $11.8 billion in public subsidies to fossil fuels that we've had in the budget uh, for at least a decade now. 
and we will be looking at the October budget with a fine tooth comb to identify all of those fossil fuel subsidies. When the government said the country is too poor to afford free childcare or to raise job seeker above the poverty line, it is criminal to be giving away more than $11 billion in free money to polluting companies every year, particularly when those fossil fuel companies often don't even pay their fair share of tax. We've also worked with the government to include in the committee report our shared commitment to working together on ending the use of burning native forests being counted as renewable energy. Mm -hmm. I'm sure my colleague Senator Rice um, will have more to say about that. Crucially, uh, in the committee report, which was chaired by my colleague uh, Senator Hanson Young, we, we uh, exacted support to establish a legislated energy transition authority to make sure that we can look after coal and gas workers. As part of our negotiations on this bill, the government agreed to consider Greens' proposals to support coal and gas workers and communities, including creating publicly funded transition authorities to empower local communities to develop and finance plans to create new jobs and diversify their local industries. Coal workers haven't caused the climate crisis, and they should be looked after so that their communities and their kids can be assured a prosperous future, and they should have a say in what comes next. Coal workers know that coal won't stay in the system for decades. They know that they're going to get screwed over by coal corporations. They just want a clear pathway that will ensure their financial security and keep their communities in place. Now, we took to the election a job-for-job -job guarantee for coal workers so that as we transition off fossil fuels, coal workers would get good jobs at the same pay by enabling their new employers to receive a wage subsidy of up to half the workers' former wage for up to 10 years. It's a very expensive policy, but the Greens are committed to ensuring that no worker is left behind as we transition to a clean energy economy. So through our negotiations, we've improved a weak climate bill. It's still weak. It's still nowhere near enough, but it is a small step in the right direction and the Greens will vote for it. But I will say that we are in solidarity with First Nations communities, with climate scientists, with the global community and with our neighbours in the Pacific that this is the critical decade. And we are resolute that there must be no new coal and gas and a transition off fossil fuels. This could be the climate parliament. We have the numbers to go much further and faster. The only thing standing in the way of more action is this government and their cosy relationship with the fossil fuel sector, who make generous donations to their re-election campaigns, along with the Liberal Party. Using our numbers in the parliament, we will now look to putting further limits on coal and gas pollution. We'll be pushing for the government's reform of the safeguard mechanism to include new coal and gas, and we will fight for a climate trigger in our national environmental laws that stops new coal and gas projects from going ahead. And as always, around the country we will join First Nations people, farmers and community activists fighting giant new coal, oil and gas on their lands and water. We could be creating tens of thousands of jobs right across the country as we establish the industries of the future and become a clean energy export powerhouse. We went to the election with a fully costed sector-by-sector -sector plan of how we would create those jobs, transform our old industries and create new ones. Australia is the sunniest continent on the planet with amazing wind resources and smart, adaptive and innovative minds. These resources and the huge opportunities are being wasted as each year passes. Imagine what could be achieved if Australia's energy is effectively free. Manufacturing could return to our shores again, and we could make green products here instead of exporting the raw materials overseas. Transporting ourselves, our food, our goods with clean electricity instead of imported oil would reduce the cost of everything and enhance our security. This future can happen if we rapidly transition to a clean economy powered by renewable energy and export it to the rest of the world. How? Shift electricity generation to renewables and storage. Increase electricity production to allow the electrification of all households, businesses, transport and industry. Soak up the remaining emissions and move to negative emissions by protecting our forests and landscapes 
and reform our agriculture to draw down carbon from the atmosphere so we can start to return to a safe climate. Critical to our plan is the phase out of coal and gas, and not only from our domestic economy but also for export. And this is why our goal of reaching 700 per cent renewables is critical, because it will allow us to become a renewable energy superpower, developing new export industries and new manufacturing industries, such as green hydrogen, direct transmission of renewable energy and the production of green metals. That plan would also mean the creation of 805,000 new jobs, with 162,000 of those being direct jobs and the remainder being indirect jobs created across the country, particularly in the areas most affected by the transformation, that transformation that we need to reach net zero in the next 13 years. So our plan would not only create more than 800,000 jobs, but it will improve the budget bottom line by, and the PBO says this, $51.9 billion over the decade as we remove those handouts for coal, oil and gas industries and make them pay for the damage that they're causing. As society makes this big switch, the Greens plan supports workers to shift out of coal and into new industries by guaranteeing them employment at the same pay, whilst also lifting income support for those unable to find a new job. The Greens will work to empower local communities to manage the change by developing and financing plans to diversify away from coal and create new jobs and industries as we act on global warming. This is and could be the climate parliament. We are ready to do what the science says is necessary to protect our biosphere and our communities. The question is how powerful the fossil fuel donors are in this building, and that remains to be seen. This fight is not over. We will keep pushing to make sure that not a single coal or gas project is opened, because the science says we just cannot afford to do that. Thank you, President. As I rise to speak on these bills, it is important to note that recently released government data shows that Australia's greenhouse gas emissions increased in 2021. As the current minister, the Hon. Chris Bowen MP, said, this caps off the coalition's record of denial and delay on climate change. The Abbott, Turnbull and Morrison government's legacy on climate change is a lost decade at a time when Australians were crying out for real and significant action. That policy vacuum has a long legacy, and Australia is paying the price. But it's not too late. It's not too late to do the work that should have started a decade ago to make real significant and meaningful action on emissions reductions. In 2022, Australians from all walks of life and from all parts of the country made it clear that they wanted a government that is determined to act on climate change. They voted for action on climate change, and that is what the Albanese Labor government is delivering with this legislation. Labor knows that good climate change and energy uh, good climate and energy policy is also good economic policy. This country has all the resources, the ingenuity, the innovation and inspiration it needs to become a green energy superpower. The Albanese Labor government is determined to grasp the opportunities that the transition to a net zero economy offers us. A future built on a decent, secure and skilled jobs. A future where we lead the world on solutions to the climate challenge rather than being part of the problem. And there is no time to waste. Australians are impatient for action on these issues. In recent times, the incidence of floods, bushfires and drought has increased in intensity and regularity. These results have been catastrophic for tens of thousands of people and their communities. Australians are worried and they're tired of inaction. Labor went to the last election with a detailed plan on climate change, and the Australian people embraced it. We were determined that it should be very clear that a vote for Labor was a vote for real action on climate change. And Australians voted for a emissions reduction target of 43 per cent by 2030 for 82 per cent of the energy going into the grid to be renewable energy by 2030. These bills today reflect Labor's Powering Australia Plan and Paris Agreement's commitments. Commitments that Australian people voted for, commitments that Australian people expect us to keep. 
These bills are about providing the certainty so desperately needed for business, industry, investors and a wider community after a decade of denial, delay and deception on climate change action. With a 2030 target of 43 per cent, this legislation puts Australia on track to reach net zero by 2050. This provides the certainty that is vital to ensuring Australia reaps the economic benefits of the energy transformation that is underway. Powering Australia will deliver 604,000 jobs across the country and will see our energy needs met by 82 per cent renewable energy by 2030. We are legislating the 2030 and 2050 targets because it's best practice to do so and because we are determined to meet those targets. The community is crying out for an energy policy that will end the do-nothing strategy of the previous minister, Angus Taylor, a strategy that has left Australian families dealing with skyrocketing energy prices that are putting a terrible strain on household budgets. Legislating Australia's emissions reduction targets provides certainty to industry, states and territories. And just as importantly, it keeps the promise that we made to the Australian people. It brings Australia into line with countries such as France, Denmark and Spain that have also legislated net zero targets for 2050. Ca uh, countries such as Canada have legislated their 2030 target. The targets we have set is ambitious and our Powering Australia plan makes it achievable. It is important to note that it sets a floor, not a ceiling, on Australia's emissions reduction ambition. The Australian people want their government to step up and deliver on their promises, and they want to be able to be kept informed, not fobbed off. That's why they will be updated every year on the progress that we're making. The minister will be required to report annually to parliament on Australia's progress towards meeting our targets that are set out in the bill. For almost a decade, we have seen the standards of accountability in government eroded. We've had a decade of duck and dodge, fibs and fudging, from the previous government. We are asking Australians to join us in a huge transition as we head to net zero, and they rightly deserve to hear from their government on how it's working towards its goal. That is how accountability actually works. In our first month in office, the Albanese Labor government updated our nationally determined contribution under the Paris Agreement to reflect the target that we were elected to deliver. 43 per cent emissions reduction by 2030 and to set Australia on the path to net zero by 2050. This action sent a message to our friends, to business, to our trading partners and to our neighbours in the Pacific. And for that first time in a decade, Australia has a government that takes climate change seriously, a government that understands the opportunity which, there, which is there and is determined to deliver. The bills are straightforward, positive and powerful. They, respect, they reflect Australia's obligations under the Paris Agreement, and so I urge the members of this chamber to pass this legislation and send a clear and positive message to the people of Australia and to the world that we are taking real action on climate change. That decade of inaction, in fighting and denial is now over. How we manage that transformation will determine the future prosperity of this country, and we are determined to ensure that Australia emerges a stronger, more dynamic and self-reliant nation as we reach net zero. We learned during the toughest periods of the pandemic uh, that, as a country, we need to be more self-sufficient. One of the things that cleaner, cheaper energy will do is to drive advanced manufacturing in this country. This transition offers us an opportunity for Australia to reignite the manufacturing sector, for Australians to make things once again right here in Australia. This is also about our national security, as we commit to making our sovereign manufacturing capacity a priority. I'm a great believer in science, and the science is in. We are determined to meet the challenge. Labor embraces the change that is required because we see it also as an opportunity, an opportunity to plan with certainty, to create new jobs and industries, a chance to embrace new technologies and build a new, bold, smart manufacturing industry. The Climate Change Bill 2022 and Climate Change Consequential Amendments Bill are a statement of intent by the Albanese Labor government. We believe in Australia's ability to meet the challenge of climate change 
and we know that everyday Australians are up for it. This legislation will ensure that we can take that journey confident together and very confident in a better future. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. Senator Lanty. Thank you. In 1956, South Australia experienced the Great Flood, an event described as the greatest catastrophe in the state's history. It was the highest flooding in the region since European settlement, but nobody asserted it was caused by humans because it was a natural disaster. There hasn't been a worse flood in Adelaide since. This, if this event had occurred in 2022, we'd be bombarded by propaganda telling us that it was caused by carbon emissions from human endeavours. Headlines about the dangers of climate change and the urgent need for harsh emissions reductions would abound. Now, the corporate and political classes have bought into this narrative to avoid uh, the imminent climate apocalypse, which the so-called experts have been predicting will occur in the next 10 years for the last 50 years, and to do that, that we must hastily transition to renewable energy, whatever the cost. Those apocalyptic claims come to us from the United Nations, and with the Climate Change Bill, Labor is pushing to reduce carbon emissions by 43 per cent by 2030, which marries up perfectly with the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. This is, by the way, the same agenda that led to the Dutch government, the Dutch government to declare soil, of all things, as a threat to the environment and push farmers off their land and out of their profession. So, as well as ruining thousands of lives, this means that global agricultural experts and food suppliers suffer. And this is the same agenda which also led to the uprising in Sri Lanka, as the cost of living for Sri Lankans has become unbearable. Clearly, these restrictions now place an impossible burden on citizens, and Labor seeks to take us down that path. At some point, Australians need to realise that the net zero agenda is not about saving the planet. It's about preventing us from being energy independent by bringing our fossil fuel and nuclear capabilities to a halt. And for those who are cynical, refer to what's happening in Europe at the moment. At what point do we start assuming that international bodies like the United Nations and the World Economic Forum, which also pushes the net zero agenda, have our best interests at heart? And what, what, what point do we start judging their ideas by what happens when they're implemented? We live in a time when political ideas are judged by what sounds good rather than what actually works. A post-truth era, perhaps better described the era of rainbows and unicorns, which is so advertly pushed by our friends across the chamber. We can see what these ideas from declaring a soil threat to the environment to rapidly shutting down coal power stations leads to the disenfranchisement of ordinary citizens and to more wealth in the hands of the anointed elites. So let's see politicians and corporate elites and celebrities who moan about the so-called climate crisis lead by example uh, and cede their own international travel aboard private fuel-guzzling jets. Let's see them eating up a meal in favour of crickets. And let's see them uh, giving up their, uh, their uh, champagne in the chairman's lounge, as I see them very often on a Thursday night heading home. None of them want to do that very quickly, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker. Those pushing this agenda lecture you about your so-called carbon footprint while making no adjustment to their own lives. And while you worry about the rising costs of food, fuel and bills, uh, they simply march on unabated. The hasty push for renewables doesn't make any sense other than in the light of an agenda to rob ordinary people of autonomy in energy and in food production. Coal and gas currently accounts for 79 per cent of Australia's electricity generation, uh, and uh, we are now apparently required to build solar and wind plants to cover that gap. It's an impossible, uh, impossible to quickly reduce this figure without jeopardising our capacity to generate electricity and increase its costs, which will be the um, net effect. What we know as so-called renewables, wind and solar, are inefficient, uh, expensive and dreadful for the natural environment. And for wind and solar power to generate electricity, the wind must be blowing and the sun must be shining, meaning you have stable power generation less than 40 per cent of the year. Renewables, given they are so inefficient, have such short lifespans. They rely on fossil fuels as backup sources, and wind turbines have a lifespan of about 20 years before they're buried in the earth. So we're not dealing with achievable outcomes here, but nothing but a utopian fantasy. The transition to renewables would need Australia to increase its mining operations to build the required solar panels and wind turbines. And the Greens members who are calling for Australia to ban the development of new mining projects are literally calling for the prevention of the means of building the renewables they argue for. You simply can't make this stuff up. Renewables require much more land than fossil fuels and nuclear counterparts, meaning vast stretches of beautiful Australian landscape are going to become wind and solar farms. 
The natural environment will get turned into an ugly landscape of metal and plastic. So much for environmentalism. True environmentalism actually means being good stewards of our natural environment while keeping the lights on, conserving our natural resources while using them appropriately. And if we were serious about reducing emissions, then, as we've said many times in this chamber before, nuclear energy is the answer. And if there was really a climate crisis, Australia's prohibition on nuclear power generation uh, would be considered irrational and inexcusable. In fact, over 70 per cent of France's nuclear en energy is generated through nuclear, and their natural environment is no worse for it, uh, as exhibited by our friends guzzling of French champagne. Uh, their carbon emissions are low, and they have some of the lowest electricity bills in Europe. Well, they used to. If we were truly facing a climate emergency, we would pursue nuclear energy, as it would address the emissions concerns and improve the cost of living for everyday Australians. It's such an obvious solution, but of course we know that it would interfere with the net zero agenda, so it is falsely presented as unsafe. And let's not forget that Australia contributes roughly 1.08 per cent of the world's carbon emissions compared with China's 29.34 and the US's 13.77 and even Russia's 4.76. If carbon emissions do cause climate change, then our emissions are actually negligible compared to those of other nations. And in fact, China is now building 43 new coal-fired power plants, despite being a signatory to the Paris Agreement, while Australia, which is the largest exporter of coal in the world, is gearing up to dismantle its largest export industry. So Labor's bill continues the trend of deferring to experts with conflicts of interest with the role of the Climate Change Authority on advising climate policy. And the Climate Change Authority is going to provide advice on reaching emissions targets to the Minister for Climate Change and Energy, and any deviation from this advice has got to be accounted for in a written statement by the Minister. And if we look back, of course, it's pertinent to realise that none of the climate alarmist predictions for a, from a new ice age all the way through to the melting of the ice caps have come to pass, but rather than admit these obvious errors, the climate pro propaganda simply changed the nature of the emergency and pushed the catastrophe back a few decades. because. Their predictions have been wrong for so many decades, and that does beg the question, why are people still listening to them? We need to consider this, especially seeing that as the net zero agenda places us in a more vulnerable position regarding China, which is the greatest manufacturer of renewables technology, meaning our transition to renewables will ensure that we become reliant on the Chinese Communist Party's exports for our electricity. And since the invasion of Ukraine, Europe is learning the hard way that relying on a hostile foreign power for energy resources is a disastrous idea. Far from becoming a renewables superpower, as Labor claims we will be, net zero will simply mean greater economic dependence on the Chinese Communist Party of all organisations for our energy, placing them in a considerable position of leverage over us and ensure that we go down the path of becoming a tributary state. We don't need to become a renewables energy slave to China. We already have the resources here to become an energy superpower. And we should be leading the world in energy production, including nuclear, uh, and it would be if not for the unscientific and ideologically driven net zero agenda. So for those who have introduced and supported this bill, they need to understand they're dooming Australia to a high energy cost future, a future in which Australians must choose between heating and eating. Only need, one only needs to look at the bleak winter fast approaching in the Northern Hemisphere to see our future right there before us. Power bills will become five to six hundred times the cost, energy shortages, businesses going under, and it's all on the watch of those who support this bill. And we won't let you forget. We've been blessed with a natural environment, bountiful resources that can allow us to reduce the cost of living, become less dependent on foreign powers. I hope that as a nation we can become alert to the urgency, not of climate change, but of pushing irrational energy policy it's time for those in this place to reject this bill. It's time for those in this place to put Australia first. Senator Hattick. Senator Cox. Thank you. I rise to make my contribution to this uh, climate change bill. It is absolutely no secret that climate change is upon us. We see the impacts of this every day, and we see it in the most extreme. Bushfires, flooding and droughts that are becoming more frequent and more severe. But we're also seeing it in much more subtle ways. The delicate balance of our ecosystems have operated in for thousands of years are changing, and they cannot adjust to the speed that is needed. If we do not act on these impacts, they will only get worse, and they will impact on every single, one, every single area of our lives, um, including to those opposite. 
It will also affect the future that we are building for our children and their children. And it actually starts right here with us here in the nation's parliament. The science is absolutely clear. We need to reduce our emissions by 75 per cent, not 43, and reach net zero by 2030, not 2050. I'm proud to be part of the only party who respects this science and also that I am the Greens spokesperson for the science and technology portfolio. We don't have time to play politics with this and we cannot let this government place our future um, at risk to appease their corporate donors. Because let's be real, the only, tar the only reason this target is so low is so that the Labor Party can keep raking in the money from their fossil fuel company mates. And if they tell you any different, that's a lie. And I saw that firsthand at the Minerals Council dinner last night. The latest IPCC report painted a very dire picture of what we're in store for if we do not take radical action. We had listened and taked, uh, take, took action when the scientists first questioned this, then maybe all of our emissions might not have had some of the unintended consequences down the line. And we would be in a very, very different place right now. But of course we didn't, and we ignored the science. We ignored them for so long that we are at that point now where we need radical action to avoid further disaster. It sounds terrifying, and that's because it absolutely is. It sounds serious because it is. And 43 per cent is not enough, and I refuse to sugarcoat that. Just as scientists saw the problem, they've also given us the answers. We need to transition away from fossil fuels as soon as possible. Address overconsumption of humans, uh, protect our natural environment, and to work to restore what we have, in fact, destroyed. First Nations science plays a key role in this because my ancestors have taken care of land and sea country for thousands of years, aiding the delicate balance of nature and taking only what they needed. We don't subscribe to the Western idea that nature is something that needs to be, in fact, conquered. We are part of nature. We're not better than it. We are equal. We know the land and how it operates and works and what is needed to survive and also to thrive. We know the government, uh, we know the land, sorry, governments, mining companies and private landholders need to welcome this knowledge and allow us and support us to work, protect and heal this country. And that will be for the betterment of all of us. Now, Australia is known for its amazing produce, from wine, grain, cheese, beef. You name it, we make it, and we do a damn good job of it. As seasons shift and weather patterns become more unpredictable and unruly, the ability of our farmers continues to produce these products are and will continue to be impacted, both um, sorry, at a regional and remote le level across Australia, that rely on this primary production to survive. The yields will decrease in both quality and quantity, making it harder for these communities to exist. We need to support our farmers in adopting more sustainable farming practices and to mitigate the impacts on their businesses to ensure our rural and regional communities are in fact not left behind. As well as our amazing produce, Australia is known for its amazing and diverse ecosystems that people travel from all over the world to come and see. From our deserts to our rainforests, our, uh, sorry, our native forests, our mountain ranges, our coastlines, our reefs, our arid lands and our river systems, all full with unique plants and even more unique animals. We have a lot to offer. And a lot of our tourism relies on these natural wonders. And again, many of these are in our rural and regional communities. The impacts of climate change will place these businesses at risk due to the destruction of these places. And we've already seen that with the wonderful and amazing Great Barrier Reef. If we lose these precious places, we lose our history, our culture, and we lose what makes Australia unique. So let's be frank. Fossil fuel companies are the reason we are in this mess, and the reason action has not been taken sooner. Both the major parties are captured by these companies and due to the millions of dollars that they have taken in their donations from them. Due to this, the major parties are too scared 
to in fact take any serious action to wind up fossil fuel production at the speed that we actually need it, because they might actually lose some money in their political donations. But there's clearly no concern about the primary producers or the small businesses who will lose their money as a direct result of climate change. These companies are getting a pretty good return on their investment too, since none of them actually pay any corporate tax and they receive billions of dollars in our public money as subsidies. Instead of holding up a dying industry or relying on carbon capture and storage, which in fact is unproven, to procrastinate in reducing emissions, the government should be focusing on investing in renewable energy projects. So let's use that money to build rail, to transport green hydrogen, just like Germany has done recently. Use that money to rehabilitate the land. Use that money to invest in solar panels, hydro, wind, literally any other anything else than paving the way for these greedy companies to destroy our planet. Now, I want to be absolutely clear that the climate wars are not over. They have, in fact, reached a new frontier. And the Greens are begrudgingly supporting this bill, but we know that 43 per cent is nowhere near enough. And the fight continues for meaningful climate action, which also means preventing not one more fossil fuel project opening, expanding or continuing. And my call to action for the folks out there watching is to join us, come forward and fight for our children's future and for our climate. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Grogan. Thank you. Um, today I rise very proudly to endorse these bills. The climate change bills going through this chamber are critical but quite simple. These bills represent a clear commitment from the Albanese Labor government. They represent an ambitious but achievable plan. They represent accountability to the parliament and they represent accountability to the people. Make no mistake here, the scientific facts are clear. Climate change is a real thing and people in this chamber are going to have to get on board with that. We are warming. There is more rainfall. Our patterns of weather are seriously disrupted. These things need to be addressed. We need to take action. The global temperature will almost certainly continue to rise, but the rate and magnitude of that increase will be determined by what we do next and our ability to limit greenhouse gas emissions. We know that there is a well-established causal connection between climate change and extreme weather events. The CSIRO, the Bureau of Meteorology, numerous scientists, numerous think tanks, the vast majority of the globe are on board. But for far too long, we've been having, as Senator Cox pointed out, climate wars. Climate wars where the most minute points, the most ridiculous arguments, and we are effectively standing by while Rome burns. We need to stop. People are torn between the 43 per cent that's laid out in these bills being too much or too little. 43 is bang on. 43 is the right number. 43 is the achievable number, and we will achieve it. As a nation, we have been failing. Our climate bill sets a best practice and science-based target to achieve that reduction. This is a flaw, not a ceiling. This is a flaw, not a ceiling. This is a start. Let us not go back to the place where we do nothing because we are so driven by the perfect. This is an excellent first step. This is a flaw, not a ceiling. This is the certainty and the mature policy that we need. The bill is a solid foundation, <clears throat> setting clearly and firmly in Australian law our emissions reduction ambition. It holds the government of the day 
properly accountable to the Australian people and to the Australian parliament on how it measures up to those ambitions and how it is addressing this fundamental issue. It is the certainty and the mature policy that we need. Many issues were raised in the committee hearings uh, considering these bills, and some of those were issues of merit and issues that should be considered. But they are outside the scope and intent of these bills. Some issues will be captured in a range of other associated but concurrent issues that are being progressed. And I'll just give you a list of what they are. Consulting on, an op on the options to reform the safeguard mechanism deals with a number of the issues that were raised in the committee hearings. Developing a national electricity electric vehicle strategy, which will be done in collaboration with the states and the territories. Working with the state and territory governments to increase the share of renewables in the national electricity market by 2030. Investing $20 billion for urgent upgrades of the electricity grid. Appointing an independent panel to review the integrity of the Australian carbon credit units, led by former chief scientist Professor Ian Chubb, and responding to Professor Samuel's review of the Environment Protection Biodiversity Conservation Act, and the impending release of a proposal for an independent federal environment protection authority. Each of these things deals with the vast majority of the issues raised uh, through the committee hearings. And as I say, the vast majority of people supported the passage of these bills. As Minister Bowen outlined in his second reading speech in the other place, this bill is important for the message that it sends to the future generations of this country, for our economy, for business and investment, for our nation and for our environment. Now, I'm proud to be the chair of the Senate Environment and Communications Committee, and we spent two days and waded through hundreds of submissions of people's perspective on these bills. And I'd speak now as an individual, not as the chair of that uh, committee. But the committee recommended that the Senate pass this bill, these, these two bills. There was widespread and near unanimous support for these bills, from organisations and interest groups representing all facets of the Australian economy and society. In fact, more than 110 organisations and specialists declared their support for the bills. Specialists across business and industry, agriculture and forestry, unions, conservation groups, energy and resources, academics, the legal sector, they all support these bills. Overwhelmingly, submitters, witnesses expressed support for the objectives and the provisions of these bills. They support it because they know there are significant opportunities in decarbonisation. There are significant opportunities for Australia by taking action. The industries of the future are enabled by the investment that takes place when we have clear, clear and sensible policy, which is exactly what these bills provide. This is what a Labor government is all about, finding the solution. I'd like to uh, express my thanks to the members of um, the Greens Party and to other senators including uh, Senator David Pocock, for engaging robustly and productively on these bills. But that's what a Labor government is all about. We care about workers. We care about business. We care about the environment. We consult, we listen and we take action. We care about the investment in the future and the opportunities that are available to us through decarbonisation. We have a clear plan to ensure that we drive our economy forwards as we decarbonise. I know that there will be those in this chamber who will just flatly oppose these bills without thinking about the future. 
without thinking about what that will do. I urge everyone in this chamber to support these bills. They are a simple, strong framework to start taking action. We cannot ignore or deny climate change. This is happening, and if we do not act on climate change, our wildlife, our planet, our industry, our citizens will all suffer. I urge everyone to support these bills. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Acting Deputy President. Thank you very much for the opportunity to make a uh, statement about these bills today. And these are important issues, uh, very important issues. Uh, and there is a lot to be said about this whole policy space. Now, this is a bill that is not a particularly large bill. It's only 10 or 12 pages long. It doesn't mean it's not important. Uh, certainly, it is a it is pretty pretty threadbare bill in what it does. Um, the minister himself, Mr. Bowen, uh, has described this bill as being not necessary, um, which is an interesting approach. Uh, I think about a piece of legislation you wanted to get through the parliament, but perhaps the reason it is unnecessary is because uh, the NDC or the Nationally Determined Contribution of Australia. Um, has been set in international law. Now, I'm not, I've never been convinced that international law uh, is particularly strong. Uh, I'm not sure how enforceable it is, but the reality is that the way that the system works under the Climate Accords, that the NDC is set uh, via international law, and that has been done. That's been done by the government. They've decided to go with 43. Uh, I mean, personally, um, I'm, I'm relaxed about it going higher, um, and. Uh, I'd be relaxed about that happening uh, if there was uh, the work done to show how it could be done and how much it would cost. Uh, but the point is that um, Minister Bowen is uh, the minister for this area and he's described his own bill as being quite unquote not necessary. So that's, I think, an important starting point. But as I say, I don't want my contribution to be um, you know, a hyper-partisan uh, rant um, because they are important issues. Uh, but this particular bill, I think, by any assessment, is actually quite a threadbare uh, bill. Now, uh, the, the cost of this transition uh, to get to net zero is eye-watering. Uh, and you can see um, through the Senate inquiry uh, that uh, no one seems to know how much it is actually going to cost the country. Uh, but that, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try and get the answer. Now, I said at the start of this process uh, when this bill was introduced, uh, that I thought that the inquiry, which was conducted by the Environment and Comms Committee, which is a very good committee, uh, had one key question to answer, indeed, and that was, how will Australia generate or obtain the capital to fund the journey to net zero? And I said that there could be a range of ways this could be achieved and this should all be explored. Now, I committed myself uh, to participating in the inquiry. I'm not a member of that committee uh, at the uh, current time, but I'm sure you do. But we, we, we participated in the inquiry and there was a couple of days of hearings and I persistently tried to get uh, answers on this key question of, of the cost. And I have to say that uh, I think it was the, the Business Council which referred to the work of Alan Finkel uh, where he's estimated that it's going to cost about $1 trillion uh, to transform the electricity sector. Uh, but we don't have any good analysis, uh, in the, in, certainly in the government or the private economy, on the overall cost estimates over the, over the, the long term. Now, as an importer of capital, as Australia has been over the last 250 years, I would have thought that we should try and get those answers. And it's something that I think that we should try and pursue. Um, I was surprised that more work had not been done by the Treasury and by the Line Department on this matter of the cost. Uh, I think it means that the, the bill is genuinely uh, unsupported by a broad evidence base. And I have concluded that in the absence of being able to ascertain the cost, uh, the things that really matter here are going to be 
the signals that we send to the market, um, recognising that whatever the cost may be, I think we can all agree that the, this country is, does not have enough capital to be able to fund the transition ourselves. And for those of, for those of us that have bandied around the idea of uh, using other pools of capital, like the superannuation scheme, uh, for example, for this purpose, I think are very wrong-headed. I mean, the day that that scheme starts to pursue non-financial objectives is the day that it will be on the road to ruin. Uh, so, setting aside uh, the major domestic pools of capital, we are going to have to seek funding from offshore uh, to fund these major investments, uh, these major capital investments. Uh, in this transition to net zero. And so the two things that I think that are really important in this debate on, on this bill, they're not in this bill but they're about this issue, are uh, what are the policies of the parties of government and what are the policies those parties of government will take to market. Now I do think that uh, we have had some significant developments in, in the recent months and I very much welcome as a member of one of the parties of government that the leader of my own party has said on the 11th of August in relation to the 2030 targets, which is uh, a large part of this debate, now Mr Dutton has said that it is likely that our target will come in well north of 35 per cent, maybe north of 40 per cent. We'll have a very credible policy, I promise you, by the end of this term or by the, end of, by the time of the next election. Now, um, that is a, uh, a significant uh, statement. And it is a statement which, uh, from the coalition's point of view, puts an end to the 2015 targets that we have had uh, at 26 to 28 per cent reductions on carbon emissions uh, for too long, in my view. I think we've had those targets for too long and they should have been updated uh, to reflect what is now possible. I mean, even our own modelling showed that it was possible to exceed 26 to 28 in the last parliament. Now, the Business Council of Australia uh, has said in relation to this uh, that they think that bipartisanship is very important uh, and that they were very supportive of both major parties coming to the net zero position. And the BCA said to the committee that they would be strongly supportive of a more ambitious coalition target. So I look forward to playing my role because you've got to focus on what you can control in these jobs uh, of uh, helping uh, my party, party of government, with the coalition. Uh, having the best possible plan that we can have for 2030 and 2035. Um, and that is something that is within our preserve. And I think that is a, a, a significant change that's been achieved in the past few months that we have put an end to the Abbott era 2030 targets. So I look forward to that process over the next couple of years. The second issue is about the policies. And again, I like to say that it's important to focus on the outcomes, not on the embroidery. And there are many policies that could be deployed in this space to get emissions down. Now you can look at the, uh, the fuel standards, you can look at the, your tax policies, you can look at uh, your corporate law, you can look at how you might require companies to disclose their emissions. Uh, you can look at how uh, emerging technologies like cryptocurrencies uh, can tokenise uh, the, the carbon credit system and how that can be used. Uh, there, are all, there, are, there are so many opportunities in this space uh, that, that draw on Australia's core equities of being a sophisticated, uh, high-wage uh, economy. Um, one of the things we have done in the last few weeks is we have been able to examine another bill uh, which has looked at the tax arrangements on electric vehicles. And there is no doubt uh, that that is a, a very much a, 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 a muddled approach in how that bill has been drafted. Um, that has been cherry-picked out of a, a national electric vehicle strategy, which prior speakers in this debate have referred to. Uh, and so it is important that we think carefully about these policies, that we cost them. We work out, OK, if we're going to have this particular measure, this is how much carbon abatement we're going to achieve. Um, so I think that is very important. In relation to corporate law, and again, I think as a, as a safe and strong jurisdiction and as an open democracy with the rule of law, 
and a member of the G20 group of nations, uh, we should be looking to be a leader on carbon disclosure. And we, sh we shouldn't be looking to do it through self-regulation. We shouldn't be asking the Corporate Governance Council to put out a note. Uh, we should be looking to pass laws in the, in the life of this parliament to ensure that Australia is going to have an, ag uh, an aggressive but measured approach on carbon disclosure. Because I believe that the countries that have the, the most transparency on these issues are more likely to be able to attract marginal capital. And if you are an investor, if you are you are an international investor, whether you're BlackRock or you're a smaller investor, uh, if you can look into a, an organisation and make a judgment about their risk profile by looking at their scope one, two and three emissions, then I think you're more likely to invest into that nation than into another nation. And as a, as a, as a nation that has often exported corporate law, we should be looking to do that again. Um, I also want to make the point that, and I know that, that some in this place like to junk all fossil fuels in together, but I mean that, that ignores the statements of the, the scientists, whether it's Finkel or whether it's our own institutions or whether it's Larry Fink at BlackRock, right, which is the world's biggest investor. Um, everyone that is credible and serious identifies gas as a necessary transition fuel. So we should not be conceding on gas, and I'm pleased that the coalition uh, is pushing this government uh, on gas and building on our record in government where we did some important initiatives in this space. Um, of course, the same goes for nuclear. There's no reason that we would have an ideological uh, position that would preclude the country from using this particular form of technology, particularly when you consider the large deposits of uranium we have in this country. So I think we, we, we would be well served to be removing the obstacles for using nuclear. I mean, it seems to be a bizarre position that if the market wanted to use this particular formula of energy production, it would be prohibited because of an ideological position that was put in place some decades ago. Uh, so I do think that this body of work that's been done by the Environment and Communications Committee has made a very persuasive case uh, for the removal of the nuclear prohibition, and I look forward to the work uh, that is going to be done for the Leader of the Opposition on this matter. So, um, in, in summary, um, look, it, it is not true that the, that the majority position of the G20 uh, countries is to legislate a target. Um, the Parliamentary Library itself has said that 12 of the 20 countries have not legislated the target. Having said that, um, I don't think uh, it's necessarily the end of the world um, if you do it. The point is I've made in these remarks is uh, the key uh, legislative, even though it is international law, component here uh, is done through the NDC. So whatever you do here is simply superfluous. Now, if I was the Minister for Energy and Climate Change or if I was the Minister for any portfolio, I would not be describing my own legislation as not, not necessary. because why would we as a parliament enact a bill that the minister has said is un unnecessary? I don't think that's our job. Uh, so finally, it is very important that we reflect on what we can control in these roles that we have been given. And I am very pleased that the coalition as a party of government uh, is committing itself to having a more ambitious agenda for 2030. Uh, it is true that it was our government that committed the country to net zero emissions at 2050, which was one of the signature achievements of the last government. Um, all that is left for us to do now as a party of government is to ensure that we have a credible position, uh, which is more aggressive than the 2015 targets for 2030, 2035 and all the other interceding years. And that is something that I look forward to working with my coalition colleagues on. Um, if we achieve that, then we are sending a signal to the market that both of the parties of government uh, are committed to emissions reduction and are committed to getting Australia where we need to get in the medium and long term. And we should do that in a way which is technology agnostic. Uh, I don't believe we should be throwing uh, gas in with coal. I think it has fundamentally different characteristics uh, as referenced by the scientists and the major investors. 
And I also think that we should be very much open to this debate on nuclear energy for domestic purposes. It makes no sense that we would be uh, the greatest exporter of uranium but have no view about using it for our own domestic purposes. So uh, they are important issues, and I thank the Senate committee and their work on the bill. I think it was an important uh, inquiry, and I thank the Senate for the opportunity to speak to this bill this afternoon. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I rise today to speak in favour of this piece of legislation, and uh, I want to put squarely on the record uh, right from the beginning that it is because the Greens have worked constructively that we have been able to improve and strengthen this piece of legislation so that it is uh, acceptable. 43 per cent is nowhere near uh, where we need to go if we are to reduce and cut pollution to save this fragile planet. It is nowhere near where we need to go if we're to give our children uh, a future of which they can uh, rely on, a safe climate, clean water, healthy air and clean, safe food. But it is, uh, now that we have strengthened this bill, a step forward in the right direction. But what we now need is to put in action the things that will drive pollution down, that will cut pollution. And I want to put squarely on the record, we often talk about carbon pollution during this debate, and of course that is true, but there is also a huge amount of urgent work to do to cut methane in this country and across the world. And it is why Australia must sign the methane pledge. The big gas companies are getting away with secretly polluting the atmosphere even more than is being recorded, and it needs to stop. The big gas companies and gas industry need to be held to account for their toxic contribution uh, to the climate uh, catastrophe because of leaking methane. The International Energy Agency, the UN, even the Pope, has called on governments right around the world to stop funding the expansion of new fossil fuels. They have called on governments to stop subsidising fossil fuels and allowing the expansion. I want to acknowledge that even uh, as of early as this week, one of Australia's leading businessmen, Twiggy Forrest, has called for a halt and a stop to the expansion of fossil fuels and fossil fuel subsidies. The rest of the world gets it, and they've been waiting for Australia to catch up. The climate has changed. It is Climate change is here. The bushfires, the floods, the droughts, not just in our own country but right around the world. All we need to look at is the 33 million people displaced and impacted by the terrible, deadly floods in Pakistan over recent weeks. Europe is, has been in the grips of a heat wave this summer, and we are already hearing state governments in our own country being briefed about the fire risk of the coming summer here. Our wildlife and our environment are suffering. And for years, the community has been waking up and demanding action from our government to take seriously the threats of this climate catastrophe and to do what is needed. The business community have been far ahead of the parliament in recent years, much further ahead in wanting to tackle the climate challenge than previous governments. Well, now we have an opportunity to pass through this place this week a commitment that not only do we acknowledge that climate change is happening, but that we have to do something about it. And that something means cutting pollution. What this bill doesn't include is the mechanisms by which we get there. We need a climate trigger in our environment laws to stop the expansion of big new projects that are going to continue to make climate change worse. We have a huge task in front of us to cut the amount of pollution that is currently being created. A huge task, but one that we must tackle 
In fact, our survival as a community and a species requires us to tackle. But how on earth are we going to cut the amount of pollution currently being created while opening up avenues for more pollution to be created? You don't put out the fire by pouring petrol on it. That is why a climate trigger in our environment laws is needed in this country, to stop the expansion of those polluting projects that are going to make it harder and harder and harder for us Thank you, to deal with climate Senator change. Senator Hanson Young, uh, it's now 1:30. We're now moving to two-minute statements. Uh, Senator Bragg. Thanks very much. Uh, there are many great causes and charitable organisations that we come across in these jobs. I do want to put on the record that uh, I think Mr. Scott Maggs, who is a long-standing friend of mine, uh, has made a material difference to the lives of many by instituting a system of skin checks for people, which is something that they can easily control. Uh, Scott got onto this idea after a good friend of ours, Wes Bonnie, uh, unfortunately passed away from melanoma in his early 20s. And one of the things that could have saved Wes's life was this idea of going and getting your skin checked proactively, perhaps once every six months or once a year. And Scott has done an incredible job uh, on his own steam of establishing this organisation called Skin Check Champions, where people can go and have their, have their skin checked. Uh, if you look at uh, his testimonials, uh, he has saved uh, dozens and dozens of people from having uh, very difficult health outcomes just by virtue of having uh, gone and got the check. And as I say, we meet so many terrific people who do so many great things for the community in these roles. Um, I do think the brilliance of the Skin Check Champions idea and concept is that it is easy to understand, it is easy to do, and Scott has done a great job uh, by doing it. Now, he's also known, uh, strangely, as Jimmy Niggles. I've never understood uh, that alter ego, uh, but uh, it's good to have a few strange people uh, in your life. So, uh, but well done, Scott. You've done a great job. You've changed a lot of people's lives for the better. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Senator White. Uh, I want to speak about the important work of uh, Union Aid Abroad, AFIDA, in supporting economic development in the Asia-Pacific. AFIDA was established in 1984 through the work of a young Australian nurse named Helen McHugh, a committed member of the Australian Nursing Federation, after working as a nurse educator uh, with the World Health Organisation in refugee camps in the Middle East. I recently met with uh, Executive Director Kate Lee and Lachlan ba uh, Batchelor to hear about the important work uh, Union aid abroad AFIDA does in our Asia-Pacific region. AFIDA's international program is about building solidarity and self-reliance for workers and their communities, working with the International Trade Union uh, Confederation. AFIDA supports energy transition programs in India, Indonesia, Phil the Philippines, Nepal and gender equality in Cambodia. Inequality in our region is at record highs. Inequality weakens communities, societies and institutions. It makes government work less efficient. It costs more to do less. Workers, workers in our region experience subsistent wages, long working hours, poor conditions, hostile governments and threats to the lives of union activists and their families. Trade unions are the backbone of communities in unequal societies. The government has made the Asia-Pacific region the top foreign relations priority after a decade of neglect by those opposite. This government has been leading the charge to fix the damage done by those opposite uh, that has left us on the back foot in our own neighbourhood. For a few cents each, we can immeasurably improve the lives of the, our Asian Pacific neighbours and at the same time time, strength and security in our region. They deserve our support and I commend uh, the work of AFIDA to the Senate. Thank you. Senator, Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I recently had the pleasure of visiting uh, Kindermana Community uh, Kindergarten and Byford Community Kindergarten with my state colleague, the Honourable Donna Farragher, just last week. And this, the commitment of parent communities, teachers and education assistants they are astounding. Uh, they are truly passionate about educating and, uh, and supporting some of the youngest members of our community. 
Now, the importance of early childhood education is often overlooked, and I believe that community-based approach is one way to uh, really help those communities and to make and break uh, uh, the support for children in their formative years. We discussed the importance of early intervention and the role that it can play for children that are having learning and behavioural uh, challenges, and it can be difficult for families to afford the appropriate services that are needed to support these children, but I am encouraged that families in WA have the support of community kindergartens. But unfortunately, uh, many community kindergartens are at risk of being shut down. Uh, the West Australian government is making it more and more difficult for them to keep their doors open by raising the enrolment requirement and not providing the sufficient resources. Madam Acting Deputy President, it is critical that we work together uh, to provide our children with opportunities so that they can have the very best start at life. And this will set them up for success. It's not a case of just having more childcare places or more um, universal access to childcare. What we've got to ensure is that we've got the appropriate services that are there, particularly for vulnerable families, particularly for vulnerable children, which I know you are also very committed to seeing. And, uh, so I urge uh, the WA government and, indeed, this government here federally to take the time uh, to see the positive impact that programs like this, community kindergartens and other initiatives that rely on families to support, that know what they need to support their children. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Senator Pratt. Thank you. Australia is a committed and long-standing long partner of the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria. And it's now time for Australia to again play its part in the new replenishment round, which is currently underway. The replenishment will happen on the 19th of September, and I know Australia is busily preparing uh, to make its pledge uh, later this month. Uh, the Australian government is indeed working closely with the Global Fund on implementation of their new strategic priority beyond 23 to 28. The Global Fund has saved millions and millions of lives, some 44 million, and lifted many, many out of health, more out of health poverty. More than 17 million lives have been saved in our own region. So it's time now for Australia to reinvest in this important multilateral. The Global Fund pulls funding from donor countries, philanthropic organisations, the private sector and, importantly, from developing countries themselves. With every dollar given by Australia, we see $31 in health gains and economic returns. I'm really pleased to say that people with lived experience have always been at the heart of the Global Fund's activity, uh, working with the private sector and governments to design, implement and monitor grants, and really to address these health impacts in AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria on the ground. The Global Fund is asking Australia for an increased commitment of some $450 million over the next three years. I know uh, that we're working very closely with them, and a strong commitment will get Australia and the world on track to thank defeat you, AIDS, Pratt. TB and malaria. Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy Madam President. Today is National TAFE, today, TAFE Day, a day to stop and think about all the good work that TAFEs have done. My mum went to TAFE, I went to TAFE, my son went to TAFE. TAFE was a godsend for someone like me, someone who might have been the best at, not, may not have been the best at school, but likes to get stuck in and do things, practical things. Back in the day, TAFE was there, TAFE was where things were at. But we've let things go over the years, and our TAFE is a far cry from where it was. It's time to give TAFE a facelift and bring it back into the modern world to make it 21st century. The government made some announcements recently, 180,000 new free TAFE places, 3.7 billion funding over five years to reform the vet sector. That one is a bit funny, given that the Labor and the Coalition teamed up three years ago and ripped the guts of $4 billion out of the Future Education Fund. These announcements are very well and good, but we need to overall overhaul how TAFE works and make sure it's effectively plugging the gap of our skill shortage. We need to look at the course structures. Some of the courses are outdated or they take too long and have unnecessary red tape. 
We need to think about TAFE relationships with industry and how to add value with the private sector. Don't get me started on the need to invest far more money into our TAFE schools. They're not fit for purpose. Every year that the schools are left without money, it's going to cost more money to get them up to scratch. We've got schools with rust on the floor and asbestos in the ceilings, equipment dating back to the Cold War. One Tassie TAFE even has a bit of rabbit play going on. We can't provide proper equipment and classrooms to learn in, and that's if you can learn at all. A teacher shortage is causing courses to be cancelled left, right and centre. Twenty electrical apprentices on the Tassie's northwest coast have had their training blocks cut because there isn't anyone to teach it. The course won't start again until next year. I'm sick of standing up here like a broken record banging on about this. We know these problems exist. Get prioritised and get them fixed. Thanks, Senator Lambie. Senator Henderson. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Ninety-seven times, ninety-seven times is the number of times the Labor government, when in opposition, committed to reduce Australians' power prices by $275 a year. Ninety-seven times. This is a failed promise from the Labor Party. Not only is this causing enormous pain for Australian families on a day when we are expecting to see another lift in interest rates, this is also causing enormous pain for small businesses at a time when our small businesses need every bit of a leg up. Our retailers, those working in the hospitality sector and our manufacturers. The pain for our manufacturers with these rocketing electricity prices is absolutely appalling. Um, this is going to drive our manufacturers out of business. And on top of that, the Jobs and Skills Summit, well, what a great result that was for businesses in this country. With the decision, and I say great and I'm being sanctimonious, um, the decision of industry-wide bargaining, which is taking us back to the dark ages. This was effectively abolished by the Keating government, and this is going to cause industrial chaos in every small business around the country if the Labor Party gets its way. Um, this is appalling. This would never have been supported by Bob Hawke, by Paul Keating, by Kevin Rudd, by Julia Gillard, but this left-wing Prime Minister is determined to destroy small businesses from around this country. Thank you, Senator Thank Henderson. You. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Senator McCarthy. Madam Acting Deputy President, I'd like to just give a short update on uh, the first 100 days in terms of Indigenous health as Assistant uh, Minister for Indigenous Health. The Australian government is investing $106 million to provide face-to-face -face support for older First Nations people and $115 million to build culturally safe aged care facilities. We're also progressing on our commitment to train 500 uh, new First Nations health workers to fill gaps across the health system. The National Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation, NACHO, is working hand in hand with us uh, to design the program to ensure it meets the needs of First Nations people and the health services which care for them. We've invested in better outcomes and more appropriate care for people living with cancer across Australia. On Sunday, we marked Polycystic Kidney Disease Awareness Day, and we know a large number of Indigenous Australians suffer from kidney disease and are on dialysis for end-stage kidney disease. It was an important moment last week to announce that a life-changing treatment for chronic kidney disease is now available to thousands of Australians through an expansion of the Pharmaceutical Benefit Scheme listing. It's the first new treatment added to the PBS in more than 20 years for Australians living with proteinuric chronic kidney disease, and thousands of Australians could benefit from the subsidised listing each year. It can also benefit any Australians living with chronic kidney disease. But we know that the disease takes a heavy physical, social and economic toll on First Nations communities, with First Nations people twice as likely to have the condition and much more likely to die. Although these issues are complex and can't be fixed overnight, our government is committed to continuing this work because all Indigenous Australians, indeed all Australians, deserve to live long, healthy and happy lives.
Thank you. Senator McKim. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. The Prime Minister fronted the National Press Club last week and gave the most pathetic response to a question about repealing the obscene Stage 3 tax cuts. He said, we tried to amend them out, we weren't successful, they were legislated, and we made a decision to, and I quote, stand by that legislation rather than relitigate it. Well, how far the once great Australian Labor Party has fallen. The stage three tax cuts that the Labor Party now supports were designed by Scott Morrison, introduced by Scott Morrison and confirmed by Scott Morrison as Prime Minister. They will give billionaires, CEOs and politicians a nine thousand dollar a year bonus and they will give people on the minimum wage absolutely nothing over the next decade these obscene tax cuts for the top end will strip 244 billion dollars out of the budget and put three quarters of that money into the pockets and wallets of the highest income earners in the country 244 billion dollars you could put dental and mental health in a Medicare, build affordable housing and make childcare free. These obscene tax cuts will obliterate Australia's progressive tax system. They are exactly the kind of policy that the Labor Party was formed to oppose. They should be repealed, and yet here is Mr Albanese and his colleagues in this place standing by them. Well, if the Labor Party is standing by these tax cuts, they are Labor's tax cuts. The stage three tax cuts for the top end are now the Labor Party's tax cuts. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator David Pocock. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Invasive species are wreaking havoc on Australia's ecosystems and threaten our biodiversity. They are a huge cost not only to our biodiversity but to our farmers and our economy, costing at least $25 billion a year. We've let the destructive influence of invasive species into our country and now we are dealing with the costs. Invasives are threatening 1,267 Australian native plants and animals. 82% of all of our threatened species are being pushed towards extinction by invasive species. Australian mammals now represent more than a third of all mammals that have become extinct across, across the globe since the year 1500. The recent State of the Environment report was clear. Invasive species are putting pressure on Australia's biodiversity and these pressures look set to continue and, incre and increase in the future. We need to act swiftly if we are to halt this decline. In the ACT, action groups are working hard against ongoing extinctions. Members of my, com members of my community have raised concerns about the development of grassy woodlands at North Lawson in the ACT and the impact it could have on endangered threatened species such as the golden sun moth. It is important to protect hab habitat where it still exists and submissions for consideration under the EPBC Act close tomorrow. I look forward to helping ensure that our new environmental laws actually address the concerns of everyday Australians about the way that we are protecting and looking after our nat natural heritage. Thank you. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, last week I was fortunate enough to be in Israel, hosted by the wonderful organisation known as AJAC. Uh, we spent time both in Jerusalem and in Tel Aviv. Uh, but what was potentially one of the most eye-opening parts of the trip that we did was a visit to Ramallah. And whilst in Ramallah, we met with the Palestinian Prime Minister as well as being given a tour through what is referred to as a refugee camp but is a settlement. These are permanent buildings. And perhaps one of the most disturbing things I have ever seen pointed out by our Palestinian guide and to quote her that this monument we were looking at was to, uh, to uh, commemorate the, again, to quote, the suicide bombers who had killed 
Jewish civilians who had killed Jewish civilians. And these people were being immortalised in monuments in this centre in Ramallah. Now, when I spoke to the Prime Minister of Palestine from the PA in his office about this and how, by immortalising these people, by not even adhering to the basic principles of the, the rule of, uh, of war, by actively killing civilians, how could they ever expect a conversation? But the fact that the Palestinians have a policy that is colloquially known, and in fact, even I think that's a bit more formal than that, as pay for slay. Pay for slay. If you kill a Jewish civilian and sent to jail, you receive circa 12,000 shekels per month. That is three to four times what the teacher, average teacher gets paid. If you happen to be killed, your family receives this money. This money comes from the international community. It is a disgrace, and this is backed by the ABC, hence by the removal of failed Abu Ghosh Twitter account. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Senator Roberts. Yesterday, in questions without notice, I asked the minister representing the Minister for Health, <coughs> excuse me, Senator Gallagher, about the availability of birth data. Her response included a statement to the effect that this information is available from the states. Senator Gallagher needs to be aware it used to be available. <coughs> New South Wales, South Australia, the ACT and Northern Territory no longer publish this data. Queensland publishes data at the end of the year, meaning Queensland data is nine months out of date. Victorian data is already available for August 2022. So someone down there is doing that job. <coughs> Victorian births. August 2021, 6,700. August 2022, 5,900. Western Australia provides quarterly data for births. June quarter, 2021, 8,750. <clears throat> the same period this year, 8,060. That's all the data we have. How can we make life and death decisions with insufficient information? These variations could just be the lockdown babies working through the system. It could be anything. We don't know, and that is the problem. When health policy has been as intrusive, expensive and controversial as Lib Lab's COVID response, wouldn't this data be compulsory viewing for decision makers? And yet the best the Commonwealth Bureau of Statistics can manage for births and cause of death is December 2020, 20 months behind. What are they hiding, as I asked? Provisional mortality is four months behind when Victoria can provide their data in five days. All the states use sophisticated reporting routines. The data delay is not with the states. I have submitted a document discovery for the latest data the ABS has on births, deaths and cause of mortality. As long as COVID is said to continue, this data should be provided monthly. One month behind, not two years and nine months behind. We have one flag, we are one community, we are one nation. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Senator Steele John. When the Albanese government granted the long-suffering Murugupan family from Biloela a permanent visa last month, I found myself cautiously hopeful that it might signal a shift in the way we treat refugees in this country. Well, how wrong I was. For many months, I have been advocating for the release of Ned Kelly, a 37-year-old Iranian refugee being held in detention in WA. Almost a decade ago, Ned sought our protection, fleeing Australia, um, uh, fleeing his home country of Iran uh, to Australia, uh, facing persecution and in great danger. Our response as a nation has been to lock him up and to throw away the key. Now, contrary to what the major parties might tell you, there is nothing illegal about Ned's actions. It is his right as a human being to seek asylum. It is our legal and moral obligation as a nation to provide it. In a letter in February, I wrote to former Home Affairs Minister Karen Andrews, pleading with her to provide the necessary supports to Ned, whose torture by our own hands have resulted in PTSD, in self-harm and in several suicide attempts. The minister did not respond to my letter, nor has the new government responded to my calls for Ned's release. Now, sadly, this is not a surprise. 
Despite their claims of compassion for asylum seekers, the Albanese government's uh, position is to support the deraved coalition uh, border policies that keep people like Ned uh, detained indefinitely. This is a national shame, and the Greens will push back against it until every single refugee in detention is free. Thank you, Senator Steele. John. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, Western Australia is home to a vibrant and diverse African community, and every year we celebrate a year of all things African and Australian. Uh, this year, Africa Down Under, which is held annually in Perth, it was held and it's the largest African mining event held outside of the African continent. Last week, the 21st conference was held after two years of COVID disruptions, and it was the best yet. I had the privilege of joining over 1,000 delegates uh, to hear from over 60 presenters and view 70 uh, exhibitions. In total, 355 international delegates participated from 14 African mining nations, including 15 government ministers as well as their heads of mission from Canberra. And as a Western Australian senator, I understand the strategic importance of the Indian Ocean Rim uh, nations, including, of course, those across Africa, not just in terms of their importance geostrategically, but also to the rich cultural uh, and social and economic uh, benefits we provide mutually. Pleasingly, this uh, year's program had a strong representation from companies developing projects in the battery and technology metal sector. And few here and probably across Western Australia know that there are more than 120 ASX-listed companies actively operating or developing over 222 projects across 32 African nations. And 68 per cent of those are based in uh, Perth and, more specifically, in West Perth. These companies are involved in projects across 21 commodities, and more than 40 of the projects are focused on gold. But there is considerable interest from Western Australian companies also investing in battery metals such as cobalt, copper, gra graphite, lithium and nickel. Congratulations to the amazing Bill Rapard and the Paydirt Media team for another you, amazing Senator conference. Reynolds. Uh, Senator Stirl. Yes, thank you, uh, Deputy, Acting Deputy President. I, I just want to rise and make a quick contribution. I don't know if anyone saw it last night, but the Four Corners show uh, on uh, Qantas. Now, I don't want to hear about all the bulldust and all the excuses about COVID. We know all that. The Qantas company is being driven into the ground by one of the worst boards, one of the worst CEOs, a person and led by people who were happy to illegally sack 2,000 under-the-wing workers to outsource their jobs. But it gets worse, uh, Madam, Deputy Madam Acting Deputy President. I have spoken with many Qantas cabin crew. And as a lot of you interact with Qantas cabin crew, it's not hard to see how unhappy the workforce is. And they come to me because they know my background. And they know my background when Qantas tried to sue me for $94,000 for sticking up for transport workers. And they, man and woman to a T, can't wait to tell me of the shocking conditions that they face at Qantas. Because what a lot of you over there wouldn't know, that they're in, just in with the, uh, with the uh, cabin crew, there are no less than 10 industrial arrangements. 10. So talk about people mixing on the same planes on different agreements, labour hire, which is a scourge of the industrial arena scene, and there's no, if I had another three hours, I'll tell you what I really think about labour hire, but the undermining of conditions that were negotiated with unions. How do I know? Because I was on EBA, Qantas EBA 3 and Qantas EBA 4 negotiating for the, for the uh, TW members in Perth. But they'd be standing alongside another man or a woman who can be working for some $60 less a shift. And then for some of the workers on some of those grubby labour hire agreements who do not even get paid at not, if they have to stay overnight, they'll get the transfer, they'll get their accommodation, they get nothing else. So I've got to tell you, you should watch Four Corners. It might uh, open your eyes. And Senator Alan Joyce is not gone. Your time has expired. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Madam President. I got into peop uh, politics to help people through good government, not judge them. However, there are some things that government should not be involved in, and that, that is especially so when it comes to parenting. If my children have issues with their sexual identity, my wife and I will deal that either by ourselves or with a properly trained psychologist outside of the classroom. 
The legal age of consent in this country is 16. There is no need to be discussing or promoting sexual orientation or identities in the classroom. I don't pay taxes for the government to fund the education system to be pushing indoctrination. And don't kid yourself, indoctrination does influence our children. Once you get to 18, you can do whatever you like. It's your business. But the government doesn't get to co-parent our children. That is solely the role of the parent. So I was surprised the other day when uh, you know, I'm told that my son, who is, is you know, still uh, only just turned 10, can wear purple socks to school to show his support uh, for diversity. You know? and so as I had another constituent contact me who asked further questions about this, and he wants to, to promote the point of this was to promote supportive, safe, empowering and inclusive environments for lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans and gender diverse, intersex, queer and questioning young Thank people. Thank you, Senator Rennick. The time for two minute statements has expired. We're now going to move to question time. Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Senator Watt. Yeah, yeah. United Workers Union Secretary Tim Kennedy said that workplace laws should most definitely be amended to allow workers to hit major companies with strikes at the same time. Minister, will you guarantee that the Albanese Labor government will not allow this to occur? Yeah. Um, Minister. Minister Watt. Thank you, President, and uh, thank you, Senator McGrath, for the question. What is it about the opposition that all they want to do is talk about conflict? What is it about them? They can't. The, the, the simple concept. Uh, Minister, resume your seat. We we'll just wait for quiet so we can all hear the minister's response. Senator Mackenzie, Minister Watt. Thank you, President. As I say, I mean, what is it about these people? They've been in government for nine years delivered a wages and bargaining system that is completely broken, had wage, low wages as a design feature of their economic policy. Um, Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Mackenzie. Is it with this minister that he can't, refuses to answer the most basic uh, Senator, of questions? Sorry, Senator Mackenzie. Order. Order. May I remind senators, if you are seeking to make a point of order, you stand and you indicate to the Senate that you are making a point of order, and that is not a point of order. Please continue, Minister Watt. Thank you, uh, President. It, it really is a shame that after an election, after a Jobs and Skills Summit, which saw the country brought together by a new government, that the only group that doesn't want to accept that people want to cooperate is the opposition. I mean, we know what it's like to be in opposition. We were there for a few years. The approach we took was that you pick your fights. You actually look for constructive opportunities when you can. You pick your fights when you really have to. But this opposition, all they seem to do is whatever the idea, they're against it. They'd be against Order. the sun rising in the, in the east. They'd be against the sun setting in the west because they want to oppose everything that happens. Now, the opposition want to continue fighting, just like they did for nine years. They want to continue delivering lower productivity, lower wages through a conflict-driven IR system. But it's not just an IR system that they want to maintain the conflict. I was very interested uh, to Senator see— Senator McGrath, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Watt, sorry. Uh, Senator McGrath. Point of order, uh, mm -hmm. President, on, on relevance. The, the question was, was very tightly uh, worded, and the, the minister has has come nowhere near answering the question, in fact has gone anywhere near but answering the question. I would ask you to get the minister to come back and answer the question, please. Uh, thank you, Senator McGrath. I would remind senators that uh, question time should be conducted in relative quiet. It has been very hard for me to hear Senator Watt, despite Senator Watt being able to project his voice. Um, but I'll remind Senator Watt of the question, and uh, you have 37 seconds left um, to answer the question. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, President. Uh, the government have made very clear that we will be consulting employers, unions, and a range of other people as to how uh, this agreement will be implemented and deal with all of those issues. But I, again, I was very concerned to see some reports this morning in the Australian uh, that, in response to Coles Boer's comments about reaching an agreement on these matters. Coalition backbenchers were, quote, out for blood on the issue. Now, we've heard a lot about thuggery and intimidation from the other side when it comes to industrial relations. Well, who are the thugs now? Who's doing the intimidating now? In fact, some coalition 
MPs argued that COSBOA had betrayed small business owners, likening Thank it to you, a Minister, snake. Your time That's has the expired. kind of behaviour. Uh, Senator McGrath, first supplementary. Minister, can you guarantee that there will be no productivity losses caused by industry-wide bargaining and strike action? Uh, Minister. Thank, thank you, President. Senator McGrath, I don't know who's feeding you your questions, but you really should have a read of them before you ask them. I mean, you want to talk about lower productivity in this country. Who was responsible for lower productivity over the last nine years? You! It was the opposition that was responsible for that through a conflict-driven uh, IR system. Minister Watt, please resume your seat. Senator Payne, I would ask the Senate to listen quietly so that we can all hear the response from the minister. Order. Uh, minister. Thank you, President. It's, it's actually good to know Senator Payne's still here. I hadn't heard much from her since the election, so it's good to, good to hear from her. The, um, but we want to talk um, about lower productivity. Minister, oh, you're back. Please. You're back. You're back. Order. Minister. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm welcoming more contributions from Senator Payne. That's what I'm doing. Now, seriously, lower productivity. You want to talk about a, an IR system that delivers lower productivity? Have a look in the mirror. You had nine years of delivering lower productivity through an IR system that was all about conflict and not about agreement. That's what we're trying to fix. We're trying to fix an IR system that is riven by conflict, and you want to drag us back to a system with lower productivity and lower wages. That's why the Australian people voted against you, because they want Thank more you, agreement Minister. and less Your conflict. Time has expired. Senator McGrath, second supplementary. Given rising interest rates, rising inflation and businesses battling the increased costs of doing business, why is the Albanese government prioritising policies that will encourage economy-wide strike action? Uh, Minister. The, the Senator McGrath is correct. We do see cost of living pressures in this country at the moment, and that's why we have a range of policies in place to deal with it, such as delivering wage rises. That's the best way to deliver cost of living relief, is to get people's wages Minister, up. Minister, please resume your seat. Can we please have quiet when the minister is answering? Senator Mackenzie, I've just pulled this, the Senate up and Senator Wong for the constant interjections. I would appreciate it when the minister is answering the question to do your questions to give him the courtesy of listening to the answer. Please continue, uh, Minister. Thank you, President. Uh, as I say, we recognise there are cost of living pressures in, in this country, and that's why we're acting on it. We're acting on it in terms of cheaper childcare. We're acting on it in cheaper medicines. Uh, we're putting downward pressure on energy prices. That is part of our commitment, as we have said. And more importantly, and more importantly, we are lifting wages at the same time. Which government supported a minimum wage rise? The Albanese Labor government. Who opposed it? The opposition. Which government supported a wage rise for aged care workers? The Albanese Labor government. Who opposed it? The opposition. That is how we're going to fix cost of living pressures, Order. not by dragging our IR system back to the past and then accusing people who have to, the right to stand up for it for um, being out for blood. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator McGrath, these were your questions, and uh, don't answer back. Thank you. I'm asking you to respect the question that you asked and the answer that's being given. Thank you, Senator McGrath. Uh, have you finished, Minister? Um, Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, President. And my question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Gallagher. Can the minister outline how the recent Jobs and Skills Summit, which I was privileged to attend on Thursday morning, uh, placed women front and centre to ensure gender equality is a core economic priority? Minister. Thank you, President. I thank um, Senator O'Neill for the question and acknowledge her um, advocacy in relation to women's policy over the years um, and acknowledge that today. The Albanese Labor government's Jobs and Skills Summit brought together Australians, including unions, employers, civil society and governments, to find common ground on some of our big economic challenges and to, to drive a consensus towards uh, the solutions. And women's economic equality was a core focus of the summit. 
I've been really pleased by the response to date uh, at, at the role of women at the summit. They were more than 50 per cent of the participants. Uh, they led the panels. They led the debate. There were some amazing uh, speakers uh, that attended the summit, um, full of talent and, and just amazing to witness uh, their contributions and the fact that they were centre stage and a key focus of it. Gender equality and women's economic participation were points of discussion across all of the sessions at the Jobs and Skills Mr. Summit. Uh, day, for the two-day summit's first session was focused specifically on this topic, where participants um, in, the, in the policy space around uh, equal opportunity and pay uh, were discussed, but so were issues like the care economy, boosting work and training opportunities for women and examining how we can make all workplaces safer for women and practical measures to reduce the gender pay gap were all discussed at the summit. We've, uh, I think one of the key outcomes of the summit, apart from the fact that the women and the talented women at the summit were so amazing, was that um, there was agreement across all participants that women's economic equality should be seen as a key economic priority, something that I know many senators, like Senator McAllister and Senator Waters, have been arguing for some time. Thank you, Minister. Senator O'Neill, first supplementary. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, can the Minister highlight the measures for women that have been announced out of the Jobs and Skills Summit? Minister. Uh, thank you very much, President. I thank Senator O'Neill for the supplementary. The government, uh, following the summit, there were a number of areas where we did reach agreement. Uh, one of them was around modernising Australia's workplace relations laws to make sure that uh, bargaining is accessible for all workers and businesses, including those really uh, feminised industries where we have seen um, really low wages growth and the failure of the bargaining system to work for women. Um, improving access to jobs and training pathways for women, First Nations people, regional Australians and culturally linguistically diverse people, including equity targets for training places, a thousand digital apprenticeships in the Australian public service and other measures to reduce barriers to employment. We're also making sure that the APS is leading by example by re reporting to WGIA and to set targets on improving gender equity in the public service. And there were a range of other agreements around reporting data through to WGIA. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator O'Neill, second supplementary. Uh, thank you for <laughs> that report on the practical action arising. C can the minister outline how this builds on existing commitments made by the Albanese Labor government to advance the issues facing Australian women and restore national leadership on gender equality. Minister. Um, thank you, President. I thank Senator O'Neill for a question. And she's right. I mean, for too long, women's policy was in the wilderness uh, under the previous government. It's front and centre uh, in this government. That's the serious. That's the big change. Everything we discuss, every policy developed, um, every consideration, we will have an analysis of what that means for women. How does that impact women? Is it good? Is it bad? How do we change it to make sure it, it um, deals with some of the issues that comes out of that research? And I would note, it was one. Of, it's no surprise that um, Mr. Morrison didn't uh, take on the Ministry for Women portfolio <laughs> when he was taking uh, Senator Birmingham's portfolio. Poor old Senator Birmingham, he shared his finance ministry for the entire time he was finance minister with the prime minister, unlike Tony Abbott, who did take the women's ministry. But we are putting women's uh, policy front and centre, and I look forward to working with all interested senators on, on, um, on doing just that. Thank you, Minister. Senator Dean Smith. very much, Madam President. My question is to the minister representing the assistant treasurer and minister for financial services, Senator Gallagher. Does the minister know of any Treasury portfolio precedent for removing transparency on payments through aggregation, as has been delivered for the superannuation industry and trade unions in regulations released last Friday? Minister. Uh, thank you, um, President. And I would have to take on notice um, the precedent um, question that you asked, because I do want to make sure that all of my answers here uh, are um, accurate, and I'm sorry, but I don't have all of that dating back to 1901, <laughs> where you know your question leads me to. So I would want to have a look at that. I would also say that um, that uh, the regulations uh, uh, tabled by the Minister 
the Assistant Treasurer um, and Minister for Financial Services I think had responded to some of the concerns that had been raised around transparency in this place um, and uh, amended or from the draft regulations to ensure that, um, that those questions around transparency could be dealt with. So I'm sure the Senate will have more to say on this as it, it debates these regulations, uh, but I think he, the Assistant Treasurer had responded to some of the concerns. And that, Data will be provided, but as as you know, and I, I think I've heard it from you guys plenty of times over the years, to making sure we uh, reporting is transparent, but it's also efficient and effective, uh, is equally important. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Smith, mm. first supplementary. Madam President, this is not my first supplementary, but just to query: does this, does this mean that the information Senator will be provided Smith, at the end of question doing? time? Uh, Senator Smith, you will recall I reminded the Senate at the beginning of question time. If you are seeking a point of order, say it. I have invited you to make your first supplementary. My query is whether or uh, not Senator, Senator Gallagher Smith, will Senator Smith, make... resume your seat. Either ask your first supplementary or I will have no alternative other than to move on. First so my first supplementary Thank question you. is, can the minister confirm that payments from super funds to unions could rise from $12.9 from million in 2021-22 to $35 million in 2030? Can the minister further confirm that the details of these payments will now be hidden from super fund members? Minister. Uh, thank you. Well, I don't thank you, and I thank um, Senator Smith for the, the supplementary. I'm not sure where those numbers are coming from, so I would want to check on those uh, before uh, going to the specifics. But look, um, we know you're opposed to super. We know you can't stand industry funds. We know you don't like unions. You don't like unions. You don't like industry funds. You don't like super. You can't bear it. The regulations will allow transparent reporting of information streamlining some of the requirements. They will still be required to do a whole range of reporting. I know you're obsessed with the fact that you think that industry super funds make political donations, which is where this is going. They've been asked about that. They say they don't. We've asked the independent regulator, APRA, who has been poring over this issue, and they haven't found anything. So, Let's debate it. I'm sure we'll have the opportunity to debate these when the regs come before the Senate. Thank you, Minister. Senator Smith, second supplementary. Thank you very much, Madam President. The Assistant Treasurer and Minister for Financial Services justified the recently updated regulations on superannuation annual members' meeting notices by claiming that the previous disclosure rules were too onerous on funds. What is the estimated cost saving the industry may be able to benefit from as a result of these new measures? Thank you, Senator Smith. Minister. Thank you, Madam President. I will take that part of the question on notice as well, and I'll come back to the chamber uh, if I can find, provide further information. But I would say that under the reg draft regulations that no doubt this Senate will debate, Funds will still be required to provide written notice to members which details fund performance, their outcomes for the period, the total payments they make to industrial bodies, marketing and advocacy. Um, and, um, uh, if I can provide further information around this, notwithstanding the fact that we acknowledge the opposition are opposed to superannuation, really, if you were able to say it, you would. Senator Rennick just said it was evil. You just said it was evil. We know what you're on about. You're obsessed Minister, with industry Minister, funds. Minister, you're obsessed with Minister super. Gallagher, you're obsessed Minister, with working people Minister, actually having a decent Minister. retirement. Um, Senator Scar and Senator McGrath, I believe you were directing those comments directly at the minister, and I'd ask them to be withdrawn without repeating the offence. I withdraw. Thank you. Withdraw. Thank you. Uh, minister, have you finished? Uh, Senator Cox. Two, two weeks ago, the government opened up 47,000 square kilometres of Australia's oceans for gas and oil exploration. The science is overwhelmingly Sorry, clear. Sorry, Senator Cox, I don't want to interrupt you, but the question is directed oh, to the which question minister? Is to minister Farrell. Thank you. Please continue. <laughs> yeah, can't help that one. Sorry, can't Order. help that one. <laughs> Order. Um, 
to Minister Farrell representing the Minister for Resources. Um, in order for us to avoid this climate disaster, we simply can't open up any new fossil fuel uh, or gas fields. What formula did the Minister for Resources apply in making the decision to ensure that the recent announcement didn't contravene the government's own 43 per cent emissions reduction target and Australia's commitments under the Paris Agreement? Thank you, Senator Cox. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, Madam President, uh, and thank uh, the Senator for the, um, uh, the question. And, uh, I'd start by uh, prefacing my comments uh, that um, Senator King has uh, been doing a, uh, sorry, Minister King has been doing a terrific job uh, in this space since uh, she uh, she came uh, into the uh, into the portfolio. Um, very fine, very fine job. Uh, the Albanese, if you if you let me, with with respect, uh, Senator, if you let me uh, finish uh, my uh, my answer. Um, the order, as, as distinct from the now opposition, the uh, Albanese government went to the last election uh, with a commitment that uh, uh, we would uh, introduce. Uh, um, um, Ford. Minister, please resume your seat. Sorry. Uh, Senator Cox. The was quite direct. What formula did the minister apply in her decision making um, in this recent amount, announcement about ocean acreage? And you're raising a point of order? Yes. Senator On Cox. relevance, yes. Yeah. Um, Senator Cox, I'll just draw your. Uh, sorry. <laughs> minister, I'll just draw your um, attention back to the question um, put by Senator Cox. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the. Um, no, that will be later, <coughs> Senator. Um, the, uh, the Albanese government went to the last election with a commitment to uh, uh, reduce um, emissions by 43 per cent uh, uh, by 2030, Order. and that's, that's what we're going to do. That's, that's the commitment we made to the Australian people. Uh, that's the commitment we will deliver on. And in a very short space of time, you're going to get a chance to vote on that very commitment. Now, in the meantime, in the meantime, uh, in the meantime, um, we need to transition from the current position that uh, we find ourselves in to that 43% reduction. Uh, and the way in which we're going to do that. Um, Thank you, Minister. The oh. time has expired. Senator Cox, first supplementary. Considering. Order. <laughs> Senator Cox. Considering we didn't get an answer to that one, uh, can the Minister provide a time frame in which the government will sign and implement the Global Methane Pledge for a transition out of fossil fuels into a cleaner, greener energy future? Minister Farrell. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Madam uh, President, and uh, thank the Senator for her, uh, her, her question. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the Minister, Senator, uh, Minister uh, King, uh, has uh, of course been dealing uh, with, uh, with all of these uh, issues. Um, they are uh, important issues. They're, they're uh, difficult issues. Um, <coughs> they are issues. Well, we we took. We took a series of commitments. We took a series. We took. We took. Order. We, order. Senator Wong. It's the wrong Minister, portfolio. please continue. Thank you, uh, uh, Madam President. We took a series of commitments to the last election, and we were elected as the government of this uh, of this country. Uh, one of those commitments was the uh, 43 uh, per cent uh, emission reduction target by uh, uh, 2030 and the zero emission uh, target Thank by— Thank you, Minister. Uh, Your time has expired. <coughs> Senator Cox, second supplementary. Let's try a different tack, shall we? <coughs> I don't know. Deb, are you asking the question? <laughs> Order. When will— Minister Tavara, when will this government listen to the voices of First Nations people who have not provided free prior informed consent to the destruction of their cultural heritage and continue to see disrespect for their self-governance and determination of economic development relating to resources projects on their country? Go on. 
Uh, Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and thank uh, the uh, Senator for her, uh, her question. Um, <clears throat> there is no government in this uh, country's history that's got a greater commitment uh, to dealing with the uh, issue of Indigenous uh, disadvantage than the Albanese uh, Labor government. Uh, we, we, intend, we intend to deliver on all of the promises that we made to Indigenous, uh, Indigenous Australians in the lead up to the last election, and that, of course, includes a referendum on the, uh, on the voice. For um, the, yeah. for Senator, the first... uh, Minister, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Thorpe. Point of order, President. Mm -hmm. Relevance. The question was on free, prior and informed consent. Yep. We don't want to hear about uh, their flag you, waving for black uh, fellas. We want to know how they got Senator consent. Thorpe, resume your seat. And I do remind you and other senators, when you put a point of order, it is about the question. It is short and sharp, and it does not include any additional comments such as those that you made. The minister is being relevant. Please continue, Minister Farrell. <coughs> Thank, thank you, uh, um, Madam uh, President. Um, this this uh, government uh, has made a commitment to Indigenous Australians. Uh, that commitment uh, includes, includes, amongst other things, uh, a referendum uh, on the voice, giving Indigenous Australians a voice uh, in the uh, in this uh, in this Parliament. Uh, that is what we thank intend. Thank you, Minister. The time has expired. Uh, Senator Grogan. Uh, my question is to the minister representing the Minister of Climate Change and Energy, Senator Wong. Uh, can the minister outline to the Senate the importance of ending the climate wars and legislating a target on climate change? Minister. Thank you, uh, President, and thank you to Senator Grogan and for your advocacy as well on climate and other progressive issues over many years. And those on this side of the chamber understand that action on climate change isn't just good for the future of the country. It isn't just necessary uh, because of the situation we see around the globe. It's also good for our economy. It's good for Australian jobs. That's what it's good for. I know this is difficult for those opposite to understand. After nine years of uh, the climate wars being a centrepiece of your political project, it is hard for you to understand that there is actually a way forward that is about jobs and about uh, dealing with, the, with, with climate. Uh, the Senator, legislation— Minister, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Rustin. Ma Madam President, I was just seeking some advice from you as to whether this question was in order. Is this order. a point of order? No, I'm actually seeking some advice from you uh, in relation to whether this uh, question is in order given the matter that is currently before debate in this chamber in government business. Oh, thank you, Senator Rustin. I'll <coughs> seek some advice. Um, Senator Rustin, as long as anyone answering this question uh, does not go to the specifics of the bill before the Senate, then it is um, perfectly fine to talk in generalities. Order! Order! In the way the ministers are doing. Uh, Minister Wong. Thank you. I, I anticipated this might happen, actually, because. And, and uh, can I tell you why? Because we know those on the other side will do anything not to talk about climate change. You will do anything not to talk about climate action. You will do anything not to debate the bill. And you will do anything to ignore that the Australian people Order. clearly voted for action on Order. climate. And you can't bear it, can you? You can't bear it. You can't bear it that the climate war you thought would continue to yield a political dividend might actually end. Might actually end. You can't bear it. Now, I would just Order. make a point, Madam President, uh, President, that President Reid in 1999 made this point that questions may not be asked on the detail of the bill or debate, but otherwise the topic is not barred from questioning. But I know that it's a hard thing. Order. If you're a member of the coalition, you just don't want to talk about climate because Senator Payne doesn't agree with Senator Canavan and Senator Mackenzie doesn't agree with Senator Rustin. And they are utterly divided on this. They are utterly divided on this and, and the voters Wong, know it. The time and the has voters expired. Order. 
I'm going to wait for I'm going to wait for quiet. And I would ask once again, it is order. Senator McKenzie. <laughs> uh, Senator Grogan, first supplementary. Excellent response, Minister. Thank you so much. Um, can the minister outline the threats to certainty that underpin the investment needed to address climate change? Minister. <laughs> I thank the senator for a question, and you know it's really interesting, isn't it, that the party that believes they're the party of business, yeah, right. the party that believes they're the party of investment, will actually more like the old Soviet Union. They're more like the old Soviet Union, standing in the way of progress, standing in the way of the market. And you know, uh, those opposite have those opposite have presided presided over nine years, nine years of un of division. And delay and dysfunction when it comes to climate. And you know, if you talk to the Business Council of Australia, if you talk to the National Farmers Federation, if you talk to Aki, all of them, all of them are welcoming a government that is actually prepared to give the market certainty. Something you could never deliver when in government because of your deep divisions on this issue. The climate wars can end. We will, on this side, see that as a step Thank forward. You, Minister, I know it's deeply distressing expired. for the Senator Grogan, second supplementary. Um, as you've pointed out, um, the Australians made a very clear choice at the election uh, that they wanted action on climate change following a wasted decade under the Liberals and the Nationals. Um, how does the Albanese Labor government climate policies deliver on action and put an end to the coalition's climate wars? Uh, before I call the minister, I'm going to ask for quiet when the minister responds. Minister. Well, um, President, uh, Australians did send the parliament a clear message. Uh, they voted for action on climate change. Yep. Uh, Australians in Wentworth, Australians in North Sydney, Australians in Warringah, in McKellar, in Goldstein, in Higgins, in Boothby, in Curtin and Kuyong made their interests very clear. Uh, it's very clear, and I know those opposite, those opposite really don't like to hear just how out of Minister, step with the Australian Minister, people they Minister are. Wong. Listen to them. This is the most you know, animated Wong. you've been since Senator the election. Wong. I'm waiting for quiet. Interjections are incredibly disorderly, and people on my left are yelling. Minister, please continue. Yeah, they yell, President, because they really have nothing to say on this. That's why they yell. They've, they've got nothing to say. You've lo I'll take the interjection from Senator White. You've, they've lost their reason for being, That's right. which is a decade of the climate wars preventing progress. And now what are you going to do? What are you going to do when the bill comes before the chamber? The question for the Liberal Party and the, co the National you, Party, Minister, will you learn from your mistakes? Expired. That's Senate, the question for the coalition. resume your seat. Senator D. Pocock. Thank you, President. Um, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy, Senator Wong. Has the Clean Energy Regulator raised any concerns with the government about the integrity of or design of two recent ACU methods, the plantation forestry or landfill gas methods? Minister. Uh, thank you um, to the Yes, I, I was getting some advice from Minister Bowen about the direct question. Isn't it? It's a dreadful thing to actually want to advise Order. the parliament, isn't it? Order. Such a dreadful thing. Order. I know that seems like an odd thing. You'd actually want to try and advise the parliament. Um, uh, Senator, thank you for the question and thank you for your interest in this issue. I, I know that there have been uh, a number of public concerns raised uh, about uh, the probity uh, and the veracity of uh, the, the units. Can I advise from Minister Bowen's office that the Clean Energy Regulator have not, has not raised any concerns? Uh, however, concerns have obviously been raised externally by others, uh, including, uh, I think, the senator and others who have been uh, in the media. Uh, I'm advised that these are being dealt with by the, the Chubb review, 
uh, which I'm happy to give further information on when I can find that piece of paper. <laughs> so, Minister Bowen has commissioned uh, a review by uh, Professor Chubb, who, as you would know, is the former chief scientist, along with an expert panel. Uh, as prom this was promised before the election. The Minister Bowen, in opposition, uh, indicated that we would, uh, if we win go one government, commission an independent review to ensure the integrity carbon credits and their consistency with our, our agricultural biodiversity and other goals. Uh, Professor Ian Chubb has been ap appointed and is supported by three other experts in the fields of governance, science and carbon markets. The review will examine scheme governance and the integrity of key carbon crediting methods, including whether transparency could be improved. Thank you, Minister. Senator Pocock, first supplementary. Thank you, Senator Wong. I find it strange that the, the regulator hasn't raised any concerns when I've received a letter that acknowledges the need to reform the landfill gas methods from companies that represent over 80 per cent of the accused generated under this method. Given the regulator hasn't raised concerns, despite industry having concerns, are you worried that there's an inherent conflict of interest between the regulator both creating methods and then actually regulating them? Thank you, Senator. Minister. Well, I, I, well, uh, I, I thank the senator for the supplementary question, and I, I can say to him, uh, as someone who does uh, believe unlike some in this place, in the benefits of utilising the market for good rather than for bad, uh, that uh, we need, we need, we need, uh, <laughs> uh, we do need integrity uh, in the system of uh, carbon credits to, to ensure uh, that there is additionality. We're actually reducing Australia's emissions and using an incentive to do so. Uh, I have seen some of the reporting, including, as the senator says, uh, from uh, firms uh, engaging in the market. Uh, I understand the concerns he's raising. Can I say to him, uh, this is some, these are some of the reasons why Minister Bowen has taken the view uh, that an independent review uh, is appropriate and that is underway. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Pocock, second supplementary. President, and thank you, Senator Wong. As you pointed out, given the need for transparency and accountability and ultimately integrity in our carbon markets, will the government commit to including a review of the regulator as a function of the Chubb review? Minister. Uh, look, uh, I, I think. Uh, Obviously, uh, I'll raise the issue you raise or, uh, with Minister Bowen, but I would make the point if the, if the review is looking at scheme governance and integrity of carbon crediting methods, then, then obviously what we want is uh, all aspects of scheme governance to be appropriate. Um, uh, as I said, uh, you know, the, these are matters which have been discussed publicly. We understand the need for uh, integrity uh, in the market, uh, particularly uh, if, as we hope, the legislation which uh, the opposition don't want me to talk about passes this chamber, uh, then obviously there is a framework which would, would, would incentivise that. Uh, but uh, I think that the terms of the review, as, as I understand them from the advice I've received, do extend to scheme governance, and that's appropriate. Thank you. Uh, Senator Patterson. Thank you, My question is to the minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. In July this year, the Reserve Bank Governor issued a warning to the new government, and I quote, an important consideration is how inflation expectations and the general inflation psychology in the community evolve. If inflation expectations shift up and businesses and workers come to expect higher rates of inflation on an ongoing basis, it will be harder to return inflation to target. It is in our collective interest that this does not happen, end quote. Does the minister agree with the Governor of the RBA? Thank you, Senator Patterson. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. And yes, I do agree with the Governor um, on those comments, but I also would draw Senator Patterson's attention uh, to the comments that the Governor has been making for some time about wages growth essentially being a handbrake on the economy and, and advocating for sustainable and sensible wages growth, which we haven't seen now for a decade. Uh, and that is a problem in the economy. So, yes, uh, the governor is right to to raise the concerns around having wages rise 
exponentially you know, <laughs> and out of control, but that is not what we're seeing in this country. We're not seeing inflation and the problems with inflation are not being driven by wages because wages haven't been moving anywhere because they were a deliberate design feature of those opposite to keep them suppressed and, at best, stagnant. So we have to find the balance. We need sustainable, sensible wages growth for working people. Uh, Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Birmingham. President, point of order on, uh, on direct relevance. The, uh, the quote from the RBA governor that Senator Patterson read order. had no reference to wages growth, which has been the dominant feature of everything the minister has been going on about for close to a minute now in, uh, in her time. Uh, that, uh, that uh, the question and the quote relate specifically to broader inflationary impacts and expectations across the economy. Uh, thank you, Senator Birmingham. I, like you, have been listening closely to the minister, and I believe that she is being directly relevant to the question, and I invite her to continue. Uh, thank you, Madam Pre uh, President. Sorry, drop the madam. Um, I, I believed I answered the question. Sorry, I, I, I'm happy to deal with it in the supplementary, but I think I have been directly relevant, and I think that goes to some of the challenges facing the economy at the moment, which the the RBA uh, bank is dealing with on the monetary side, and we are dealing with uh, on the fiscal side. Is getting that balance right, making sure that we're um, not adding to inflationary pressures, but also making sure that working people are getting a bit of a crack at it and getting some suitable compensation to deal with those increasing costs of living that they're experiencing from uh, um, in rising inflation. And I would say the announcement that has been uh, made by the RBA today will add to some of those pressures on households and the challenges for the, the bank and for the government to work hand in hand to make sure we're doing what we can to ease those pressures on people. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Patterson, first supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. I thank the Minister for her answer to my primary question and her agreement with the RBA Governor that we should not add to inflation expectations. But only eight days after the Governor issued this warning, the Assistant Treasurer said prices for goods could go up, quote, 10, 15 or 20 per cent and went on to predict hyperinflation and strikes. He later predicted a very rocky 12 months for the Australian economy. Given the Assistant Treasurer's language and his position adds significantly to the market's inflationary expectations, has the Treasurer, the Minister for Finance, the Prime Minister counselled the Assistant Treasurer on the impact of his comments on inflation expectations? Thank you, Senator Patterson. Uh, Minister Gallagher. Oh, well, I'm going, to, I'm going to take a bit of a punt on the fact that um, that um, Senator Patterson is quoting selectively and has crafted <laughs> that question himself. Um, the government's expectations for um, inflation are outlined in the Treasurer's statement that he made in July. Um, that is that we would see inflation peak at seven and three quarter per cent in uh, the December quarter. Uh, that is the government's position on inflation, and I think it aligns with the RBA's. Uh, Senator Patterson, second supplementary. Uh, thank you, Madam President, and I welcome the uh, Finance Minister clarifying the Assistant Treasurer doesn't speak for the government on inflation. Uh, today, the Reserve Bank has raised interest rates uh, by 50 basis points, again the fourth rate rise now under this government. The RBA is having to lift interest rates to address skyrocketing inflation. <laughs> Why is the Treasurer and his colleagues continuing to ignore the RBA Governor's warning, the Assistant Treasurer, and predicting hyperinflation and economic tumult? Thank you, Senator Patterson. Minister Gallagher. Thank you. Well, honestly, the nerve of these uh, questions, it really is staggering. We inherited an economy with rising inflation and rising interest rates. Just let's not forget this. As a result of nine years of you guys with wasted opportunities and wrong or failed priorities, 22 Order. energy policies, a gas and energy crisis that we also inherited, a skills crisis that we also inherited, terminating measures that just drop off into the ether, a budget in a mess we also inherited. We are dealing with the realities of what happens when you have a Prime Minister with 10 portfolios or more because he didn't trust any of you. Um, Minister, he didn't trust any of you. Minister, Minister. And we're dealing with the mess. Resume your seat. Uh, Senator Birmingham, I've got a senator from your team on his feet. 
presumably with the point of order. Senator Patterson. You have correctly anticipated, uh, Madam President, on relevance. Uh, the question was about the Assistant Treasurer disregarding the advice of the RBA Governor about inflation expectations, not the other matters Senator Gallagher was going to. Uh, thank you, Senator, Senator Patterson. The question was in part about that, but it was also about um, the Reserve Bank increasing interest rates today, skyrocketing inflation and a number of other things. So I do believe that the minister is being relevant. Minister, please continue. Thank you. Um, thank you, President. And, uh, Yes, you're, you're right. In your ruling, the, the preamble was accusatory and ignored the fact that nine years of this mob had left the economy and the budget in a complete shambles, and nobody you, in the Minister, government is disagreeing with the. Senator Tyrrell. Uh, Senator Tyrrell. Oh, apologies. We were having a meeting. I apologise, President. Thank you. Um, my question is for the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. Minister, let's talk about the Australian Future Leaders Foundation. It's a foundation with no website. It appears to have no office, no staff and no previous record. When the grant was approved, there was no competitive process and merits review wasn't done. Despite all that, the previous government promised the foundation $18 million to set it up and $4 million a year to run it. The Governor-General might think it's a great idea, but with all due respect, Minister, there's no detail, let alone transparency. Where does your government stand on continuing the support for the foundation? Thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Minister Wong. Uh, and I can I thank Senator Tyrrell for her question uh, and uh, say I have a, a little bit of knowledge in this, although I suspect um, my colleague, uh, as in most things, Senator Geller has more. Um, uh, I am aware of this because this came to light, uh, as you correctly identify, under the previous government, uh, and it was uh, an issue at estimates that we did ask some questions about. And some of the issues that you avert to were raised by uh, people in the context of preparing for, for that uh, estimates um, round. Uh, I'm advised, or I understand, that that measure, along with a number of other measures that were announced by the previous government, is under review and will be considered in the context of the, of the budget preparation. Thank you, Minister. Senator Tyrrell, first supplementary. The Morrison government gave the Australian Future Leaders Foundation deductible gift recipient status last March. Apparently, the amendments were written up and approved a lot faster than normal. Is your government reviewing that decision? Minister. I can seek further advice on that, Senator Tyrrell, but I would anticipate that that would uh, you know, uh, be relevant to the review in the context of the budget, as I've described. Uh, Senator Tyrrell, second supplementary. Minister, media reports suggest the Morrison government's promise to give the foundation funding overlapped with the former Prime Minister's moves to take over more ministries. The Governor-General was involved in both decisions. I'm not suggesting he has done anything wrong, but aren't you worried about the public perception that creates? Minister. I have not, I don't, I, I'm not advised, nor am I aware of how the, those decisions correlate or don't correlate with some of the media reporting of the uh, swearing in of Mr Morrison to a number of other portfolios, which has subsequently come to light. So I'm not in a position to sort of give you an answer on that. Uh, obviously, in relation to uh, the swearing in, the issue of multiple ministries, the um, Prime Minister has commissioned uh, a, an inquiry. Uh, I think that, there's, that there is a view um, that um, uh, many Australians have expressed, which I think you're averting to, that it would be a good thing if there was more transparency around those, those sorts of arrangements. Uh, but obviously um, uh, the review uh, will deal with that. Uh, and in relation to the uh, DGR status, uh, again, uh, I'll take advice if, uh, and see what I'm able to give you. Uh, but I would assume uh, that may be, that's likely to be relevant to the consideration of the measure through the budget process. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Sheldon. The question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Gallagher. The Independent Reserve Bank just released its monthly interest rates decision. Can the Minister update the Senate on what that decision was and what it means for Australians, particularly for those with a mortgage? Minister. Um, President, I thank Senator Sheldon for the question. The government understands that Australians are doing it tough and that household budgets are under real pressure. 
The Independent Reserve Bank has just announced its decision to increase interest rates by another 50 basis points to bring the cash rate to 2.35 per cent. This has been widely predicted, but we know that that doesn't make it any easier for homeowners. We know that this means families will have to make more hard decisions about how to make ends meet. In terms of what it means for an average homeowner owning, owing $330,000, they will have to find it about $95 a month extra for repayments, on top of the $310 extra in repayments since early May. For Australians with a typical $500,000 mortgage, it's about an extra $145 a month, in addition to the extra $475 they've had to find since early May. We know that interest rate rises means families have to make those hard decisions about how to make ends meet. But as the Senate knows, it's not the job of the government to interfere with the independent decisions of the Reserve Bank. The Albanese government's plan is about steering the economy through this difficult period and building that better future that the Australian people uh, deserve. We will do this, um, President, by investing in the productive capacity of the economy, making those sensible uh, and considered policy decisions and investments uh, that won't add to inflationary pressures. But if we look at areas, and in particular the areas we focused on um, in the Jobs and Skills Summit around access to cheaper uh, and more affordable childcare, uh, to cut the price of medicines, to fast track those fee free TAFE places, to bring them forward, Senator Hume, to next year, to next year. Uh, the increase that we've seen in, page, in pensions, allowances and rent assistance, and of course the legislation. Thank you, Minister. The time has expired. Senator Sheldon, first supplementary. Can the minister explain what the government is doing to assist Australians with current cost of living pressures that have built up over a number of many years? Minister. Um, President, and since we formed government, we've hit the ground running, yeah, yeah. implementing our policies that were, um, we outlined in the election campaign to respond to the cost of living crisis that we inherited from you lot, those opposite. We can't solve 10 years of neglect and wasted opportunities overnight. We have to start by acknowledging that. But it is our job to do what we responsibly can to help Australians deal with these pressures in the short term and build a more resilient economy that is better able to withstand future shocks. That's why we're making childcare cheaper through our $5 billion investment in the October budget. It's why we're making medicines cheaper. It's why we argued for a minimum wage increase and why we're starting to get the work going on, get mo wages moving again. It's why we're lifting the speed limit on the economy with more investment in TAFE, more investment in cheaper and cleaner energy. Do you like that? Cl cheaper and cleaner energy. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Sheldon, second supplementary. I'm uh, sorry, Senator. Yes, Order. Sorry. Order. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Second supplementary. Can the minister outline the importance of having a clean, clear plan that will grow the economy and how that will help Australians through these challenging times? Thank you, Minister. Senator Sheldon, for the question. And unlike uh, the previous government, which didn't have an economic plan, it just had a prime minister that wanted to grab up any portfolio he could. That's, right. That's the only plan that that you guys had. You didn't know what each other was doing. Our economic plan is a deliberate and direct response to the economic circumstances that uh, were Minister, left by those Minister, opposite. You hate hearing Minister, about it, don't you, because you know it's true. Seat. Order. Order. The minister needs to be heard in silence. Thank you. Minister, please continue. Thank you, President. We inherited an economy characterised with high and rising inflation flat and falling real wages and a productivity paralysis. That is your record. We also inherited a budget with a trillion dollars of debt, deficits as far as I can see, billions of dollars chucked in the way of the National Party in a hope that they'd keep your coalition together. That's your record. We're not going to stand here and be lectured by you guys about any cost of living crisis, considering we're the ones dealing with the mess that you left us and you abandoned Australia in the process. Thank you, Minister. You're uh, Senator Davey. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister for Emergency Management, Senator Watt. 
Minister, uh, as you're very well aware, the Liberals and Nationals in government made a commitment to the residents of Lib Lismore uh, that the entire $150 million allocation from the 22 to 23 Emergency Response Fund would be directed to Lismore for its rebuilding and flood mitigation efforts. Do you intend to stand by this commitment? Minister. Thank you, President. Uh, short answer is yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator, for the question. Um, the, the good thing about answering the question quickly is you can spend the next one minute fifty talking about other things. Um, well, relate, related things. Related things. Order. Um, but Senator Order. Davey, I know that you have a genuine interest in um, the people of Lismore and the Northern Rivers. I think you've been there since your appointment as the Shadow Minister, as have I, uh, and, and most recently Senator Sheldon. The new uh, special envoy for disaster recovery appointed by the, uh, the Prime Minister uh, to ensure that uh, communities who are experiencing disasters uh, recovery are getting the support that they need. In fact, Senator Sheldon was in Lismore just last week, on Friday I believe it was, announcing additional support for the Northern Rivers in the form of around $50 million to support commercial landlords uh, uh, with grants. The importance of that, as Senator Sheldon so eloquently put in the press conference that he, he undertook in Lismore, uh, is that there are many small businesses who are located in commercial premises, who, and those small businesses are not able to reopen yet because the commercial landlords have not been able to afford to repair their properties. So that assistance, which is contributed to by the New South Wales government, will assist with not just the landlords but the small businesses as well. So again, can I thank Senator Sheldon for the work that he's been doing there? But um, the money that Senator Davey is talking about, of course, comes from the infamous Emergency Response Fund. Remember that one? Yeah. The Emergency Response Fund that the government set up over three years ago with $4 billion in it uh, that accrued the, the former government over $800 million in interest, did not build a single disaster mitigation project, did not spend a cent on disaster recovery. It took the devastating floods we saw in the Northern Rivers and Queensland for any announcements to be made. And which government is going to deliver on them? The Albanese Labor government. Uh, Senator Davey, first supplementary. Yes, well, thank you, Minister. Um, the, uh, and I'm, I'm, I always appreciate a, a quick answer, and I appreciate you being so succinct. So, yes, Lismore, you get $150 million in this financial year. So, the Prime Minister recently announced $75 million of funding from the Emergency Response Fund to be spread across 62 local government areas in New South Wales. Can you confirm that this money is from the 2021 to 22 pool? Uh, Minister. Thank you, uh, short answer? Yes, I can. Um, the, so just to, just to assist Senator Davey, the previous question was about the allocation of $150 million from the unused emergency response fund for 22-23. And that money will be used for the Northern Rivers, not just Lismore, but for the Northern Rivers. Uh, the money that you're talking about there, uh, the $75 million, came from the 2021-22 allocation from the Emergency Response Fund. And as Senator McKenzie would know, because I think she was involved in making the announcement as the then minister, um, the remaining $75 million from the 21-22 allocation uh, will be spent in Queensland, assisting them recover from their floods. So it's $150 million for each of those two financial years. The first of those two years is being split between Queensland and New South Wales, and that will be spent in New South Wales across the whole state because, of course, there were other areas that experienced floods too. Thank you, Minister. Senator Davey, second supplementary. So thank you very much. As I now understand it, you have just confirmed that the amount announcement made by the Prime Minister um, at the Bush summit, claiming $75 million was new money for the people of Lismore, was in fact the same money as announced by the Liberals and Nationals in government in March this year, re-announced by yourself in June this year, and now announced for a third time by the Prime Minister. What message have you got to the people of Lismore? Uh, Senator who can Davey, your time has expired. Minister. The Order. message. Thank you. Order. Thank you, President. Thank you, President. Minister, the, please resume your seat. Oh, let's just give the minister a chance to answer before we start the disorderly interjections, Minister. 
The message, Senator Davey, that I have for the people of Lismore is that they finally have a federal government who will actually deliver to them. They will have it. They have a government that shows up. Unlike the former government, certain people from our opposition, as it was at the time, were in Lismore shortly after the floods, uh, and we will deliver. Now, the, I, I, I do need to just correct one thing I said before. The, the funding that Senator Sheldon announced was $30 million Order. for commercial landlords as opposed to 50. so just to correct the record there. Uh, there's so much support that we're putting in, and it's sometimes hard to remember exactly how much there's so much money being put in, which, which is very much deserved. The, the announcement the Prime Minister made in Griffith the other day uh, was to announce how the money would be spent. So we have worked with the New South Wales government collaboratively, something that the previous Liberal and National federal government was unable to do with a Liberal and National government, and we're Thank now getting you, on with Minister delivering White, the money. Your time has expired. Senator White. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, Senator Watt. What are the latest figures from ABES on the value of uh, Australia's agricultural production and exports? Minister. Thank you, Senator White, and I'm really looking forward to seeing your sterling performances on the uh, Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport Committee, which I know you will do so well. Uh, and Senator White, I can confirm that I have good news for farmers and good news for Australians. Today, the Australian Bureau of Agricultural and Resource Economics and Sciences, otherwise known as ABES, has released their latest report on Australian crops and commodities. This year, farm exports are forecast to be worth a record-breaking $70.3 billion, which is a remarkable achievement. This is the biggest ever agricultural exports in our nation's history. I am shocked. I am shocked, President, that the National Party of all parties Order. wants to yell Order. at us when we have good news for farmers and good news for agriculture. But then again, Minister when you see Watt, what the leader of the national please resume your seat. Order on my left in particular. Minister, please continue. Thank you, President. It's a shame that they hate good news, President, even when it comes to farmers and agriculture. But then again, it's no surprise when we see what the leader of the National Party has to say Order. about the National Farmers Federation, calling them cowards uh, and all sorts of other things as well. This is the biggest ever agricultural exports our nation has ever seen. And ABES has also forecast a winter crop harvest of 55.5 million tonnes. This combination of high yields and high exports is good news for Aussie farmers, farm workers, rural communities and Order. all of us in this country. And it also means that Australia can do its part in contributing to global food supply. Over this side of the chamber, we like good news, especially when it comes to agriculture and our farmers. It's unfortunate that we're not joined on the other side. We know that trade and exports make all the difference in times of stress and food scarcity, and I couldn't be prouder to see Australia more than pulling its weight. And I congratulate all the farmers and all the farm workers who've worked so hard to deliver these fantastic results. It's happening in all sorts of sectors. Uh, we know Thank the you, industry Minister. has its challenges. Uh, Senator White, first supplementary. What fantastic news, Senator Watt. What is the uh, Albanese love government uh, doing to support the agriculture industry reach its goal of $100 billion by 2030? Minister. Thank you, President. Thanks again, Senator White. As I was just saying in answer to the last question, we know that the agriculture sector has its challenges and we're getting on with solving them. But in the meantime, uh, this data shows that the industry is in good shape, and that's a good thing. In terms of the, the supplementary question, we are in lockstep with the agriculture sector's ambition to become a $100 billion industry by 2030. And we're not doing that. Uh, we are doing this uh, by working with all players in the industry, not dividing them and not fighting against them. We are bringing people together, not hurling insults from the sidelines when it comes to agriculture. And that started with the industry roundtables I held in my first weeks as minister, and it's continued at the Jobs and Skills Summit, where we agreed on measures to help the industry deal with workforce shortages right now. It re I am stunned. At first, it was the National Party getting stuck in about agriculture doing well. Now it's the Liberal Party getting stuck in about agriculture doing well. What's, I thought you liked agriculture. I thought you liked rural communities. This is good news for the industry. And Thank all you, you can minister. Do is yell. Your time has expired. Senator White, second. Uh, Senator. Senator White, second supplementary. What are the main threats to agricultural productivity? Senator McKenzie. And what is the Albanese government doing to support industry in addressing these challenges? Minister. 
Thank you, Senator White. Now, when I, when I was suggested that I could ask a question about the threats to agriculture productivity, I took the high road and I decided to not comment on the threats that sit over the opposition. But now that with all this feedback that I'm getting, maybe I'll have to drop the script and revise the answer. Uh, it will come as no surprise uh, that one of the major threats to the industry is this is serious. It will come as no surprise there is one of the major threats to the industry is the risk of exotic animal diseases entering the country from overseas. We've implemented a three-pronged approach to help protect industry by supporting Indonesia to deal with their outbreak, strengthening our borders and by ensuring we are prepared should an outbreak occur. And it's really good to see cattle prices uh, at sales across the country beginning to rebound in spite of the fear-mongering that we saw from those opposite over the last couple of months. Another serious threat is the impacts that climate change is having on farming, as natural disasters become more fierce and more frequent. And supporting the sector to adapt and improve its climate resilience is imperative to our future food and fibre security. Thank you, security. Minister. The time has expired. Um, Senator Canavan jumped. I, I, I think I have to go to Senator Wong first. Yes. Coming up uh, Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, um, Order. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy. Oh, sorry, sorry, ma um, Madam President. Um, I did. Sorry. Okay. Uh, Please continue. Senator Watts Senator doing such Canavan. a good job that my question is to the Minister for Agriculture, uh, Fisheries and Forestry again. On the 9th of August, Labor, and the Labor government announced a $10 million biosecurity cooperation package to assist Indonesia as it responds to foot and mouth disease and lumpy skin disease. Can the Minister for Agriculture outline how many staff have been trained on the ground in Indonesia? Uh, Minister. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Canada, Senator Canavan, for giving me an opportunity to talk again about the support that our government is providing uh, Indonesia to deal with its foot and mouth disease outbreak and its lumpy skin disease outbreak. The, uh, I was very pleased uh, to make the announcement that Senator Canavan refers to, in partnership with Senator Wong, uh, that we would provide $10 million in the international future. development but support to Indonesia to assist them with their outbreak. That, of course, comes in addition to the support that we had already offered. Uh, shortly after I was appointed to the role as minister, I uh, committed one million vaccines for foot and mouth disease to Indonesia, which I'm very pleased to say have arrived in Indonesia, have been delivered and are in the process of being uh, uh, provided to farmers as we speak. Uh, we then went on to announce uh, I'm pretty sure the figure was $14 million uh, on my return from Indonesia in additional support uh, in the form of more vaccines, more technical assistance, uh, diagnostics um, and other Minister, things. Please resume your seat. Senator Canavan. Thank you, uh, um, Madam President. Uh, just a point of order on relevance. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the question was very specific about how many staff uh, had been trained on the ground, and the, and the minister has mentioned a lot about the package but hasn't gone anywhere near uh, answering the question. I'll listen closely to the remainder of the question. Um, it, my understanding was it's also a, it's primarily about foot and mouth disease, but please, Minister, continue. Uh, thank you, President. The, the $10 million package that I announced at the Press Club, and again I recognise Senator Wong for her contribution to that announcement, uh, was a combination of issues. Some of it was staff, and I'm happy to take on notice for you the exact number of staff that are, that are working there. It includes uh, vets and other uh, technical assistance as well. But that money also involves another allocation of vaccines to Indonesia, which we are in the process of procuring. I know there are some people over the other side who think that you should be able to snap your fingers and get those vaccines immediately. That's not how it works. There's a worldwide shortage of those vaccines at the moment, but we are actively engaged in procurement negotiations to obtain another round of vaccines which will be delivered. Uh, but as I say, that $10 million goes further than just vaccines. It's things like providing vets, uh, providing diagnostic assistance to make sure that Indonesia has the capability to undertake testing uh, for foot and mouth disease and a range of other support as well. Thank you, Senator Canavan. First supplementary. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President. Uh, uh, and that goes to my supplementary question on vaccines. The minister has already outlined that the package includes uh, vaccines, but can the minister outline if any vaccines that we have purchased have been administered in Indonesia to date? Thank you, uh, Senator Canavan, Minister. Uh, thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Just before answering the supplementary question, uh, I should also point out that the support that we're providing to Indonesia in the sense of personnel is also provided remotely. Um, so there will be and, uh, and will be additional Australian staff on the ground in Indonesia, but some of that support is already being provided remotely back here from Australia as well. Um, as I say, 
One million vaccines uh, that Australia is providing to Indonesia have now arrived. Uh, that happened a couple of weeks ago. Again, I'm happy to give you the exact details on notice as to how many of, of those vaccines have been administered. But my understanding is that the rollout has, is well progressed. Uh, we know that there's an urgent need to get those vaccines into uh, cattle as quickly as possible, and I'm happy to come back on notice with the uh, exact answer. Senator Canavan, second supplementary. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Uh, uh, the package also includes technical and advisory support to tackle outbreaks in Indonesia. Can the minister outline exactly what support is being provided to date? Minister. Um, again, thank you, President. Again, I'm, I'm happy to provide on notice uh, the exact details of the support that's been provided to date from that package in the form of technical assistance. Uh, I, I think I've pretty much already answered what that technical assistance will involve. It's a mixture of veterinary assistance, um, diagnostics assistance to help with testing capability, uh, the manufacturing of vaccines, because of course Indonesia have said that they want to manufacture their, their vaccines domestically. But again, I'll come back with the exact details on notice. Uh, Minister, Senator Wong. I'm so tempted to keep going, Madam President, but uh, may I ask that further questions be placed on notice? I have a lot of people on that side. Wanting... Senator Chandler. The Senate take note of the uh, answer provided by Senator Gallagher to the question asked by Senator Patterson during question time. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Um, well, it's quite appropriate, I think, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, that that last hour or so of our parliamentary day is referred to as question time and not answer time, because certainly if any good Australians were listening in to what the Senate was discussing over this past period, they wouldn't have any clearer answer as to what this government, the Labor Albanese government, is doing to address uh, the rising inflation and cost of living pressures in this country. We know that Australian households are feeling the pinch when it comes to the spiral in cost of living expenses and record high inflation. And I note, uh, Mr Deputy President, that inflation under the Albanese government is running at 6.1 per cent as of uh, the June 2022 quarter. This is the highest rate of inflation in almost uh, 32 years since the December quarter in 1990. Uh, I was about six months old when inflation was last that high, Mr, Acting, uh, Mr. Deputy President. Uh, and I certainly uh, expect that many people um, of my age and in my generation will uh, not have really understood or, or uh, experienced the pressures uh, resulting out of inflation this high in their lifetime. Over the last few months, we've also seen the price of household goods skyrocket, uh, increased cost of services and rising building costs. Australians feel these inflationary pressures every time they pass through the supermarket checkout, when they head to their local medical practitioner or when they want to treat their family to a day out to mark a special occasion. And in my own state of Tasmania, where we rely on air and sea freight services to transport essential household goods, such as groceries, these rising transport costs are only adding to the inflationary pain. All of these expenses add up and they make it harder and harder for Australian households to make ends meet. Yet this government has failed to deliver any shred of a plan to immediately address the rising cost of living and the pressure of inflation on Australian households. They did have one idea during the election campaign. We heard time and time again the Labor Party telling everybody that they would cut their power bills by $275 a year for the average Australian household. Reducing the amount that Australians pay for their power would at least have provided some relief to household budgets, but they've abandoned that commitment, Mr Deputy President. They have gone back on their promise, hoping that Australians wouldn't notice. Well, certainly our job in opposition, Mr Deputy President, is to make sure that Australians notice that the Labor government has gone back on that commitment that that made during the election. In abandoning that commitment, Labor have shown Australians that they have no real plan to tackle cost of living expenses and inflationary pressures. And while talk might be cheap for Labor, it doesn't result in cheaper power bills for Australians. And what have Labor been doing instead of developing this plan to tackle the rising, cost of the rising uh, inflation and the rising cost of living? 
photo opportunities with American basketballers and moving to abolish the ABCC to appease their union mates. The Prime Minister was asked by reporters only this morning what he would do to address the cost of living, and he responded with some sort of uh, vague uh, response about introducing legislation uh, aimed at medicine prices and childcare at some point in the future. I don't think that response is going to in any way address the immediate pressure of cost of living and inflation that is being felt by Australians, Mr Deputy President. Australians expect an answer to this problem now, today. They don't expect one into the future. They don't expect, oh, we'll look at this problem down the track or we'll think about it in the October budget. These are pressures that Australians are feeling here and now on this very day. It certainly seems like the government is just making it up as it goes along. And adding further pain to Australians today are paying off their home. Interest rates have continued to rise uh, with the additional financial burden being felt by those making mortgage repayments. Uh, as the Minister uh, Senator Gallagher updated the chamber partway through question time. The cash rate today has increased by 50 basis points to 2.35 per cent, which signifies five consecutive months of rate rises, with borrowers starting to feel the pressure as they pay off their mortgage. Part of the great Australian dream has always been home ownership, and these rising interest rates are only going to add to the financial impediments on those Australians looking to own a home of their own, looking to make ends meet at a time where costs of living and inflation are only getting higher. As Australia grappled with the detrimental effects of the pandemic, however, the previous coalition government was absolutely aware that we needed a solid and multi-pronged approach to assist with Australia's economic recovery. That's what we did in, our gov in government. That is our record, and it's disappointing to see this sort of response from the Senator Labor Chamber. government. Senator Brown. Uh, Deputy President, I, I really think that the, the contribution by Senator Chandler has completely ignored the last nine years of her government. On the 21st of May, on the 21st of May, the house of cards that was your government came tumbling down, exposed for what it was, a government of waste, rorts and lost opportunities. And quite, quite frankly, that's been kind. That's been kind to their government. That's been kind to nine years of a Liberal coalition government. Because we had sport, don't forget we had sports rods. We had cuts to aged care spending, and we, of course, we had cuts to real wages. Boasted about, boasted about, by the um, government of the day. Boasted about the fact that it was a deliberate design in their economic plan. They didn't have a plan. They didn't have a plan. What they had was. Uh, a, a, a prime minister that was focused on delivering for their mates, focused on rorting public monies to go into areas where they thought it would be best for a political return, not an economic plan to put um, this country on the right path. Now this government, the Albanese government, understands the, that um, people are doing it tough. And, we have, uh, and they also understand that we have inherited, as Senator Gallagher said in her uh, response to the question today, that we've inherited from the Liberal opposition a cost of living crisis. You can't ignore that that is the fact. So no matter what Senator Chandler wants to talk about in terms of um, the plan that her, her government had, everyone knows, the Australian people know. That's why they punted them on the 21st of May. That's why they're on that side, because the Australian people got sick of their money being wasted with no plan, just wait waste, rorts and lost opportunities. So yes, we have inherited a cost of living crisis from those opposite, an economic and budget in complete shambles. That's what we inherited. But the Albanese government does understand 
that Australians are doing it tough, tough, and the current cost of living pressures that have been built up over many years. But we have acted quickly, and Senator Gallagher, in a, her response, did um, mention some of those, um, some of the initiatives that the um, Labor government is putting in place. To, so. We do say, and we're very upfront about this, we, we can't solve the nine years of neglect and decay overnight. But it's, it's our task to do what we can do responsibly, to help Australians deal with these pressures in the short term and build a more resilient economy that is better able to withstand future shocks. That's why we are making childcare cheaper through our $5 billion investment in the October budget, and that's why we're making medicines cheaper, and that's why we successfully, successfully argued for a minimum wage increase and, we're, and why we're starting to work to get wages moving again, unlike, unlike the op now opposition that boasts about keeping wages low. I mean, the very issue that goes to the heart of the family household budget. And then they come in here and try to say that it's all our fault. A trillion dollars of debt, a shambles of an economy and a budget, a, a cost of living crisis that we inherited from them. The goal. So we have argued successfully, as I've said, uh, and, our, and our job is to start to get wages moving again. Senator Canavan. Thank you, Deputy President. Uh, it is very uh, notable that uh, in Senator Brown's contribution uh, on this debate that uh, she almost exclusively spoke about the past, almost exclusively uh, spoke about, in her words, the last nine years, uh, all looking back in the rearview mirror, uh, almost nothing. Uh, in her contribution seeking to defend this new government about the future. And it is the future that is concerning uh, Australians right now, because Australians can see uh, this cost of living crisis coming down the tracks to them. It is already uh, quite difficult for many Australian families, as interest rates have gone up significantly over the past six months, five rate rises uh, in a row. Uh, the, the, the fastest uh, uh, increase in interest rates since the mid-1990s. Very, very difficult for Australian families. Petrol prices have obviously gone up significantly over the past year uh, due to the European energy crisis and then the invasion, a barbaric invasion of Ukraine uh, by the Russian president. That's already hurting Australians. But unfortunately, unfortunately, we can all see and know that perhaps, perhaps the worst is yet to come. Later this month, uh, 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 petrol prices are set, are set to rise by 22 cents a litre when the former government's excise relief comes off. And that's something I think that we have to do. We cannot uh, afford to neglect our roads, and uh, fuel excises do pay for that. Uh, so that will be an increased cost for Australian families. The RBA governor today, in raising rates, has indicated that uh, more rate rises uh, are probably set to come over the next year, that it is probably not the end of this tightening cycle. So while many Australians are already facing increased mortgage payments of $1,000 a month, uh, that will even be higher potentially over the next year. And finally, finally, uh, any electricity bills are about to skyrocket. Uh, we have not got enough reliable energy uh, in our market. And, and uh, the increase in wholesale power costs we've seen this year have gone up four or five times have not yet flown through to retail bills that will happen later this year. So in that context, you'd think you'd have this government focused almost exclusively on this living cost crisis, but instead they're distracted. They're distracted. I kind of miss, I kind of miss Mr Bill Shorten. You remember uh, Mr Shorten used to talk about the top end of town? Well, this government is one that's constantly hobnobbing with the top end of town. Last week, last week Jobs and Skills Summit here that we had here, almost everybody here was either from big business or big unions and certainly themselves had no issue with paying their mortgages, no issue with paying even skyrocketing energy bills later this year, and there was almost zero talk from the participants at that conference about the major issue that Australians are concerned about today, uh, because the government cannot talk about its cost of living plan because it's already dumped that plan it took to the Australian people less than six months ago. Less than six months ago, 
uh, Mr Anthony Albanese promised the Australian people multiple times that he would slash their electricity bills by $275. He said it time and time again that your bills would be $275 a year lower under a Labor government. And in a matter of weeks, he walked away from that promise. He has not mentioned the new prime minister has not mentioned that figure again uh, since the election, and, and it is a, so world, must be a world record uh, for a government breaking such a key promise so quickly uh, to the Australian people. Uh, the government now talks about doesn't talk about its power bill plan. If, if you're looking for relief on electricity bills, don't ask this new government. They have no plan. Uh, but now they do rest back on, and Senator Brown, in the brief moment she spoke about the government's plan, uh, rest back on their childcare plan. They rest back on their childcare plan, and Senator Brown mentioned five billion dollars. Very little do you, do, do, do she doesn't say, and very often they never say. The Labor government never says and reveals that that five billion dollars is predominantly going to very rich people in this country. Indeed, under the government's childcare plans, they are going to raise childcare subsidies for families earning up to five hundred and thirty thousand dollars a year. $530,000 a year. You'll get, if you're earning $500,000, half a million dollars a year, you're very, very lucky. You're going to even be luckier thanks to a Labor government because you're going to get more money from them. From them. The Department of Education modelled this and they showed that a family on three hundred sixty grand a year will be $11,000 a year better off. $11,000 a year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Albanese, if you're on $360,000 a year. If you're on $70,000 a year, you're only $1,700 a year better off. The 85 per cent lower benefit for those families. That is the priorities of this new government. The Labor Party are no longer the party of the working class. They are no longer the party that look after the downtrodden in this society. They are wholly and exclusively focused on the Business Council of Australia, on the large unions that get big kickbacks from big super. They are focused on those interests and those interests alone. They do not listen to and do not represent those Australians who struggle in this country and are struggling more because of this ignored cost of living crisis from this government. Senator Cox. Thank Sorry, you, no, uh, Deputy Senator President. Cox, um, are you seeking to take note of, of, of a answers. answer to a Greens question? Yes. Yes. I no. We'll get to you uh, in a moment. We have, oh, we have a, an order of service as it speaks. Uh, uh, Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy President, and I, uh, I thank Senator Patterson for his questions on. Uh, inflation and on interest rates uh, in this country, and I, I thank Senator Gallagher for her answers uh, as well. Uh, and of course, uh, on these questions, um, it must be uh, noted from the outset that the Albanese government has inherited uh, an economy from those opposite uh, with high and rising inflation. Uh, we have inherited an economy. Uh, with rising interest rates as well. Uh, and uh, on top of that, we have inherited an economy with the slowest wages growth on record. Uh, so, in short, uh, the Albanese government has come into office uh, inheriting a full blown cost of living crisis from those opposite. Uh, and one of the most important things that we need to do in the context of that crisis, uh, to help Australians get through it, to help Australians do well, uh, to help Australians survive and thrive in this environment, uh, is that we need to get wages moving in this country. Uh, and we also need to deal directly with the rising cost of living. Uh, and we are already putting plans in place to do both. We need to get wages moving so that people have the resources that they need to deal with the rising cost of living. Uh, and we have hit the ground running to do just that. Uh, right on uh, winning government, uh, we made a submission to the Fair Work Commission um, arguing for an increase in the minimum wage. Uh, and our submissions, along with the work of the Australian trade union movement, um, were successful and there was, in fact, a 5.2 per cent increase to the minimum wage. Um, we have also made submissions to the aged care work value case, um, supporting a pay rise for some of Australia's lowest paid 
workers, indeed hundreds of thousands of workers, because we are committed to the women who work in the care economy and we are committed to getting wages moving in this country. Um, just last week, we brought together 150 people from around the country uh, in our absolutely historic Jobs and Skills Summit um, to really answer the fundamental questions about the economy. How do we get wages moving? How do we improve productivity? How do we get the country moving in one direction together? Uh, and there were a number of things that were agreed about getting wages uh, moving, uh, agreed by really everyone uh, at the summit, um, except, of course, for those opposite. Uh, really everyone agrees in our country that we need to get wages moving, uh, except the opposition. Everyone agrees that the bargaining system is broken, uh, except apparently the opposition. Everyone agrees we should bring people together. We should bring unions and employers together to focus on solutions. Uh, everyone apparently except uh, the opposition and the opposition leader who refused to turn up. Um, everyone agrees that women working in the care economy are the most in need of reform to our industrial relations system. Um, apparently everyone except uh, the opposition. Uh, so we are focused on bringing people together. We are focused on the cost of living crisis. Uh, we are focused on getting wages moving to help people deal with that crisis, um, because that is, of course, half the equation of dealing with the crisis delivered by the former government, getting wages moving. And that is exactly what we have hit the ground running doing, and that is exactly what we will continue to do. The second half of the equation is direct action, of course, to relieve the rising costs of living. Uh, and we have just, of course, announced the biggest indexation of social security payments on record. Uh, and that is going to help uh, so many Australians deliver, uh, deal with the rising cost of living that has been delivered by the previous government. Uh, we have also uh, extended the paid pandemic leave uh, that was due to expire under those opposite. We've introduced legislation to drive investment in cleaner and cheaper energy to put downward pressure on power prices. Uh, we, as Senator Canavan noticed, are going to make childcare cheaper. So we are dealing with the cost of living crisis bequeathed by the previous government. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. At the outset, uh, in terms of speaking to my colleague Senator Patterson's question to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. I want to address a, a claim that was made by Senator Gallagher that potentially the Assistant Treasurer had been verbaled. And I've had the opportunity during question time by referring to my mobile phone to see that the Assistant Treasurer, in fact, on his own website, stephenjones.org.au, if people want to refer to it, said this, and I quote, because we actually, this might sound bizarre to many of your listeners, and I should say it sounds bizarre to me as a senator in this place, but if we have demand galloping ahead and galloping ahead and people just putting up prices for a limited supply of goods and services, then that is going to feed into hyperinflation, end quote. Hyperinflation, end quote. That's from Stephen Jones's own website, and we were accused well, my colleague Senator Patterson was accused of not quoting the Assistant Treasurer appropriately in terms of the context of this question. This is important. This is important. Language is, conf is, is important because it feeds into the confidence or lack thereof in the market. And using the term hyperinflation was extraordinarily irresponsible, extraordinarily irresponsible by the Assistant Treasurer. Because when people think of hyperinflation, they think of Germany where in July 1920, one mark equated to 40 US dollars, and then by November 1923, one mark equated to four, four, I should say one US dollar equated to four trillion marks. That's hyperinflation. That's hyperinflation. And it is grossly irresponsible, grossly irresponsible for the Treasurer to, Assistant Treasurer to use that term hyperinflation in the current market. We are nowhere near hyperinflation, and I don't expect we'll come anywhere near hyperinflation. The RBA certainly doesn't think so. Treasury doesn't think so. So why do we have an assistant treasurer who doesn't know such a fundamental term of economics in terms of hyperinflation? 
The textbook, the textbook definition of hyperinflation is at least inflation of 50 per cent per month. Per month. We know we're near that, but we have an assistant treasurer who doesn't know the actual definition of hyperinflation. Maybe they should keep him away from radio interviews so he doesn't scare the horses of the Australian economy so much. We also have a government, we also have a government that doesn't want to live up to the $275 power cut process. It will cut. This is from the Labor Party's own policy. The Labor Party's own policy up currently on their on their website. On their website called Powering Australia. It's still there. And this is what it says. I quote, it will cut power bills for families and businesses by $275 a year for homes by 2025 compared to today. End quote. That's what it says. The policy. It's still on the Labor Party's website. And as my colleagues in this place have referred to consistently, it has been referred to over 90 times during the course of the election campaign. That $275 cut in Australians' power prices. But when the Albanese government is formed, there's no mention of this promise, this promise to the Australian people. Absolutely no mention of it. There was ample opportunity during question time for it to be referred to. But this promise that was given during the election campaign by the Australian Labor Party on their own website, you can check it out yourselves, $275 a year cut. No mention of it, absolutely no mention of it by the Albanese government. Albanese opposition, $275 price cut. Albanese government, no mention, no mention. Still on its website, if you want to verify it, still on its website. And then we have the introduction of the Climate Change Bill 2022, an urgent bill introduced earlier today, an urgent bill, even though by the admission of their own minister it's not necessary. I, I don't, how can something be urgent if it's not necessary? It baffles me. But the Climate Change Bill 2022 it doesn't make any mention of the $275 price cut. No mention of the $275 price cut. So we introduce the Climate Change Bill, though it's not necessary, their own minister said. It then becomes urgent. And when they introduce it, one would have thought that electricity prices are connected to climate change. But no, there's no mention of the promise of $275 price cut made by the Labor government when they are in opposition. Thanks, Senator Scar. I put the question to the motion moved by Senator Chandler. Those for the question say aye, against, no, the ayes have it. Senator Cox. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Um, it's disappointing to see uh, the government. You, uh, uh, pay Senator Cox, you just moved. Did you wish to take note of the answer? Take note of the answer uh, given by Minister Farrell Please to go on. my question during question Thank time. Um, and it's disappointing, uh, but not surprising, to see the government patting themselves on the back for doing less than the bare minimum. Um, in fact, we got no answer to the actual question during question time. And in this instance, I agree with Senator Chandler. It should be called answer time instead of question time, because um, it's all smoke and mirrors, and that's what we're getting at the moment. Um, legislating 43 per cent is not enough, and opening up an expansion of new fossil fuel projects are inconsistent not only with the government's own target but also its commitments under the Paris Agreement, and this is what we heard. Science is pretty clear. Safe climate means no more fossil fuels, and they must go. So formally legislating a target should actually be 75 per cent by 2030. We need to start phasing out fossil fuels. And this includes methane. And methane, the global methane pledge was at the heart of the supplementary question that I asked. And we need to start doing that not tomorrow, not in the future, not in six months. We need to start doing that today. The climate bill was introduced earlier today. Therefore, we need that commitment. Over 100 countries signed up to that global methane pledge at COP26. Uh, everyone except Australia. That's because Australia skipped along to COP26 in Scotland, hand in hand with Santos, and, and talked about carbon capture and storage, which is completely unproven to work. So addressing methane emissions is paramount to us actually reducing our emissions, and we need a robust plan. We cannot afford to have a minister sitting across in the other house doing policy on the run in this place. So we needed sufficient investment to make sure that this occurs. And we can't go dumping carbon—and I'm calling it colonial 
carbon capitalism that we're giving and dumping it in the Timor Sea for the Timorese people to deal with after we've gone on a botched plan to think carbon capture and storage is about offsets in this country. We need to make sure that we are actually um, making this government uh, accountable for being good on climate, because they're actually not. You can't have fossil fuel donors and play both sides of the fence and then be good for the climate by expanding their projects. We actually need a robust plan to look at how we invest in the economy. The UK have done it. They've reduced their emissions by 40 per cent since 1990, and they've tripled their economy in size. Yeah, yeah. Senator Thorpe. I'd like to respond to Minister Farrell uh, when, he talks, uh, when he spoke about what they're doing around First Nations. We know that this government uh, all talk and no action when it comes to First Nations justice in this country. It's okay to, to walk around saying Black Lives Matter, but if you are not seeking free, prior and informed consent from those traditional owners whose country is about to be destroyed by Santos, then please do not say Black Lives Matter. Please do not even fly our flag when you are destroying land culture, song, dance and ignoring traditional owners when you want to talk about a voice in this country. You don't even listen to traditional owners right now. What are you waiting for? A referendum to give you what? A group of people who you're then going to deny again? We are sick of the rhetoric of this Labor government. It's been going on too long. We hear from a judge who is hearing from the Tiwi Island people who says that their rights need to be listened to. Now, I am pleading with this government to also listen to the rights of those traditional owners instead of some of the do dodgy corporations and organisations that you go to to manufacture consent. That's what Labor does. They manufacture consent. They pick a few of their buddies to sign off on dirty deals that destroy country. They are dirty deals supported by industries that donate money to you to ensure that you give them the favours that they want and need. And that does not uh, give any rights to Indigenous people or First Nations people in this country. You won't even agree to fast-tracking the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. You won't even have a reporting date on that because you're scared of the rights that it will give us to stop you destroying us and our people. We are awake up to this government. No, you're not our friends because you continue to destroy country and ignore the real people that want to have a say. I'm going to put the question as moved by Senator Cox. Those for the question say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. Are there any motions to take? Oh, sorry. Uh, petitions. I believe I'm calling the clerk. <laughs> President, a petition has been lodged as noted on the dynamic red. The terms of the petition will be incorporated in Hansard. Thank you. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Being none, I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Um, is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Call the clerk. President, no postponement notifications have been lodged, but committees have lodged extension notifications as shown at item 11 on today's order of business. Thank you. Um, I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. I am now going to proceed to the discovery of formal business. and. Um, We'll start with um, business of the Senate. 
Oh, we're debating that. Thank you. Uh, we'll start, uh, so, general business, notice of motion number 23, standing in the name of Senator Dean Smith. Senator Thank you, Smith. President. I ask that general business notice of motion numbers 23, 24 and 25 be taken together as formal motions. Is there any objection to these motions being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Smith. I move the motions. Thank you. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Dean Smith be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. So we'll now move to general business notice of motion number 26, standing in the name of Senator Faruqi. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 26 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to that being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Faruqi. Thank you, President. I move the motion. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, uh, I believe the ayes have it. And that concludes formal business. Oh, beg your pardon, Senator Askew. Your attention to the, the state of the chamber. Ah, yes, so we'll just check. I believe uh, we need to ring the bells. Uh, ring the bells for quorum, thanks. I believe we've reached quorum. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 33 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the letter from Senator McGrath proposing a matter of public importance was chosen. It is shown at item 13 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? Yes, I believe it is. Thank you. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers for today's discussions. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clocks accordingly and I call Senator Hume. Thank you very much, Madam President. And I rise to speak today on the failure of the Albanese government to have a plan that addresses the rising cost of living facing all Australians. And it is indeed a matter of great public importance. Now, before the election, before the election, the members of the government were talking a very big game around the cost of living. In fact, the leader of the opposition was unequivocal. He said, and he said this very, very straightforward. I, I'll say this very clearly: Australians will be better off. They will be better off under a Labor government, and that was backed in by the shadow treasurer, then shadow treasurer, who was equally clear. He said, under Labor, you will have a government which cares about the cost of living and has a plan to deal with it. But it has been more than three months since the election, and it's patently clear, it's patently clear that Labor has done what Labor 
always does, and that is break its promises. In fact, the Australians are no better off now, no better off now, compared to, with before, to the time before the election. The cost of living continues to skyrocket, and Labor still hasn't shown any plan to address it. Power prices are higher. Grocery bills are higher. Fuel is about to go up again in price, and the RBA has once again today raised interest rates. We feel it at the Bowser. We feel it at the grocery checkout, and we are certainly feeling it when we pay our mortgages, which suits the Assistant Treasurer just a fine, because he's out there. The Assistant Treasurer is out there predicting hyperinflation, and he's predicting more strikes as well. Further industrial reaction. Now, this is not what Australians need right now, and it's certainly not what this government promised. They need a government with a plan to get the cost of living down, to drive down prices. But Labor keeps breaking its promise on the cost of living. The most uh, resonating central tenant of Labor's election platform was to reduce power prices by $275. They said it over and over and over again. The Leader of the Opposition at the time said it, the Shadow Treasurer at the time said it, they get into government and nothing. In fact, they repeated it in the election campaign 96 times, that they would reduce power prices by $275. But suddenly, once they're elected, Everything changes. They went dead silent. You could hear nothing but crickets. Not only are power prices not going down by $275, but the Prime Minister, Mr Albanese, has not even fronted up, not once, and given an explanation to the Australian people as to why this promise, this fundamental tenant of the election campaign, this commitment to the Australian people has been broken within the first 100 days of government. Just today, the Minister for Climate Change and Energy popped his head up to, uh, just above the parapet like a meerkat and said that he stands by the modelling. But he still won't say that power prices will go down, having said it 96 times during the election campaign that power prices will go down by $275. Now the Minister for Climate Change and Energy says nothing. He says he stands by the modelling but won't stand by the fact that power prices should, would and must go down by $275 to fulfil that commitment that Labor made to the Australian people. In fact, uh, Mr Bowen, the Climate Change and Energy Minister, is using weasel words to get out of this fundamental promise. But power prices are not the only promise that this government have already broken. In fact, they've also broken their election promise on wages. The Treasurer, Mr Chalmers, said it, uh, he said it best when, before the election, as Shadow Treasurer, he said that our job is to get wages growing in a sustainable way, then get them growing strongly. And the Treasurer, now the Treasurer said he could get this job done. He was the man to get this job done. He also said before the election that there are meaningful things that we can do about wages, that we, Labor, have got a role to play in wages. The Minister for Finance, Minister Gallagher, said that wages need to keep up with the cost of living. That was before the election. Since the election, they've changed their tune. The Treasurer now admits that there is no credible economic forecaster who thinks that wages growth is going to keep up with inflation, although I guess that, uh, that's, um, uh, that's um, something that the Assistant Treasurer is uh, happy to back him in on. In fact, the Labor Party went to the election promising to increase wages, but the fact is the cost of living and increased wages have not kept up, have not kept up with the cost of living. So we know that Labor has already broken promises to reduce the cost of living, the, to reduce the cost of power and to improve wages. And these broken promises affect everyday Australians that are doing it tough with these increased costs of living. Now I've been out into the community, as have my colleagues, talking to business owners, talking to individuals, talking to families, talking to employees, 
to understand just how Labor's broken promises on the cost of living are impacting ordinary Australians. Some businesses are planning and indeed expecting an economic downturn, and they're preparing to lay off staff right now. The cost of key supplies for some businesses has increased as much as 30 per cent in a week. One business told me that they are planning to have, for people to have less expendable income as inflation increases, so therefore that they will sell less goods. And another business told me that they are absorbing the fixed costs because they're concerned that consumers will stop spending rather than wear those price increases. A business that is um, looking to how to best manage their finances so they can absorb those increased power bills and grocery costs just so that they can keep staff on. One Sydney restaurant was reported in the newspaper of offering a $5,000 sign-on bonus just to get new team members for dishwashers and managers. Another Melbourne restaurant have resorted, has resorted to recruiting staff from Dubai and covering the costs of their visas and process, processing fees at about $8,000 each. The cost of living is causing real concern to Australian people. And in fact, this week we heard that Suicide Prevention Australia uh, have reported that 40 per cent of Australians that says that, say that money issues are causing them more distress in the last year, with experts warning that it is in fact the biggest risk to suicide rates. Suicide Prevention Australia referenced that they expected the Reserve Bank rate rises, um, to, uh, saying that uh, this, this is an economic issue that has actually overtaken social issues in levels of distress. Now, it's clear that Labor's broken promises on the cost of living are impacting all Australians, but we have to also remember that the Labor Party is the party of higher taxes, or it has been or it will be, and there is a suite of new taxes on their way that the government's allies and the union movement have already proposed that will simply take more money out of your pockets. New taxes on workers, new taxes on businesses, new taxes on dividends. A retiree tax 2.0 proposed by the ACTU as part of this jobs and Skills Summit. Now, the Prime Minister made it clear that he does not support the third stage of the Coalition's personal income tax plan. In fact, that, uh, that when that stage three is implemented in 2024-25, around 95 per cent of taxpayers will face a marginal tax rate of 30 per cent or less. And it doesn't matter to the Treasurer, who said that we're not big fans of the stage three tax cuts where we think that they are the least affordable and least responsible, and yet they would put more money into people, people's pockets. Just last week, the Prime Minister said that Labor actually tried to amend out the Stage 3 tax cuts, but they weren't successful. Here's the deal. We know that Labor did not cause the war in the Ukraine that has, uh, that has fed into high energy prices. We know that they didn't cause COVID that's induced the supply chain problems that we're seeing right around the world. The things that cause inflation are not of Labor's making. However, they are this government's problem. The Australian people look to their government to help them through a crisis. Now, the previous government's challenge was COVID, and our response to that crisis resulted in the best health and economic outcomes that any country in the world achieved. This government, this Labor government, has faltered at its first hurdle, at its first challenge, and there will be more challenges that it needs to face. It's already broken promises. So far, you have stumbled. This is an opportunity now to recommit to helping ordinary Australians with the cost of living, recommit to that 275 cut in power prices that you repeated 96 times throughout the election campaign. Recommit to tax cuts for ordinary Australians so that they can keep more of their own money in their own pockets. And recommit to helping ordinary Australians with the cost of living, which is their number one issue right now in any survey. Thank you, Senator Hume. Senator Sheldon. Uh, good, thank you, uh, Deputy President. Uh, thank you, President. Sorry, apologies. Well, you know, sometimes there's that saying about you lead with your chin. On this occasion with this MPI, not only has the opposition led with their chin, they're left with their head, their shoulders, the upper part of their body. The only thing they haven't let in with is their, their toes are on the end of their feet. Because this is actually a really prime example of people who have no idea of the pressures of cost of living um, and stresses on people in, right across our community. You know, they said right, quite clearly when they talked about the cost of living, when it was really put down all that time ago when the whole decision, the cultural change that was brought about by the opposition when they were in government. And it was clearly spelt out by Matthias Cormann when he let the big one slip. The big one slip when he said, as a Liberal Finance Minister, 
Low wages growth is a deliberate design feature of our economic architecture. Now, that will live in infamy for years to come. Because, but this government is clear about making sure that the mistakes that the Conservatives made whilst in government aren't continued on. It's quite clear that we've made a very clear decision that Mr Cormann said that what he said out quite loud is actually something which isn't actually loud enough. Because actually if he had to told the whole story, what he actually I think he actually went one step need to go one step further. He needed to say that we have a design feature of actually having wage decline in this country. Because those people opposite actually the first ones in the history of this country to actually wind back the middle class in this country under their watch, under their policies, under their strategy. Even Matthias Cormann went further than he could even imagine to go, to turn around and destroy wages and conditions and rights within this country. Because wage cuts are a deliberate design feature of the coalition's economic architecture. But it's funny. I don't remember seeing the phrase low wages growth or wages cuts on any Liberal Party election material, but that's exactly what they did and that's exactly the policies they followed. Now the coalition are in the opposition, they're acting <laughs> constructively to deal with the low wages crisis they created. Heaven forbid. You'll be surprised to learn that they aren't. Are they? No, of course they aren't. We had a summit with government, employers, unions and civil society last week to work on solutions on these, to these issues. And the only people who refused to show up were the Liberal Party. Poor old Angus Taylor was doing the media rounds demanding that he receive an invite only for the Leader of the Opposition to tell him he wasn't allowed to go. But last week was a great step forward on a real solution to the Liberal wages crisis. We saw agreements between the ACTU and COSBOA even though they're threatening to have blood in the blood of Cosboa because they turned around and had the audacity to actually reach an agreement across the aisle, across the community, across business, which is in the interest of all Australians. Because they actually just want to have the war and the fight because their deliberate strategy is to decline wages, not only, not only keep them low. And of course, agreements between the ACTU and the BCA. And of course, agreements between the unions and the National Farmers Federation. All things that couldn't be achieved under this government well, on the opposite benches when they were in government. There were so many agreements at the summit, but the Liberals can't even agree whether the shadow treasurer is allowed to attend. You don't think when the government's good employers and workers come to consensus agreements that the opposition should get on board. That's what they think. They don't think we should be getting on board. They think we should be tearing them up. We need to work around and make sure that we have government, employers and unions coming together for the betterment of this country. That's the sort of Australia that people want to see. Consensus building. Changes that actually mean that their real wages increase. No policies on the opposite side for that to happen. In actual fact, a policy to make sure and policies to make sure that doesn't happen. And they've stayed on the exact same program. Now, of course. You know, seeing the attacks on the you know, business, Small Business Council, we've seen the Nationals attacking the National Farmers Federation. It makes you wonder exactly who do the coalition actually represent these days. They don't represent employers who want to do the right thing, that's for sure, because good employers are coming to the table with the government and unions and the community to work out solutions. Because they know that we need to see wages moving in the right direction again. They know that after a decade of liberal wage cuts, we need wages growth to kickstart our economy in the right direction. They know to get wages moving, we need to fix our bargaining system. We need to remove the barriers to enterprise and multi-employer bargaining. But the Liberals don't represent the interests of good employers. Their new constituency is dodgy employers like Qantas, like Alan Joyce, who only knows how to operate ripping off their workers. Qantas is a textbook case for why single enterprise bargaining is not fit for purpose. Alan Joyce's enduring legacy will be that he proved our enterprise bargaining system is broken. 
and could only be fixed through multi-employer bargaining. He figured out if you don't want to pay your workers the agreed upon rates in your enterprise agreement, you can just outsource the work. Or better yet, you set up your own shelf company to turn around and undercut your existing staff. And of course, Qantas has punted most of their workforce off Qantas Enterprise agreements and onto agreements with creatively named shell companies such as QF Cabin Crew Australia and Qantas Ground Services. These shell companies only exist to undercut the agreements that Qantas supposedly negotiated in good faith with their workforce. And on one route, you can now have flight attendants employed by five different entities, each one on a worse deal than the last. One of the few cohorts still mostly employed directly by Qantas is their pilots. But just this year, Qantas threatened their short-haul pilots with outsourcing if they didn't accept a multi-year wage freeze. And Qantas has the cheek to say, and I'll quote them directly, we never said that a no vote would mean this flying would be outsourced. They went on to say, had either pilot group not been able to provide us with the working arrangements needed, another entity within the Qantas group would have done the flying. That is just brazen. Qantas says it doesn't count as outsourcing if they set up the shell company themselves. Qantas made that exact same threat to their long-haul pilots two years ago. And on top of all the shell companies at Qantas, you've got third-party labour hire firms like Swissport moving paying workers so badly that they're underpaying the award. Now, the point's this. If Qantas workers are engaged through 20 or more different employers, single employer bargaining does not work. If Qantas can tell us tell us workers that either sign this agreement or they'll set up a new company to hire them, single employer bargaining does not work. Alan Joyce has proven that multi-employer bargaining is the only way to protect and improve wages and conditions in aviation. You'll need a multi-employer agreement that cannot be undercut by another shell company or another Swiss port. Or I can guarantee there will continue to be a race to the bottom in the aviation industry. And it isn't just aviation. The Qantas blueprint is being adopted in other industries like mining. That's why the wages crisis in this country. If the Liberal and National parties really cared all about wages and the cost of living, they would get on board with the government, unions and employers, good employers, on fixing our bargaining system. They would get on board with multi-employer bargaining. But we know they never will because as Mr Cormann slipped out, low wages growth is a deliberate policy agenda. In actual fact, wage decline is a deliberate policy agenda under the opposition's watch when they were in government. That's why the opposition opposed a pay rise for aged care workers. That's why the opposition opposed to an increase to the minimum wage. But just like on climate and just like so many issues, the Australian public, employers and workers have moved on past the coalition's internal cultural wars. We saw just last week at a road transport industry roundtable convened by Minister Burke where they had the Transport Workers Union, employer groups such as the Australian Road Transport Industry Organisation, the National Road Freighters Association and the National Road Transport Organisation, employers like Linfox, Tolls, FBT and ACFS, major clients Coles and Woolworths, truck drivers and, and uh, employee uh, owner drivers, as well as owner drivers, and even gig platforms like Uber and DoorDash, come to a settlement and a suggestion about what needs to happen in the future. That's the sort of future for Australia. Thank you, Senator. Senator Cox. Thank you. Right across Australia, everyday Australians are struggling to make ends meet in the most basic ways: rent, food, bills, and health care. Too often, the people are the most impacted by these pressures are, in fact, First Nations people. My electorate office in Perth, we have had a constituent contact us who was a victim of domestic violence. She left her abuser but could not find appropriate, safe and affordable accommodation in a timely manner. She was in fact advised that she would need to wait years for public housing, even if she was priority listed. And this in itself is extremely traumatising. Poverty is a vicious cycle and we know that once someone is experiencing poverty, it's unnecessarily hard for them to break out. 
We also know that poverty is a political choice. It is extremely bold of the opposition to suddenly come out strongly advocating for cost of living relief after 10 years of squandering opportunities by previous governments. The government of today needs a bold plan to undo the impacts of the last year, 10 years of inaction, which we unfortunately still haven't seen. So if the current government wants to prove that they are actually taking this issue seriously, axing stage three tax cuts are step number one. It is unconscionable that the government is continuing with this when we know that $243.5 billion that will benefit the most wealthy people in this country can be used to make real change for those who need it the most. In fact, the Prime Minister showed just how out of touch he was yesterday in response to my colleague uh, Max chandler Mather's question yesterday in the House, jokingly comparing the lavish housing he gets whilst being one of the highest paid officials in the world to the public housing system that has people sleeping in tanks because they can't access it. In the recent election, uh, the Greens took a comprehensive policy platform that wasn't just about one policy. And that will help to address the cost of living pressures. The Greens know that a better future is possible, and currently the only thing that's standing in the way of that is the lack of political will from this current government. Thank you. Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you. Now, the, um, the matter of public importance that we are debating today is one that's in my name, and I think it's important for those who are listening at home because there's nothing else on the wireless, to make sure that they are fully aware of, of the words of it. And it is the failure of the Albanese government to have a plan that addresses the rising cost of living facing all Australians. And the most important part about that is, is our plan, because it is pretty clear that this Labor government doesn't have a plan. It's abundantly clear that the, the Labor government they, uh, won the election uh, in May of this year, and my, my mob lost, and obviously I'm, I'm workshopping my pain about that still, but that side are in power. And what is interesting is how the new government, who have been in since May, so it's, you know, almost six months have been in power, are failing to understand that they're the government, that they have the responsibility to, to look after Australians, and they can't keep acting uh, like, like a bunch of wannabe student politicians. And, and when they go around uh, continuing to blame the previous government for everything from, from you know, their bad haircuts to, to lost socks in the washing machine, that, in fact, they're the government. They're the decision makers. And, and what is abundantly clear is that there is no plan. Uh, it, it reminds me a bit of, of that Monty Python skit in terms of, of, the, of the dead parrot, in, the, in that there is no plan. It is a, it's a dead plan. It was dead on arrival. And we've got a government who go around doing a lot of, a lot of talking. And, and they get a gold medal for, for talking. And we witnessed that in question time today, where both Senator Wong and, and Senator Watt were just in the, the hubris, the hubris, the, the arrogance, the ego, the, the, the the self-confidence, the, the, the self-congratulation sort of, I won't say orgy, but the self-congratulation sort of party that they are having in terms of how brilliant they are, but not delivering, but also they regard a series of, of press conferences as a strategy or a plan. They regard sending some tweets out as, as a plan. And, and, and the, the former British uh, Prime Minister David Cameron once famously said that, that too, too many tweets make a well. It's, it's a word that members of the CFMEU would use to um, when they're abusing females on a work site. So you can imagine what the word is. Uh, so there's no plan. There's a lot of tweets, a lot of press conferences, a lot of media releases being being issued. But for those Australian families who went off to work today. And, and we'll come home, and they'll, you know, depending on what time they, they listen to, whether the car's on the radio, um, sorry, whether the radio's on in the car, or they watch the six o'clock news, and they'll, they'll get the news that their interest rates, their mortgage has gone up another half a percent. So if you live in one of the big cities, and let's say you've got a, a mortgage of 
of around $700,000, $750,000, which is a lot of money, but it's not uncommon in the big cities in Australia to have a mortgage like that. That, that, your, that since May, since May of this year, since the election of this Labor government, that your, your monthly mortgage payments have gone up by eight, nine hundred dollars. Now, that, that is scary. That is very scary for, for the working families of Australia who are dealing with a Labor government who don't have a plan but are far more interested in playing politics, who are far more interested in media stunts, who are far more interested in having summits where people get together, where I think a quarter of the attendees at, at the summit last week were, were, were union officials or, or connected to, to the Labor Party. So, yeah, it was a very broad representative summit last week, this giant talk fest. But in terms of those Australians who, whose mortgages have now gone up today by another half a, half a per cent, what is the message from this Albanese Labor government? Well, it's arrogance, it's hubris, it's the laughing that we saw from, from the Labor ministers during question time today, the belief that, that they are invincible. And it was particularly personified by, by Senator Watt, who is, is, is the new agriculture minister. And, and Senator Watt was taking credit as the minister for the output of Australia's farmers. And, and I stand in this place as someone whose parents were cane farmers and grandparents were cane farmers and great-grandparents were cane farmers. You look at my hands, clearly they are not the hands of a farmer. And I think to myself, no politician, especially no Labor minister, should ever take credit for the work of a farmer and their family or the work of a small business person and their family because the work and the output that comes from the farm and comes from that business isn't because of some Labor politician. It's because of that, that farmer. And, and what fascinates me is how Senator Watt was taking credit for the increased output of, of Australia's farmers. He was taking credit essentially for, for the, the, the good weather that we've had recently. And I'm thinking, mate, you've got no idea about, about Queensland, a state which you claim to be a senator for, a state which some parts of it are still in drought, a state where over a 10-year period you might have one or two good years of, of, of good production, and then you'll have one or two years of average production, and then you'll have five or six years of very bad production. So if, if Labor are prepared to claim all the credit for the work that the farmers and graziers in Queensland do, well, I look forward to them standing up here when the drought comes back, which it will, and, and taking the blame for, for the hardship that, that has been uh, uh, wrecked upon and wreaked upon uh, the, the businesses and farmers of Queensland, because we've got a Labor government who actually don't understand how you address cost of living, and it's not about a series. Of, to quote one of their former leaders, um, who's now with one of my colleagues, Senator Hanson's party, you know, using the, the Great Line conga line. It's not a conga line of, of press conferences. It's sitting down and doing the real hard work of government. It's sitting down and making decisions that will benefit the Australian people. It is sitting down and making sure, and I say this as someone who believes strongly in the cutting of taxes, it is making sure that, that you continue to cut taxes. But it is making sure also that you deliver on your promises. Now, one of the most interesting promises that Labor made during, during the last campaign was they would reduce the power bills for Australians by $275. Yeah, that was a pretty, you know, a, a pretty. Oh, here we go. Um, the Chitty Chat Squad have started. Um, that they would 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 reduce Australians' uh, power bills by $275. Now, the Labor leader promised to do that 97 times during the campaign. 97 times. The Labor leader got up and he said, we will cut 
Australian power bills by $275. He didn't have a little footnote and speak in a little soft voice and say, oh, it'll be by 2025 and it'll depend on you know, what Penny Wong tells me and if I cross my fingers and brush my hair a certain way. He promised the Australian people 97 times that he would cut their power bills by $275. Now, how many times do you think that Labor, the Labor Prime Minister, the Labor government have, have mentioned that particular promise since polling day? How many times? Zero. None. Zip. Niet. Not, if you're French. They haven't mentioned it at all because they lied to the Australian people. The Labor Party lied to the Australian people. So not only do they do not have a plan to reduce the cost of living pressures on Australians, but during the election campaign they lied, and they knew they were lying. When the Labor leader says 97 times, I'm going to cut your power bill, and then since that election zero times has he recommitted to cutting people's power bills. Because, because what you see over there is arrogance. And it's the arrogance of a government who think they are invincible. It's an arrogance of a government who think they know better than the Australian people. It's the arrogance of a government who are snubbing their nose at the working, the working men and women of, of Queensland, or the farmers and the graziers, and Your shame time on that Labor Senator Party. McGrath. Senator Polly. Australians are paying the price for a decade of missed opportunities and messed up priorities by previous Liberal governments from Abbott to Turnbull to Morrison. A trillion dollar debt. Those opposite with the senator's last contribution, which was so disjointed, but trying to run away a million miles an hour from the fact that they left us with a trillion dollar debt to the Australian community. High inflation, rising interest rates and the cost of living crisis, all of the consequences of the previous Liberal government's mismanagement. Australians do understand, Madam Acting Deputy President, they understand who created these challenges and the mess because they know that the Liberals did nothing to address any of these issues until five minutes to midnight prior to the federal election. Petrol prices are up, groceries are up, rents are up, childcare has become too expensive and the price of health care is up, all under the watch of the previous Liberal governments. As a government, we understand what we inherited, but we're not going to deny making sure that the Australian people understand that that trillion dollar debt was on their watch. But we've been elected to fix it, and that's exactly what we're going to do. COVID has exposed us to the many weaknesses in our economy. And let's not confuse uh, the weaknesses by the mismanagement by the Liberal governments. But we know that they allowed manufacturing to be shipped offshore, and what we want to do is invest in manufacturing, bring those secure, well-paid jobs back here to Australia. Now, again, those opposite did nothing for the cost of living, and all they do is criticise the Albanese government. I'd just like to correct the former member. He's obviously not very good at numbers, but we've only been in government four months. It might feel like six months in opposition, but believe you me, you're going to get used to it because you're going to be there for a while. We have an economic plan. We're a government that has listened to the Australian community. They're sick of the division. They're sick of the disunity. What they want is to work together. They want the opposition and the government and business and unions to work together to resolve these issues. You can come in here and whinge all you like about how bad we are as a government, but what we really will see is a stark contrast with a government that wants to bring people together we want to listen to business, we want to listen to the unions, and we want to work together. Now, at the summit last week, what did we see? Where was Mr Dutton, Mr 22 per cent? Where was he? Nowhere to be seen, probably having a long lunch on Friday afternoon. 
where we saw the Nationals leader come along to that summit with community leaders, the NGOs, union movement, uh, premiers from each of the state and territory leaders coming along because they want to work with the federal government in finding the solutions because they understand how tough it is for families out there. Now, what we've seen uh, is a change in direction so that those pensioners, you don't have to go back to work, but if you're of pension age and you're fit and healthy and you want to go back to work to earn some money, we're going to support you to do that. We are going to support you because not only are you going to be earning additional money that will help you through this period, but you will also be mentors for those people that you work around. And that's a really good thing. It is a very good thing. Now, I've just met uh, with representatives of the TAFE uh, colleges uh, from Tasmania. And what they've said to me is that they are suffering because over the last decade, the Liberal governments have tried to run and have successfully, unfortunately, run TAFEs into the ground. And I see Senator Dunham over there smiling and laughing. Well, as a fellow Tasmanian, I'm very disappointed because it's his state Liberal colleagues that have done exactly that. The Liberals are so afraid of what we might find out that they won't even allow Labor senators to visit the TAFE campuses. That's how paranoid they are. Well, the reality is we will, as we've already committed, we will invest in TAFE. We will ensure that Australians get the opportunity to get the skills and the training that they need for the jobs of today and the jobs of tomorrow. We know that it's going to take more than just those Australians that can enter the workforce now. But we do have a plan, you, a plan Senator that you can watch us implement you, from the other Polly. side. Your time has expired. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Um, I think this is a very important debate. I've got three minutes to talk on this issue. So, you know. I'm listening to the debate that's going on here from either side. Did I hear, ha hear answers from the government then how they're going to address the cost of living? No, not whatsoever. All I hear is about complaints about what the other side did. Let me remind the people that Labor, the Prime Minister at the time, Bob Hawke, said in the 1980s, no child will be living in poverty in this country by the year 2000. No child in this country. Nearly on a, uh, a weekly basis, it is uh, that I might that I watch TV, that I see the advertisement for the Smith Foundation stating that there are a million children in Australia living in poverty. Over a million children asking for help. I don't know if this chamber or the leaders of this nation in this place really can relate to the Australian people and how much they are hurting. When I turned on the TV this morning, I saw that 40 per cent of people recognise the cost of living is the biggest issue for them. What has the Labor Party done to address this? All they've spoken about is a robo-debt Royal Commission, talking about Scott Morrison's ministry positions. They're um, you know, talking about um, the jobs summit. What was that? Really? You know, about jobs. You talk about the pensioners working. Well, I'm sorry, that was my policy. And I'm pleased to see that the Liberal Party have taken up, but that was, again, my policy. You talk about the TAFE colleges. Again, it's something I've been speaking about for years. The apprenticeship scheme was my policy in 2018 to get the apprentices working. If you actually want to address if you really want to address the cost of living in this country, then you readdress what Quiet, is the cost please, of electricity Senator. in Australia for not only the Australian homes, but you're driving up the cost of electricity for normal households, industries, manufacturing. This is going to drive increased prices. Farms have told me they can't afford electricity. This is the problem, and yet you're bringing in an emissions target that's going to drive up electricity costs. Here we have it. They've done it in England. They've done it in Europe. Guess what? It's failed. To buy a pint of beer in, in England now is $34 a pint. 
You take that away from the Australian people to be able to go to the pub with their mates and have a beer. You're destroying their whole life, and that's what it's about. You don't realise what you're doing to the Australian people and the future generations of this nation. Don't talk to me about you. Your time you has have no expired. Idea. Senator um, Askew, you have the call. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I also rise today to speak on the matter of public importance regarding the failure of the Al Albanese government to have a plan to address the rising cost of living facing Australians today, despite the government's repeated claims during the election campaign that they had a plan. And how appropriate it is that we are discussing this today, the day the Reserve Bank increased interest rates by a further 0.5 per cent, taking the cash rate to 2.35 per cent the highest level since December 2014. This rise is the fourth 0.5 per cent rise in each of the four successive months since the election, and it will, it will send even more Australians into mortgage stress. In Tasmania, where the average mortgage is around $450,000, payments could be increased by an extra $130 per month. That's $130 less money for those families every month. This interest rate rise comes on top of an inflation rate of 6.1 per cent as at June this year, which is the highest rate of inflation in almost 32 years. Coincidentally, this peak in inflation in the December 1990 quarter came at the time of the recession we had to have, according to Labor back then. And then there are the rising costs for groceries and the rising costs for electricity. Tasmania's power bills increased by 12 per cent in July, which is an extra $200 a year. The cost of living is higher now than ever, but we are still waiting to hear of the Albanese government's plan on how they will deal with this crisis. The Parliamentary Budget Office, however, has some insight for us on Labor's policies. The PBO has confirmed that the government's policies will result in higher debt and deficits than the plans the Coalition put forward ahead of the election. So not only are we in a worse position since, the Labor, since Labor took government, but we will be worse off in the future too, due to the cost of their policies. The Assistant Treasurer is predicting hyperinflation and more industrial action. We don't need predictions about doom and gloom. We need action from a government that actually has a plan to get the cost of living down for Australians. During the coalition's term, more than $1.9 million were created with over one, jobs were created, with over 1.1 million of those filled by women. Female workforce participation grew to 62.2 per cent under our watch, compared to 58.7 per cent when we took over government, and the gender pay gap reduced too. The unemployment rate dropped to 3.9 per cent, the lowest in decades, and the number of trade apprentices in training hit 220,000, which is the highest level since records began in 1963. Besides creating jobs so more people could earn their money, the coalition cut taxes. Low- and medium-income earners became eligible for a tax offset in July, something which many people have already, realised, have already realised benefits from after submitting their tax returns in recent months. And we legislated the personal income tax cuts to ensure around 95 per cent of taxpayers will not pay more than a marginal tax rate of 30 cents in the dollar in 2024-25. We also reduced the company tax rate for small businesses to 25 per cent. And remember, small businesses are what drives Australia's economy, and the people running these important operations were being taxed at 30 per cent under Labor. The Coalition introduced the unincorporated small business tax discount and lifted this rate from 5 per cent in 2015-16 to 16 per cent from 21-22. Combined, these changes will deliver more than $21 billion in tax cuts to small business from 2015-16 to 24-25, with around $2.6 billion estimated to flow through in 22-23. Not only did the coalition expand access to small business tax concessions, but we also provided tax relief and reduced red tape. And then there's the Coalition's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Over the course of the pandemic, the Coalition provided $314 billion in economic support to help Australians get to the other side of this huge economic shock. This, this support included JobKeeper, a program that saved 700,000 jobs and stopped the unemployment rate reaching 15 per cent. It was the biggest economic support program in Australia's history. So where is the Albanese government plan to address the cost of living rises that are impacting us all? There is no plan. 
The Prime Minister has already broken his election promise to reduce power prices for families and businesses by $275, but we all know our energy bills are rising and look set to keep going up. Before the election, Mr Albanese said Australians will be better off under a Labor government. I don't think the people facing a 0.5 per cent interest rate rise on their mortgage today feel they are better off. Thank you. Senator Billick. Thank you, call. Madam Acting Deputy President. I'd like to thank Senator McGrath for putting forward today's MPI because it allows us to outline the ways that Labor in our first 100 days have acted to help Australians with their cost of living and what we plan to do. This stands in bleak contrast to the former Liberal government, which ignored Australians as their costs went up, drove down wages and even delayed the release of a report on electricity, prices, uh, on ele electricity price rises for their own political gain. So let's just think about that. They had a report on electricity prices saying that the electricity prices would rise, and they deliberately did not release it for their own political benefit. Australians are paying the price of a decade of missed opportunities and messed up priorities under the coalition. Our government took office at a time of rising inflation, falling real wages, a skill shortage crisis, rising interest rates and a trillion dollars, trillion dollars in Liberal Party debt. These are the consequences of years of economic mismanagement by our predecessors. Australians actually do understand that we didn't create these challenges, but they did elect us to take responsibility for cleaning them up, and that's what we're doing. So one of the first acts of the Albanese government was to successfully argue for the minimum wage to keep pace with inflation, and this helped 2.8 million Australians. We followed that with a submission to the Fair Work Commission that unequivocally supports a wage increase for aged care workers. What did those on the other side do about aged care workers in the nine years they were there? Zilch. Not a thing. Our budget in October will include our plans for cheaper childcare and cheaper medicines, making a real difference to household budgets for millions of families. Labor will cut the maximum co-payment under the PBS from the current maximum of $42.50 to $30. This represents a saving of $12.50 or 29 per cent. The changes to the PBS will take effect from 1 January 2023 and will save Australians more than $190 million a year in out-of-pocket costs. Let me tell you about Labor's childcare plan. This means that 96 per cent of families with a child or children in care will be better off. That's 1.26 million families. Labor will lift the maximum childcare subsidy rate to 90 per cent for families for the first child in care, increase childcare subsidy rates for every family with one child in care earning less than $530,000 in household income, keep higher childcare subsidy rates for the second and additional children in care and extend the increased subsidy to outside school hours care. So on this side, we're working hard to deliver our commitment to lift the speed limit on the economy that those on the other side had implemented. We're working hard to get wages moving again with investments in cheaper and cleaner energy, advanced manufacturing skills and fee-free TAFE. In fact, the government is committed to providing 465,000 fee-free TAFE places and 45,000 new TAFE places in industries facing skill shortages, and I'm pleased to say this includes early childhood education. These fee-free places will obviously be a massive saving for those looking to reskill or improve their qualifications and helping them to increase their take-home pay. Our guiding principles as a government are about ensuring no one is left behind. More than 4.7 million Australians will receive a much-needed boost to their social security payments from this month to help ease cost of living pressures. And the Albanese Labor government has announced the largest indexation increase to payments in more than 30 years, more than 30 years for allowances and 12 years for pensions. Age pension, disability support pension and carer payment are all set to rise by $38.90 a fortnight for singles and $58.80 a fortnight for couples. 
The maximum rate of pension will increase to $1,026.50 a fortnight for singles and $773.80 for each member of a pension couple or $1,547.60 per couple, including pension supplement and energy supplement. Job seeker payment, parenting payment, ab study and rent assistance will also increase. The rate of job seeker payment for singles without children will increase by $25.70 a fortnight to $677.20, including energy supplement, while parenting payment single will Senator, increase by $35.20. has expired. Senator Stewart-John. Make no mistake, this cost of living crisis is being made far worse by the indifference of this government to those who are doing it right now the very toughest. Now, after the biggest electoral win for progressives that this nation has ever seen, you would think that the new government would work finally towards supporting folks that are struggling in our communities to get by. They certainly talk the talk. This morning in the House of Representatives, the Prime Minister said these exact words, and I'll quote him directly. A compassionate nation like ours cannot simply allow suffering of our fellow Australians to continue um, unabated. Prime Minister, you are absolutely right, which is why it is particularly galling that this government, despite talking the talk, is continuing to sacrifice the very most vulnerable, most struggling people in our community to this spiralling cost of living. Yesterday, the rates of support, uh, payments and pensions increased ever so slightly. The reality of this increase uh, is that it amounts to only a 2 per cent increase in CPI on these payments compared to an inflation rate of 7 per cent. And yet in this context, the Albanese government is asking the community to congratulate them for this increase, to celebrate it, to treat it as evidence of uh, the existence of a benevolent Labour Party policy when, in truth, this is a fiction. All they have done is index these payments to CPI. Now, people are rightly furious about this because people that struggle week by week, month by month, on the rate of these payments understand the difference between indexation and an actual increase because they live it every single day. I have to ask where the government gets the gall to attempt to advertise this as a win while so many Australians are languishing in a poverty that it, in no uncertain terms, has chosen to maintain, particularly affecting those on the disability support pension who were left behind again and again by the previous government and can expect, it seems, no better. Thank you, under Senator. Our... Your time has expired. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Yesterday, indexation increases to a range of payments were announced, including JobSeeker. Recipients will get an extra $1.80 a day from 20th September, an extra half a coffee if, if they're lucky. This lifts the daily rate from $46 to $48. Expecting people to live on $48 a day is expecting people to live in poverty. The price of food alone is soaring, with estimates suggesting it could be costing low-income households as much as 40 per cent of their take-home wage to buy a week's worth of food. This comes at a time where costs of rent are driving people to homelessness. We're having to talk about the working homeless here in Australia. In the last 12 months, the average rent on, on a unit in Canberra increased by 11 per cent. It is the most expensive city to, to rent in our country. Nationally, there are 164,000 people on the social housing wait list. 164,000. 
It is not an exaggeration to call this a housing crisis. We are in a cost of living crisis too. In the pandemic, the COVID supplement increased the rate of job seeker, and we understand now that it lifted people out of poverty. During that time, people reported improved mental health outcomes. It allowed people to eat better and keep a roof over their heads. The research now shows that four-fifths of people who were on JobSeeker were able to live above the poverty line. Everyone deserves a safe, warm place to live. Everyone deserves to eat fresh and healthy food. I hope the government will urgently, urgently consider raising the rate to at least $70 a day to help get people out of poverty. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Orman Payne. Thank you, Deputy President. Australians are facing a cost of living crisis. People are being smashed on all fronts. Rising rents and mortgage repayments, rising food prices, rising education costs, rising health costs. Neither the Labor Party nor the Liberals or Nationals are interested in turning the tide around. In fact, they're actively committed to making it worse by refusing to invest in vital services, by refusing to lift income support payments and by backing in $243 billion of tax cuts for the super wealthy. Of the $243.5 billion of Labor's Stage 3 tax cuts, $188 billion, or 77 per cent of the benefit, will go to the wealthiest 20 per cent of the population. Even worse, you're giving the richest 1 per cent as much as you are giving the bottom 65 per cent. The commitment to raw, unadulterated neoliberalism should bring shame to all of those on the Labor benches. Labor's stage three tax cuts for the super rich will turbocharge inequality in this country and effectively destroy our progressive taxation system. At a time when the share of national income going to profit is at an all-time high and the share of national income that is going to workers' wages is at an all-time low, this is both economically and morally indefensible. And you know it. You know full well that this is an indefensible policy, which is why you try to blame it on the Libs. But you know what? When you vote for it, you own it. We must do more to deliver cost of living relief to people. The Greens have proposed numerous policies that would meaningfully help people to live better lives. We've talked about freezing rent for two years and then capping rent hikes to 2 per cent every two years. It's been done in Victoria, British Columbia, New York and Germany. Let's do that here too. We've talked about making public education truly free with no fees, no public school fees, free university and TAFE, free meals for school kids. That will help people with cost of living relief. We've talked about reforming tax loopholes, reforming the petroleum resource rent tax, introducing a windfall profit tax and closing existing loopholes that let big corporations and billionaires not pay their fair share. We've talked about free childcare. Childcare is a huge portion of the household budget for many families. Free childcare means an ease in the cost of living pressures for families. It would cost around $9 billion per year, much less than the stage three tax cuts to give free childcare to all families. And we've talked about pausing the interest rate hikes, at least until the October budget. Interest rate rises are hurting both renters and new homeowners, and they are doing nothing to address supply side inflation. Labor's stage three tax cuts will turbocharge inequality. We need cost of living relief now, not more tax cuts for the wealthy. Hear, hear. Thank you, Senator. Uh, we will now move to the consideration of documents. Those documents are listed on page four of today's order of business. And I will remind the chamber that at approximately five o'clock we will go to first speeches. So um, item one, Australian National University. Any speakers? Commonwealth Grants Commission Report 2021, Migration Act 1958. 
Senator McKim. Yes, um, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I do rise to speak to uh, the Migration Act uh, 1958 um, Commonwealth, Commonwealth Ombudsman's reports, uh, numbers 20 to 22, 24 and uh, 25 of 2022, as well as the government responses to, um, to those uh, Commonwealth Ombudsman's reports. And I, I want to be very clear here in regards to uh, immigration detention that the average length, average length of time that people spend in immigration detention in Australia is uh, a human rights calamity. And when you compare us to other countries in the world, uh, we imprison people in immigration detention in this country, in some cases for many years and in a small number of cases for over a decade. We imprison people on average for far longer than comparable countries around the world, whether it be the United Kingdom, whether it be Canada, whether it be the United States. We are a global outlier in terms of how long we keep people in immigration detention, why we put them there in the first place and the way we treat them in immigration detention. And that is why the Greens have consistently argued for a royal commission into immigration detention, not just onshore but offshore, what we did to people on Nauru, what we did to people on Manus Island. And I want to say right here, there are still over 200 people in either Papua New Guinea or Nauru who've, who are in their 10th year, their 10th year of suffering. They were put there by the Labor Party in 2013 and they remain there now. After long years of Liberal government, they remain there now under a Labor government exiled in Papua New Guinea or Nauru. And I know some of those people and I'm in contact with some of those people, either directly or indirectly. And I can tell you now, some of them are doing it incredibly tough. And there is no excuse, no reasonable rationale for leaving those people in exile in Papua New Guinea or Nauru for one day longer. They should be brought to Australia and settled here, but even if the Labor Party won't do that, what the Labor Party should do is bring them here to Australia and allow them to stay here in this country until they are resettled in a third country. That would actually be in line with Labor Party policy. It is unconscionable that in the 10th year of suffering they are still suffering so much and so grievously. In onshore detention, we have stateless people who've been locked up for year after year, arbitrarily detained with no hope of ever being released, locked up in our onshore immigration detention system. We have to have a royal commission into onshore and offshore immigration detention in this country, because we need to make sure that the grievous suffering that has been endured by so many for so long, whether it be here in Australia, on Manus Island, in Port Moresby, on Nauru, that that suffering is brought to an end and that we never in this country write such a foul, dark and bloody chapter in our national story ever again. We need to hold people to account for what has happened here, for what happened in Manus Island, for what has happened on Nauru, the murders, the rapes, the child sex abuse, the deliberate dehumanisation, the deliberate imposition of suffering in an attempt to make people's life so bad that they fled back to the persecution that they fled from in the first place. We need to make sure that never happens again in this country. We need to make sure people are held to account for what happened. And the way we can do that is through a royal commission so we can get the truth out 
about what happened and make the improvements that need to be made so that we can regain our human rights credibility. Thank you, Senator. Senator McKim, are you seeking leave to continue your remarks? Thank you, President. I do seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you. Are there any further speakers on item three? Item four? Any speakers? Senator Still, John? Yes. I'm just seeking, I think, on a, I think it's item four, to take note of the uh, of document number five, the Economic References no, Committee. No, we're on to number four, Treaty Joint Initiatives on Service no. Domestic no. Regulations. Oh, it was a bit early, sorry. No further speakers. Then we shall move on to the tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses. Senator Scar. Uh, Madam President, uh, I rise to take note of the Economics Legislation Committee report, Treasury Laws Amendment, Electric Car Discount Bill 2022, and seek leave to continue my remarks. Mr. Premature, I need to table said report first. Ah. On behalf of the chair, sorry, once I've got the call. Yes, you have the call, Senator. Thank you. On behalf of the chair of the Economics Legislation Committee, Senator Walsh. I present the report of the Committee on the Provision of the Treasury Laws Amendment Electric Car Discount Bill 2022, together with accompanying documents. So they have been tabled. Senator Scar, you are now seeking leave preempted. Okay. Um, right, Senator Canavan. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the uh, Senate Economics Committee on the Electric Car Discount Bill. Um, uh, look, I, I uh, would like to commend the uh, committee uh, for Sorry, this. Sorry, Senator. Sorry, yes. uh, I've just been advised that you need to seek okay. leave. Could I seek, um, so could I seek leave to take note of the? Is leave granted? We need to take leave. I don't think we need to take leave. I'm not allowed to take this. Is Uh, advice that this is part of the selection of bills report, and you don't normally speak on it at this time. You wait till the bill comes before the chamber. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Thank you. On behalf of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works, I present the 85th annual report of the committee. Report's been tabled. Senator Scar. On behalf of the Legal and Constitutional Affairs References Committee, of which I'm the chair, I present additional information received by the committee on its inquiry into the application of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in Australia. Are you seeking leave to continue your remarks? No. So, do Senator Still John. I, I would like to uh, take note of the Economic References Committee report, Australia's sovereign naval shipbuilding capability, and uh, seek leave to continue on my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you all. Any further speakers? No. Are there any ministerial statements? I just uh, yes, thank you. Uh, just checking that no one wants to speak to the committee reports presented um, out of sittings, items six and seven on the back of the order of business today. That's the Environment and Communication and Legislation Committee report. Or the no, no further speakers. Then are there any? Ministerial statements? No. Committee membership? Uh, I seek leave to move a motion to appoint senators to committees. The president has received letters nominating senators to be members of committees. You're, uh, you're seeking leave for that motion. Uh, is leave granted? Leave's granted. Senators be appointed to committees as set out 
in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic red. Uh, Senator Walters? Yes. Can I just seek clarity on which committee is being referred to? Because we have a, a, a related motion that we would, uh, would be seeking to move and make some contributions to, but we'd obviously rather not get in the way of first speeches. I'm oh, sorry. I sent to orders. It's for both committees of the Intelligence and Security. I understand you have a motion. Would you like to move that now? Amendment? Uh, yes. Well, we, we are willing to, unless the uh, government would like to delay this until after first speech. It's up, up to you, just as a as a gracious thing. But you want to. Um well, we. We do have, just waiting for some clarity, we we'll delay it to after the first speeches. So I'm in the hands of the government. Uh, Senator Waters, uh, you should move your motion. Okay, all right. Well, um, as per the motion that's been circulated in the chamber, I move to amend. Uh, the motion that the uh, government senator has put relating to membership of the um, joint committee uh, PJCIS, and the motion has been circulated, um, and this pertains. And, and I'm now seeking to speak to that motion, um, assuming that I now have that right to continue on to do that, Deb Prez. Uh, how, we've got. Two minutes. Less yes. Than well, two this minutes. is why I suggested that we delay it until after the first speech is. So I'm, I'm seeking some guidance from the chamber. So uh, you did if, actually if, off, yeah, um, offer that courtesy, Senator Waters. Acting Deputy President, uh, and if I indicate to Senator Waters that perhaps the, the best way to proceed was if I could get an indication uh, that uh, Senator Waters would speak for five minutes prior to pr prior to the. I'm just trying to arrange the speaking times. And that, and that you be afforded uh, speaking prior to the upcoming first speech, and then we'll continue with speeches in relation to that after the first speech. Yes, thank you. I might just, for the chamber's benefit, note that I imagine a number of other folk will also want to speak to my motion, so it may well be needed to do it after the first speeches. I'm once again offering that for, for everybody's. Uh, I, look, I'm, I'm guided by the chamber, but I think, um, in the light of the fact that we have the two senators ready, that we should um, we should proceed to the first speeches, and we'll just change over the chair with uh, the president. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Senator Waters, for your indulgence. Pursuant to order, I now call Senator Tyrrell to make her first speech and ask senators that the usual courtesies be extended to her. I call Senator Tyrrell. Yeah. Thanks, President. I appreciate it. What if I appreciate it? I'll get on with it. Look, this is the strangest experience, being a senator, calling myself one even. Feels like I'm a kid playing dress-ups, like there's been a mistake. Any minute now, someone's going to come grab me and tell me I actually lost. I didn't grow up writing and rewriting my first speech in my head. I grew up hanging out with my nana French, women at Guns Plains or Spellman's Bridge, wearing knitted clothes and going for a barbecue and collecting firewood for winter. I was an average student. I struggled with maths and, truthfully, I still struggle with it. Um, in high school, I was the chubby, geeky, weird kid. Um, I liked hanging out in the library, going through books about the world outside of Tassie. After school, I fell into the trap of bad perms, short skirts and high heels. Go on, you know you're did. <laughs> I worked on a farm, going out to the paddock, collecting the hay bales and throwing them onto a truck. It's not glamorous work, but a girl needs money. And that Garfield Orange XD Falcon with a column gear shift wasn't going to pay for itself. Two grand. Buy one now for two grand. It's a collector's item. Mum passed away 23 years ago. 
too young, but all she wanted was time with the people she loved. She knew what it meant to struggle, and I think we all do too. I hear politicians talk about it. The words that get used always sound foreign to me. Phrases like putting bread on the table. You don't work just so you can put bread on the table. You work because it gives you something else. And I'll tell you how I know that. I didn't go to university. I worked in paddocks, like I've said numerous times, in factories and offices. I've raised a family. They would judge me harshly sometimes, but that's okay. I've been unemployed in between. I worked for 15 years in the employment services, helping long-term unemployed back into work. And this is what I saw. When you first lose your job, people will ask you, what do you do for a living? And you say your old job, like you're still doing it. It's just out of habit. At least when it starts, it's a habit. Then you're out of the job a little longer and it's out of convenience. It's a white lie but it's simpler, because it's what you'll be doing again in no time at all. Then a bit of time passes and you realise maybe you won't be. You start to say you're between jobs, which is like saying you're adrift but land is in sight. You say it to reassure the person you're saying it to, but then a little while passes and you're still saying you're between jobs. You end up saying it a few too many times to the same few people. You keep telling them that land is in sight, but you never make it there. And it gets embarrassing. So they stop asking. And you know why they're not asking you anymore? You ask a kid what a dad does, and they'll tell you what his job is. Tasmania has places where people grow up watching their parents be unemployed, and it breaks my heart. I've seen bright, funny, confident people get broken by a long stint out of work. They get humiliated by it. It's like coming last in a beauty contest every single day. And it's a kind of trauma. It's bloody hard to come back from. Decent people deserve decent work for decent pay. And that's what I care about. And when you're out of work, you deserve help to get back on your feet. You deserve a lift up and respect for the strength it takes to lift yourself up off the floor. If you can't work, we should be working for you to make your life better. Well, Jackie and I, we come from the same place. I started working for her in Bernie's, in her Bernie office about eight years ago. I was terrified, cacking my dax. <laughs> Two weeks in and I'm walking into a brand spanking new senator and you've all met her. <laughs> um, I didn't want to show how terrified I really was. The first thing she heard me say when I walked through her door was, honey, I'm home. And you know what? I don't think I've really stopped that ever since. Her huffing and puffing up the hallway every morning is my wake up call. Working in a political office, you spend a lot of time helping people make sense of the rules. Um, one thing that the job helped me appreciate is that these rules are made by people. You guys, me, into the future. It seems obvious to say, but when you're a member of the public and you're bumping up against them, you get told that's just the rules and that's the end of the conversation. And when I started, that was my approach too. But when you do the job for a while, you learn the rules. Enough to know when you can work around them. Sometimes you have to. Sometimes the rules are bloody dumb. Rules are set by people. They're not handed down from on high. And if they don't work for people, people can change them. We can right here if we want to. The other thing I saw working with Jackie was just how rough it can be on the crossbench. Don't get me wrong, it's quite comfy over here at the moment. People are passionate about issues, but they're passionate on both sides, for and against. And that passion can be horrible when you're caught in the middle of it. Please don't be horrible to us here in the crossbench. When the crossbench is in the balance of power, it's because the parliament can't agree to anything. That's okay. That's normal. That's what we use politics for. But it gets ugly when we don't just deserve uh, apologies, but it gets ugly when we don't just disagree, but we take it further. 
Half the country, represented by half the parliament, thinks the other half isn't just wrong but bad. I've never heard someone put their hand up to run for politics because of their burning ambition to make Australia a worse place to be. Everyone is here because they've got an idea of what would make our country better. Those ideas clash with each other, and that's all right. We have to start by agreeing that the person who holds the idea you disagree with isn't a bad person for not agreeing with you. I've never met a person who thinks their own views are immoral. Not one. Everyone thinks their views are the right ones, and the immoral ones are the people who disagree. That's a really toxic way to approach political debates. People who disagree aren't bad. They're not evil or less than human. They have a different way of what a good country looks like, but that doesn't mean they're the devil incarnate. I want to disagree nicer. With that in mind, I want to offer my respect and admiration for the person whose seat in this place I'm now perched. Former Senator Erica Betts had a vision for what would make Tasmania an even better place to live. And for nearly three decades, he committed himself to making that vision a reality. It's not my vision, though. And I don't share his politics. I think he was wrong about what Tasmania needs. But he had an honestly held view that what he was fighting for was what's right for our state. And I admire him for that. It's what I want to do. I'm just going to do it a little bit differently. My friends are a lot like me. They're very plain and simple. They're not classy, but they're not nasty. And you'll never be left wondering what they're thinking. I like people who are straight with me, and that's how I always try to be with them too. Most people are like that. Politicians don't seem to have the same reputation. And I'm sorry about that. I really am. I campaigned on the idea that we want more regular people in politics. I still reckon we do. But we can't say what we want. No, I can't. But we can't say we want it. Words. Then get grumpy when we get it. That's the thing about normal people. They do normal people things. They laugh at inappropriate jokes. Just FYI, I can't tell a joke because I can never remember the punchline. They wear fat pants on the weekend. I've got a few pairs. They'll try to say something clever and end up with their foot in their mouth. They get nervous talking to big crowds. Uh, they get self-conscious when there's a camera in their face. Yeah, that's you. Um, they doubt themselves. Normal people change their minds about things. It's one of the things I like about Jackie. She's not the Jackie she was when she was elected for the first time because she's not been afraid to um, learn. I want to learn and I want to change my mind. That's who I am. I change my mind about things all the time. Be quiet, Tim. The reason I'm here is because I changed my mind about whether I wanted to be a politician. And I like that about myself. I like being modest enough to say I've learned more and I was wrong. I don't want this job to change me. I don't want the normal to get drained out of me. But politics is the only place where if you change your mind, you're punished. You're a flipper flopper. You can't be trusted. I'm telling you now, I will get things wrong. I will make calls on how I vote, then I'll live to regret. I know that. I'm just hoping that I'm always open to learning how I got things wrong. And I'm hoping I won't be afraid to acknowledge it. Or even if I am a little afraid, I do it anyway. But everyone from out on the streets to up in the press gallery, you've got to be prepared to cut us some slack. Politicians won't acknowledge they've got something wrong or acknowledge that they've changed their minds if you go after them. If you want politics to change, you've got a role to play too. If you've ever criticised a politician for flip-flopping or reversing their position on something or looking like a dork, I do that a lot, or feeling nervous about a media appearance, wait for it, that's happening soon. Um, you're making it impossible for regular people to get involved in politics because you're marking them down for doing something regular people do. I don't want to start acting like a politician. Please don't try and make me. 
Um, I don't want to lose that part of me that gets awed by the building every time I walk through the marble hall. It's an amazing place to be. I want to show people that regular people can be good at this. I want people like me to look at, at me here and say, if she can do it, so can I. Because you can and you should. I know the office of a centre is a rental. It's a six-year lease. And if you're a good tenant, your landlord might give you an extension. Um, but it's never yours. It's always theirs. And if you forget that, they'll remind you. I'm hoping I can look back years from now when people ask me what it was like to be a senator and I'm able to say good things. I hope people feel like they got value. Most of all, I want it to be something that's a source of pride for people, the ones who bent their backs to put me here. I want them to feel like they backed me to do good and it paid off. I did good. I don't want to seek out the limelight. I want to be able to give the limelight to the rest of us. I want to make it hard for the rest of Australia to ignore us. I want it to be impossible to focus anywhere else. When they swear you in as a senator, they give you a little pin to wear instead of tags everyone else has to wear. It's a little bit bougie. Uh, it's a way of saying, look at you. Oh, it's also to help the security guards know that you're somebody that needs to get somewhere in a hurry. They gave me a few. I guess they knew I'd lose them. Um, <laughs> So I'm sorry if this is going to get me into trouble, but I gave them to a few people who helped make it possible for me to be here. But they didn't give me enough pins to give to everyone who got me here today. So I want to give a shout out to Sally. She volunteered during the election for two weeks straight. She was getting the bus for an hour to come and help us out. She's a cleaner. She doesn't make a lot of money. But she was baking me ants at Bickey's at pre in Lonnie. And Sally is the best kind of person. Then there's Franny. She's a pensioner who survived domestic violence. She can't get in to see doctors and she can't afford basics that others might take for granted. She was there helping me out on pre-polls and would bring Jackie and me banana cake and coffee with Kalora ice icing, wasn't it? That was good. And Ron was our soup man. He's a postie. He kept us warm with homemade soup and he got extra brownie points for not forgetting the bread. Ron crashed his car on election night, totaled it, um, but he still managed to make it to our event, and that's how keen he was to help. And there's Brendan. Brendan spent six hours a day, every day for two weeks, helping us out on pre-poll. Brendan's got a disability, so he's not eligible to vote. Um, but he wants to be involved. He didn't want to be ignored, and I'm so proud he turned up for us. Wendy is one of our biggest supporters. She's the one you turn to when you need help with anything. She waved signs, dropped pamphlets in letterboxes, knocked on doors of total strangers to talk about us, and handed out flyers on election day. She's doing all of this while she's ra raising children on the autism spectrum and trying to find long-term housing. Catherine, who made us a brilliant umbrella billboard. Bruce, who kept us a steady dose of Tim Tams. And there's Robert, who helped us more with signs than any small business owner has time to do. And Daryl, who's put his hand up to do everything, as long as there's no computer involved. No computers. I'd also like to give a shout out to my patient and supportive family who backed me, stood up for me and gave me a healthy dose of reality, sometimes telling me to suck it up, buttercup, eat that concrete and to build a bridge. My baby bears, Liam and Jackson, who have one of the loopiest mamas on the northwest coast of Tassie. Re, my stunt double. Thank you, you got me lots of votes there. And Tai Tai and Kens. Thank you so much for going out and pre-poll. Brother Gary, Dad and Valma, thanks for giving me permission to disappear from your lives for at least the next six years. And Tim A. I'm sorry. Thanks for putting up with me. My bad temper days, uh, my car car days, and basically helped me to look like a normal person on a daily basis. And let me buy a new puppy. I've already bought it. My work family, old, current, and new. 
You are legendary. You have given me the best advice along the way, and trust me, most of it stuck. Um, you have also shown that brilliant and clever people want to work um, for want to work to mould politics, but not necessarily for a major party. You chose us, and I'll be eternally grateful for that for a very long time. And I'm hoping we can do some amazing things into the future. Yes, and I'm going for the tissue right now. Okay. As you can see, thanks, Senator Lambie. Appreciate that, girlfriend. I didn't get here on my own. I didn't get here because of Jackie. We got here together, and I love her to bits because we're a team. Jackie, me, Catherine, Sally, Brendan, Ron, Wendy, Daryl, and Fran, and you lot. We're a team. We didn't get union money. We don't get invited to business forums. I don't know why, Jack. Why is that? We don't have billionaires cutting us checks. We have our team, and we have the rest of us. And the rest of us are tired. We are always told there's no room in the budget to help us out. We've got to fund something else to make up some money, and we'll use that money to help us out. So we wait. We're polite. And we're at the back of the queue, and we're watching the queues get longer, and we're not getting any closer to the front. We're never the next cab of the rank. We just wait, and we're sick of waiting. So we're cutting the queue. We're next. <clears throat> my friends, they're next. And in my six years, I want to make Sally's life better, Wendy's life better, and Brendan's life better. They deserve better. They're why I'm here. That's what I promise, to stick up for them, to stick up for us, for the rest of us. I can't promise I'll get everything you need, but I'll promise I'll give you everything I've got. Thank you so much for letting me be here and support me. Six years. Yeah. Happy days. Uh -uh.
Senators, we're about to begin the um, next first speech. Please either leave the chamber or resume your seats. Pursuant to order, I now call Senator Payman to make her first speech and ask senators that the usual courtesies be extended to her. I call Senator Payman. Thank you, President. I rise to present my first speech, finally. <laughs> I begin by the universal Islamic greeting of Assalamu alaikum, which translates to may peace be upon you all. I acknowledge the Nanual and Nambri elders and knowledge holders who have paved the way for those here now, those following proudly in their footsteps, and those yet to come as custodians and owners of country. I would also like to acknowledge Wajak country as my home base where I live, uh, care for and maintain continuing reciprocal relationships with all who share this land. Sovereignty has never been ceded. It always was and always will be Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander lands. I recognise the resilience and strength of all First Nations people of Australia and appreciate their knowledge sharing and stories that influence the life of many new Australians like me. It is time to recognise the constitutionally enshrined voice to parliament as a significant and practical reform to get long overdue outcomes for the First Nations people. I am so proud to be part of a government, an Albanese Labor government, who will implement the Uluru Statement from the Heart, emphasising our support for voice, for truth and for treaty. I congratulate you, President, on your election as the second female president of the Senate and the first Labor woman to hold your position. Your incredible sense of justice and fairness will make you perfect for the role. I wish you very, every success. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank my late father, Abdul Wakil, whose selfless sacrifices will never be forgotten and whose advice is about hard work, perseverance and integrity I will hold on to as pearls of wisdom. To my mother, Shagufa, Your unconditional love has given me the strength to get through my toughest moments. Thank you for always supporting me and trusting my ambitious journey. To my three amazing siblings, thank you for making life that extra bit bearable. Hurush, you have made me so proud of all your achievements as a mother, as a wife, a makeup artist and soon to be pharmacist. Salman, I love your sense of humor and enjoy our spontaneous kitchen counter philosophical discussions. Sina, who's preparing like so many young Australians to sit the final year 12 exams, your wisdom is beyond your years and I know you have a bright future ahead of you. I wish Sina and all the year 12 students out there sitting their final exams the best of luck. No such thing as a first speech without dedicating a section to my incredible mentors and support network. I would not be here without you. The WA Labor Party office team, former State Secretary Tim Picton and current State Secretary Ellie Whitaker, thank you all for your efforts in supporting my campaign. Jacob Stokes, congratulations on running the best Senate campaign Australia has ever seen with a great deal of strategic direction and management. Thank you for putting up with my highs and lows on the campaign trail. Dom Rose, I know you couldn't be with us today, but thank you for being an older brother that saw potential behind my crazy ideas and supported me through my breakdowns. And of course, introduced me to the Dockers. Carolyn Smith, thank you for your generosity, guidance and goodwill. The Honourable Pierre Yang MLC, thank you for giving me the opportunity to prove myself and for taking me under your wing of guidance on this political journey. 
Terry Healy, MLA, thank you for the contagious energy and interest you brought to my campaign, always full of amazing ideas and inspiration. Janine Freeman, thank you for the long chats and providing me a platform to speak my mind. I want to extend my appreciation to every federal WA Labor colleague who supported my campaign and encouraged me to keep striving. I wish I had time to name you all. I'm also grateful to my dear friends and my state Labor colleagues present here in the gallery who travelled from WA and across the country to be with me today. I am thrilled to have a wonderful team in Lena He, Alex Teleni and Rose Lockhart who have helped me adjust to this new role and I look forward to the awesome things we will achieve together as a team in the years to come. A final thank you to my beautiful home state of Western Australia for putting your trust in me and the Labor government. We will work hard for you and with you every day. President and fellow senators, I stand before you tonight as a young woman, as a West Australian, as a Muslim devout to her faith, proud of her heritage and grateful to this beautiful country. It is a country that offers so, so much to so many. People travel from all parts of the world in the hopes of calling Australia home. My family and I also had that same hope. On a cold winter evening, 8,852 kilometres away from Perth, I was born in Kabul, Afghanistan in 1995 as the first child to a young couple thrilled at the prospect of what the future held for their little bundle of joy. That excitement did not last longer than a year, followed by the collapse of Afghanistan in the hands of the Taliban. With no hope in sight, my parents had to make the tough decision of fleeing to Pakistan with my newborn sister and I. Resettling was difficult, but not as difficult as what my mother was about to urge my father to consider to migrate to Australia. In 1999, my late father risked his life and left his family behind to traverse the Indian Ocean for 11 days and 11 nights on a small boat and stormy weather in the hope of finding safety and security for his wife, two daughters and a son on his way. Anxiety and waves of doubt flooded my mother's thoughts as she waited and waited for any news of my father arriving safely in Australia. Four months later, we finally received the good news. And from there on, for, for four years, my father worked around the clock as a kitchen hand, a security guard, a taxi driver, while learning English as a second language and saving up enough money to sponsor my mother, my two siblings and I. In 2003, we were finally reunited with my father and settled in the northern suburbs of Perth to begin our new life together. As we adjusted and adapted, I witnessed the struggles my parents went through to put food on the table, to pay for our education and to provide a roof of our heads. Like many hardworking Australians, this came as second nature to my parents, who just wanted the best future for their children. From discrimination and abuse to job insecurity and low wages, my father endured those hardships without complaining or seeking compensation. And when my youngest brother started kindergarten, that's when my mother embarked on a journey to start her own small business, a driving school to empower other women. <coughs> Despite the unfamiliarity of the venture, my mother strived to alleviate the financial burden on my father to make ends meet. You see, my parents always encouraged us, encouraged my siblings and I to aspire for greatness, to study hard, get a secure job and be a respectable member of society, to always stay true to your roots and stay humble, to praise God and be grateful to his bounties, to be generous with our wealth and time towards those who are less fortunate. However, life took a bitter turn 
when my father was diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia in 2017. He went through 11 months of intense chemotherapy, bone marrow transplant and endless cycles of medications, but his health continued depleting. My once fit, independent and healthy father became frail, weak and required assistance to move around. Despite this, my father was still the strongest man I have ever known. Losing him at the age of 47 was the most difficult reality of life had to face. He may have passed on, but his memories and teachings will forever remain. Like, little drops make a mighty ocean, or there is no substitute for hard work, or learn good manners from those who don't have them, <laughs> or seek knowledge from, from the cradle to the grave. Life is short and very unpredictable, so we cannot even take a moment for granted. I have realised that in order to live a productive and impactful life and contribute towards my father's legacy, I must seize every opportunity that comes my way. Carpe diem. Easier said than done, though. Life has its own way of throwing figurative punches. The onus is on us to see every challenge as an opportunity, as a chance to grow, as a lesson to learn, and as a part of life. When my attempts to study medicine were not successful, I took my late father's advice to pursue pharmacy, with the perception that the medical field was the only way to serve humanity. Cruising in my own world of endeavours, I stumbled upon my first experience of being made to feel like the other. At a university tutorial, when a young man ridiculed my hijab. You see, I never felt different growing up. Perth felt like home from the get-go, because home is where the heart is, and my heart was with my family. So I didn't feel different or strange. I felt like any other Aussie kid growing up in the northern suburbs of Perth, catching public transport to university and hoping to become a productive member of society. But comments like, go back to where you came from, or inferences to extremism forced me to feel like I didn't belong. So I started volunteering in the hopes that being part of the change, if I was seen to be spreading goodness in society, perhaps then I will be accepted as an equal member of this nation. I joined the Edmund Rice Centre and became involved in youth leadership <coughs> through the guidance of Joe Moniotis. I joined the WA Police Muslim Community Advisory Group as the youth representative. I served as the president of University of Western Australia's Muslim Students Association for two years and worked hard to have an active presence on university grounds to break down those barriers of the unknown. Through my community work, I met the Honourable Pierre Yang MLC, Upper House Member for North Metropolitan Region and WA. That is when my journey in the Labor Party began. I finally found a space where I, was, I felt seen, appreciated, and like I belonged. I made friends with people who shared the same core values. I remember my father always encouraging me to vote Labor, not because he was very well versed in Australian politics, but he had a firm belief that Labor cared for the working class people and ensured the well-being of everyone on the economic spectrum. It was Labor who established Medicare so that people like my father had access to the best treatments and medication without the financial burden being on the families to bear. It was Labor who abolished the white Australia policy to acknowledge, respect and celebrate the diversity of our growing multicultural society so families like mine don't feel ostracised. It was Labor who pioneered superannuation and fought for workers' rights, ensuring everyone was afforded a fair day's pay so hard-working Australians like my father weren't taken advantage of. And it is Labor who advocates strongly for education of all levels to be accessible to each and every Australian, 
to have the same opportunities to start life on the front foot. It was a proud moment when I finally joined the Labor Party as a member. And from there on, my experience as a union organiser at the United Workers Union solidified my Labor values and motivated me to spend every day fighting for fairness, justice and equality. I realised that my father was not alone in receiving poor treatment at work, so I strive to give the voiceless a platform to share their concerns and help to shape the policy that impacted their lives. Thousands of vulnerable workers in industries ranging from aged care, disability care and early childhood education to enrolled nurses and paramedics to hospitality workers are all being underpaid, overworked and find themselves in very poor working conditions with little to no annual or sick leave. I knew they deserved better and I wanted to be part of fighting the good fight for them. After years of volunteering and dedicating myself to the movement, I finally felt my calling. This was going to be my way of serving, the, serving humanity in my own community. In 2021, I was asked to run for the Senate, and after many conversations with my former boss, Dom Rose, and the United Workers Union Secretary, Carolyn Smith, I decided to go for it. I wanted to be a representative for all Western Australians, including First Nations people and our cultural minority groups who remain unrecognised for their contributions. We need our ideas and concerns to be considered. We needed a government that cared and listened. We needed a Labor government to restore that justice and clean up the mess created by almost a decade of poor decisions and policies from the previous government. So as a daughter of a refugee who came to this land with dreams of a safe and better future, I gave myself that audacity to challenge the system and to see how far I would go, to see how much ground I could break, to see how much change I could initiate. I knew it wouldn't, it wouldn't be an easy fight winning the third Senate, Labor Senate spot in WA. 1984 was the last time it was ours but I gave it my best shot anyway and worked hard on electing an Albanese Labor government. Only when the numbers started creeping in and the seat was in contention that I felt the responsibility weighing on my shoulders. I'm honoured to have been elected as a Senator for Western Australia. And here we are today as I give my first speech celebrating 108 days since the election of a new Labor government, focusing on a better future for all. Australians elected representatives focused on tackling the spiralling cost of living and we will make healthcare, childcare and housing more affordable. Australians showed us their appetite for a parliament that reflects our society because you can't be what you can't see. Australians chose a government that values integrity, transparency, equality and fairness for all. I am proud to say that the 47th Parliament, under the leadership of our Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, will focus on closing that gap, bringing the nation together and ending the politics of division. What a proud moment for Australia. What a proud moment to put hand on heart and call oneself Australian. This Parliament is finally starting to reflect the nation envisaged by the current leader of the Senate, Senator Wong, in her first speech. And I quote, I seek a nation that is truly one nation, one in which all Australians can share regardless of race or gender or other attribute and regardless of where they live or where difference is not a basis for exclusion, end quote. I am small in stature, but my potential is limited only by how far my determination will take me. I'm here to see what matters to ordinary Australians is what matters to our politicians. As a Labor Senator for WA, I want to continue standing up for my beautiful home state as your voice and representative in Canberra, and I promise to never take you for granted. I want to work towards better representation in our federal and state parliaments by engaging with women, people of colour, faith, and all walks of life 
to take up the opportunity because if I could make it, so can you. I want to ensure that young people are acknowledged and considered when decisions about their futures are being made. Inspired by James Charlton's book, Nothing About Us, Without Us, will be a slogan that I will embrace when advocating for accessible housing, education and employment opportunities for Australian youth. I want to eradicate stigmas around mental health and make it more accessible to receive professional help. As someone who suffered from grief, anxiety and depression after my father's passing, I appreciate the importance of maintaining my emotional and mental state. I do not know what it will take to end homelessness, but I want it gone. In a progressive first world country, we must aim to remove poverty and homelessness from our streets and ensure everyone has access to basic human needs. I want to see people in jobs with dignity, having quality time to spend with their families, being able to give their children a good education and be respected members and citizens of a country that appreciates their contributions and respects their uniqueness. I want to give this opportunity my best shot by staying hungry and humble, because not many 27-year-olds can say that they have the honour and privilege of serving our nation as a senator. It is so important to acknowledge that privilege, because only then will we appreciate our purpose, responsibilities and duties to the people who elected us here, to this parliament, hoping for a better future. Hope is an amazing thing. Hope can help you endure work in a foreign land with a foreign language so that you can save up enough money to sponsor your family. Hope can make you work multiple jobs and endless hours, all with a smile, knowing that you are building a better life for your kids. There are many immigrants who turn to this great country of ours in hope of finding a better place to call home, to raise a family, to start a life. They bring with them their talents and skills and phenomenal work ethics and their families in hope for a better tomorrow. They add to our diversity, to our society, to our culture and to our cuisine and, of course, to our economy. Whilst at times, and even in this very chamber, xenophobia has raised its ugly head, fear-mongering and divisive sentiments have been shared about our immigrant population. But the simple truth remains that as a nation, we need a humanistic and optimistic approach. A policy which will help solve many of our skill shortages and grow our economy and strengthen our diversity and link to the world. I am a, I am a proud daughter of an immigrant and there are millions more like me. In fact, this great nation of ours was built on immigration. The service of my ancestors, the Afghan Cameleers, allowed us to navigate the plains of this land. They were pioneers, and I too will be a pioneer and walk in their footsteps to serve our nation as they did. As a nation, we have the potential, we have the drive, and we definitely have the appetite to support, grow, and nurture the future leaders to come. So let us quit the bigotry racism and discrimination. Australia is way beyond that. Let us not settle on multiculturalism being just a brand we associate with or take pride in as a nation, but rather fully embrace it by caring for one another, by accepting each other for who we are and what we can become, and by ensuring all voices are heard at the table. It is time to love, care and respect one another. It is time to unite, not break away and divide. It is time to use our diversity as our strength and seek wisdom in our differences. Because we all know beneath it all, we all belong to the human race. I'll finish by sharing the poem by Saadi Sherazi called Bani Adam, which translates to Children of Adam, a truly timeless piece that my late father would always recite to me in diary. Bani Adam az hai yak digaran ke dar afarinish se yak gauharan 
چو عضوی به درد آورد روزگار دیگر عضوها را نماند قرار تو که از مینت دیگران به غمی نشاید که نامت نهند آدمی which translates to human beings are members of a whole in creation of one essence and soul if one member is afflicted with pain other members uneasy will remain if you have no sympathy for human pain the name of human you cannot retain i thank the senate
All right, we'll be returning to the order of business now. If I can ask senators to take their seats or move through the chamber quietly, I call the clerk. Uh, order the day: resumption of debate on the motion to appoint members to committees and on the amendment moved by Senator Waters. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Acting uh, Deputy President. So I uh, move the motion which amends the government's motion to appoint senators to the PJCIS in the terms circulated in the chamber. The Greens are calling for these nominations to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security to not be approved because the current proposal fails to comply with the requirements of Schedule 1 of the Intelligence Services Act 2001. Nominations should not be considered or finalised until after the Senate is notified uh, by the Leader of the Government that appropriate consultation has occurred and that the committee membership reflects the representation of recognised political parties in the parliament. Now, at the last election, a third of the population of Australia voted for someone other than the Labor and Coalition parties. They elected a diverse parliament, including a record 16 Greens. It was a clear message that the people are ready to move beyond a limited two-party system and towards a parliament whose decision-making reflects the diversities of the communities that we represent. Now, before nominating the members, the leader of the government in the Senate must, according to that schedule, must consult with the leader of each recognised political party that was represented in the Senate uh, and isn't a party uh, that is currently in government. This has not happened. The Intelligence Services Act 2001 is clear that the Prime Minister must consult with the leader of each recognised political party, so not just the leader of the government in the Senate, but the Prime Minister must consult that is represented in the House and does not form part of government. That has not happened either. Instead of a consultation, uh, we have a letter. We've received a letter with the government's proposed nominations. It, it's simply a statement. It's not a consultation. It's not what the Act requires. Right. The Act also requires that, quote, in nominating the members, the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Government in the Senate must have regard to the desirability of ensuring that the composition of the committee reflects the representation of recognised political parties in the parliament, end quote. A committee comprised entirely of Labor and Coalition members clearly fails that requirement, that statutory requirement. Um, Mr. Bant, uh, Mr. Adam Bant, Leader of the Greens, and I have written to the Prime Minister and to the Leader in the Senate to alert them to this. We've proposed that Senator Shoebridge, who holds the relevant portfolio portfolios on behalf of our party, be included on the committee in compliance with the Act, but this has been ignored. And not only have the Greens been ignored, the whole crossbench has been ignored. The PJCIS has long been a stitch up by the two big parties without a single dissenting voice to the old party consensus. And we need that dissent because all too often complex national security legislation is presented to this parliament with a phone book of amendments coming out of the PJCIS and with little to no warning and is often rammed through this place in a matter of hours. And when us on the crossbench raise concerns with that or want to refer it to a Senate committee uh, for scrutiny, we're refused because the bill's already been through the PJCIS. But we don't get to participate in that inquiry. We don't get to properly weigh the impact of these laws and the ramifications that they'll have, serious ramifications in many cases, which often involve the curtailing of rights to procedural justice, rights to privacy and other very significant civil liberties. So when it comes to protecting rights, when it comes to ensuring that we hold our security agencies accountable, when it comes to protecting the rule of law, it is critical that all voices in this parliament are able to fully participate in the process of deliberation on those laws. But instead, the PJCIS, the closed shop of the Australian security state, the two-party stitch-up in this creeping surveillance state, makes all of these decisions without any dissenting voice or any third-party input. And that is not good for democracy. It is certainly not good for protecting human rights. It is not good for the parliament. It is not good for the people that we are put here to represent. Um, so for all of these reasons, we are moving this amendment because we're sick of the two big parties thinking that you own committees like this that make crucial decisions that impact on people's rights and daily lives, and it's not good enough. And it's in breach of the Act. So vote how you will, and uh, this isn't over.
Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy President. Uh, the government opposes the amendment to the motion moved by Senator Waters, and I think uh, we would disagree strongly with Senator Waters' presentation in her remarks that uh, the government has not complied with relevant clauses of the Intelligence Services Act. Um, the Leader of the Government in the Senate has consulted with all leaders of each recognised non-government political party in the Senate about the membership of the committee as required by Clause 14. Now, it might not have been the consultation process that you were after, but we have met the requirements of the Act. We have consulted as required by Clause 14 of Schedule 1. Yesterday, the Leader of the Government in the Senate sent correspondence to Senator Waters as Leader of the Australian Greens in the Senate in accordance with statutory requirements, and the correspondence was also provided was also provided to the Leader of the Australian Greens, Mr Bant. Um, no response has been received from um, Senator Waters to that correspondence. The Leader of the Government also sent the same correspondence to other party leaders, including Senator Birmingham, Senator Mackenzie, Senator Lambie, Senator Hanson and Senator Babbitt. And I can ensure Senator Waters that extensive consideration was also given by the Prime Minister to the desirability of ensuring that the composition of the committee reflects the representation of recognised political parties in the parliament, and I tabled the correspondence sent by Senator Wong to Senator Waters. Can I give that to someone? I'll consider it tabled. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Do you have any further contributions, Senator Gallagher? No. Um, Senator Birmingham, are you seeking the call? And then I'll give the call. Senator Shoebridge, are you seeking the call after that? Yeah. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Deputy President. I thank the Senator. I don't wish to detain the Senate as, uh, as the appointment of members to this committee should be a relatively straightforward uh, process. Uh, I think Senator Gallagher has just outlined uh, the government's actions in relation to uh, compliance with the provisions and, uh, and requirements in relation to appointments to this committee. Uh, this committee is unique in relation to the functions it fills uh, and the way in which appointments processes uh, are undertaken uh, with the stewardship of, uh, of the Prime Minister and the government uh, in that regard. Uh, the opposition respects uh, the processes that have been put in place uh, in that regard uh, in terms of ensuring that, uh, that this committee is comprised uh, in a way which can enable it to fulfil uh, the very sensitive undertakings that it is tasked with. Uh, the opposition also respects the process that the government has applied and the conventions attached uh, to that process uh, and therefore does not support the amendment proposed uh, by the Greens uh, and, uh, and would urge the Senate uh, to proceed to ensure that this important committee can get on with the work that it is tasked to do. Thank the Senate. Senator Shoebridge. Uh, Deputy President, it's just not a good start from a new government to directly flout the law in one of the key committees that, that it seeks to establish in the life of a new parliament, which has, if I might remind members of this chamber, about one in four senators are from the crossbench, totally excluded from this committee. Uh, about 15 per cent of, of, of the other place uh, is the crossbench, totally excluded from this committee. And as uh, Senator Waters said, one in three Australians voted for non-government and non-coalition uh, 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 representative in this parliament, and then this government and the opposition, Labor and the coalition, have this old boys' club stitch up to, to, to start the new parliament. That's not the parliament that Australia voted for. Limiting the membership of this committee to just the Labor and Liberal parties is, is more than the closed shop politics as usual we saw in the, in the Morrison government. It's, it's remarkable, though, that despite the law, despite the law requiring full consultation, and despite the law requiring—and I'll read it—it's Clause 14 of Schedule 1 of the Intelligence Services Act. It, re it says this: In nominating the members, the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Government in the Senate must have regard to the desirability of ensuring that the composition of the committee reflects the representation of recognised political parties in the parliament. That's what the law says. And you have directly flouted the law. And we hear these mealy mouth um, comments from the opposition, seemingly OK with the government uh, breaching the law. We have this nonsense um, proposition 
from, from the government that they have consulted um, that they have consulted because the problem with not consulting is that it's mandatory. You can't choose to consult or not consult because the law requires you to consult. And it says in relation to the Senate, before nominating the members, the leader of the government in the Senate must consult with the leader of each recognised political party that is represented in the Senate and does not form part of the government. Now we put you on notice. The Greens put you on notice of your legal obligations to do this in correspondence co-signed um, by the leader of the Senate, in the Greens in the Senate, Senator Waters, by Mr. Adam Bant, the leader of, of, of the Greens in the Parliament, by myself. We sent you that correspondence, trying to be helpful, on the 26th of July 2022, and said, "These are your legal obligations. These are your legal. We're trying to be helpful. We didn't want you to be breaching the law. We, we were worried that you were just going to do the usual old boys' club thing and exclude the crossbench. We were trying to be helpful, trying to tell you what you had to do." But you just ignored it, just ignored it, and not. And, and it's really the offence isn't ignoring the correspondence we sent. The offence is ignoring the law, and acting unlawfully, and acting unlawfully in setting the membership for one of the key security and intelligence committees in the parliament, like acting unlawfully um, in establishing the committee membership of the of, of a core legal oversight committee. There's a kind of deep irony in what, in what the government has done here, and, and signed on meekly by the opposition, who just wants to keep the club so that when they get in government, they can hand out the, the bounty just between the two, the two parties, like you think the rest of the country thinks is acceptable, but it's not. And then we get the, the specious argument from the government that they have consulted because they sent a letter. Well, let's just read the letter and let's work out if anybody in the world thinks this is consultation apart from Senator Gallagher. This is what it says. Dear Senator Waters, re appointment of members of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security. In accordance with, schedule, with Clause 14 of Schedule 1 to the Intelligence Services Act 2001, I advise that I intend to nominate the following senators to be members of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security. Senator the Honourable Simon Birmingham has an interest in this, Senator Rav Ciccone, Senator James Patterson, Senator Mariel Smith, Senator Jess Walsh. Now, if that's consultation, if that's consultation, there's a lovely little bridge in Sydney that I'd like to sell you. Um, th this is nonsense. It's unlawful, it's a stitch up, it's the worst of the kind of politics that the electorate rejected just 108 days ago. This, this is an unlawful stitch up. And I, I've got to say, I've got to say it may not end here in the Senate. Because you can't just choose which laws you comply with and which laws you don't. There's nothing super special about being a senator that says you can just act contrary to the laws. This isn't just the Senate committee established under the rules of this place. This is a statutory joint committee established under laws passed by both Houses of Parliament and signed off by his nibs, the Governor-General. This is the law which you are directly breaching. So you think it might end here. Well, it may not end here. This is not going to go away because you can't start a new government by flouting the law and signing on to the old boys' club and think we're just going to take it. We won't. Yeah, yeah. Does any other senator have a contribution? Senator Stilljohn? I just want to observe that uh, uh, this is a, a continuing pattern from this new government. Uh, let's just be really clear with the public as to what is happening here tonight. Uh, the government and opposition have come into this place. Uh, as Senator Shoebridge has clearly outlined for the chamber in flagrant uh, disregard of their obligations legally under the relevant, uh, relevant parliamentary uh, pieces of legislation as to the composition of one of the most important bodies uh, within the parliament. Uh, the Oversight Committee, which provides recommendations to the Parliament in relation to particularly security legislation, an incredibly uh, influential committee in this place because of the way in which the major parties uh, operate a closed shop between the two of them on matters of so-called national security. 
Now, when it was my privilege to have the portfolio for the Greens of uh, IT and of, the, of digital rights, I uh, witnessed firsthand in ways in which the uh, recommendations uh, of this committee are manipulated and utilised to close down the debate of this place in relation to legislation impacting the privacy of Australian citizens. I lost count of the number of times uh, in my role uh, as the digital rights spokesperson for the Australian Greens, the number of times, uh, whether it be metadata retention, uh, whether it be backdo uh, backdoors uh, legislation into encrypted messaging uh, applications, you would ask questions after question on behalf of some of the most intelligent, some of the most engaged uh, stakeholders in our community as to the blatant technical flaws uh, within pieces of government legislation, opening the Australian public up to heinous violations of their privacy, and the answer from the government and the answer from the opposition was that was addressed during the PJCIS inquiry, and the recommendation addresses it. Can you see the minutes and you see the consent? Were you able to be part of the deliberation? No. Just trust us, we had a chat about it. <laughs> Accept the recommendation to pass the legislation, sit down and shut up. It is one of the key mechanisms, uh, this closed shop operation, which is not just in relation to this security committee, by the way. In the last sitting of the parliament, the very first time we came together before, uh, since the election, the first vote this Senate took was to ensure that there was no ability uh, for the Greens to chair the Joint, Senate, uh, the yep. Joint Standing Committee uh, oversighting the National Disability Insurance Scheme to maintain the closed shop there too. Because here's the reality, the reality that everybody watching at home understands about Australian politics. Both sides, Liberal and Labour, and let's not forget the Nats too, those great country cosplayers uh, that come into this place pretending to represent the voices and the needs of rural and remote Australians. The deal is this. Whatever side wins the election, there are a certain number there are a certain number of gifts and rewards that each side are able to hand out to the factional players, the people that were able to get the donations, the people that want to advance their careers within the internal mechanisms of the parliament and of the party. And there are a second set of rules that operate together at the same set of times, particularly in the Senate which is, let us remind the entire place, once again, the House of Review, created and manifested to review legislation on behalf of the community. This place has within its power the ability to properly scrutinise many pieces of legislation, to demand the attendance of ministers, to be able to act as a true check and balance upon the executive of the Government of Australia. And yet again and again the ability of this Senate to play that oversight role is given up because on key yep. questions of integrity and oversight that both sides of you get together, your Senate leaders get together, and you say it's been a long-standing practice yep. of the so-called parties of government in this place that we shall observe this convention, meaning that there is no need for us to depart from the previously established process. That would be to upend convention. It would be to let anarchy reign. Scrutiny may break out in the halls. Accountability, nay responsibility, may become part of our culture. Sunshine. We can't have that. Sunshine might come in from the roof and we would burst into flames. And so they maintain the closed shop and the shadow of this place. Now, quite seriously, in these times when there is so much in our political debate that is silence based on two words, national security, it is so easy to shut down a debate in this nation, in this political system, by mentioning the words of national security. 
So much is able to be swept under the rug and out of the way. Now more than ever it is urgently needed that there is alternative perspectives able to scrutinise legislation in relation to national security policy, particularly in a context when one in three people that voted at this election voted for a party which was not the Liberal or National parties. The Liberal or National parties. You people are not trusted by growing and growing and greater and ever greater portions of the Australian public for very good reason, particularly because of the decisions you make in relation to national security. Whether it is the exorbitant expenditures upon defence programmes, uh, such as the submarines, uh, such as the frigates, such as the various pieces of military uh, 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 capacity which are purchased without any thought of value to money to the public or what we might otherwise do uh, with those funds, or whether indeed it is the pieces of national security legislation which are rammed through this place, uh, making Australia one of the weakest nations in the world in relation to its human rights structures, in relation particularly to the digital rights protections that are available to its citizenry. We will only have the capacity to understand exactly what is being done. The public will only have the ability to access the information that they need to make informed decisions in relation to national security and security policy when parties that are not part of this closed shop are able to access the information available to members of committees such as the PJCIS committee. I commend the amendments put forward to the Senate uh, by uh, Senator Waters, our Senate leader. Uh, Senator Shoebridge would do a fantastic job uh, in that role. Uh, and it is exactly the type of independent oversight offered by the addition of crossbench members uh, to such committees which are so urgently needed uh, to inform properly these debates. It is my intention to put the amendment, the amendment to the motion, unless any other senator wishes to make a contribution. So I, I put the question that the amendment to the motion to appoint senators to the committee by Senator Waters uh, to the chamber. Those uh, for the amendment to the motion say aye. aye. Against no. no. I think the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. Order. The question before the chair is that the amendment is an amendment to the motion to appoint senators to committees moved by Senator Waters. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair, those against to the left. I appoint Senator McKim as teller for the ayes and Senator Scar as teller for the noes. Honourable Senators, there being 13 ayes and 35 noes, it's passed in the negative. I now intend to put the original motion. The original motion was moved by the, uh, Senator Gallagher that senators be appointed to the committee as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed in, on the dynamic red. Put the question. Those of the question say aye. Against, no. I think the ayes have it. I think division required. Division is required. Ring the bells.
lock the doors. The eyes will pass to the right of me, nose to the left of me. I appoint Senator Pratt as teller for the eyes and Senator McKim as teller for the nose. Honourable Senators, there being 29 ayes and 13 noes, it's resolved in the affirmative. Messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence. Military Rehabilitation and Compensation and Other Legislation Amendment in Capacity Payments Bill 2022 and Narcotics, Narcotic Drugs Licence Charges Amendment Bill 2022. Minister. Thank you, uh, Deputy uh, President. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities may be taken together and uh, may now be read a first time. I put that question. Those the question say aye, against no, the ayes have it. Clark. Military Rehabilitation and Compensation and Other Legislation Amendment Incapacity Payments Bill 2022 and Narcotics Drugs Licence Charges Amendment Bill 2022. Minister. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Uh, I move that these bills uh, be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches 
incorporated uh, into uh, Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Uh, I move that uh, the debate uh, now be adjourned and that the bills be listed as separate orders uh, of the day. I put that question. Those of the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Clark. Business of the Senate, notice of motion number one. Standing in the name of Senator Faruqi, motion for the disallowance of the Export Control Animals Amendment, Northern Hemisphere Summer Prohibition Rules 2022. Uh, I, Senator Davy caught my eye. Um, Senator Fr I'm not quite sure who motion. last spoke. Senator Faruqi, I'll give you the call. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. I move the motion. On the 5th of April, the ban on live sheep exports to the Middle East was rolled back by the former Morrison government. This was just before the height of the Northern Summer. It was cunning timing, just before a federal election being called, which meant the Senate was denied the crucial opportunity to scrutinize or to act on these last minute changes. This motion seeks to reverse those changes, which unwind the Northern Summer ban, which wasn't perfect in the first place, but did provide protection to animals in some of the hottest months. Let me make clear at the outset that the entire live export industry should be shut down, and it should be shut down as soon as possible. It is beyond repair. Its social license has well and truly expired. It cannot be made safe for animals. The Greens have fought long and hard to ban the cruelty that is the live export trade, and this disallowance is one small step in the journey for animal welfare. It is worth reflecting on some of the history to see how far we've come and how much further we have to go. In 1985, a review of the live sheep trade by the Senate Select Committee on Animal Welfare reported that if a decision were to be made on the future of the live export trade purely on animal welfare grounds, there was enough evidence to stop the trade. Since 1985, at least 10 government and parliamentary reviews have examined live export, and the evidence in support of that statement has only piled up. The death toll has been enormous, with tragedy after tragedy. In 1980, 40,000 sheep died aboard the Farid Faris. In 1966, sorry, in 1986, 67,000 sheep died aboard the UNICEF. In 1999, 800 cattle died on the Temburong. In 2003, 5,000 sheep died on the MB Cormo Express. In 2014, 4,000 sheep died in the Badr 3. In 2016, 3,000 sheep died on the Al Mesela. In 2018, 2,000 sheep died on the Awasi Express in shocking conditions that were broadcast to the world on an unforgettable 60 Minutes episode, which showed sheep crammed into dirty pens, panting from heat stress, and leaping over each other to access food. Piles of sheep carcasses were also shown. These disasters grabbed the headlines, but reality is that every year thousands of sheep and cattle die on live export ships. It is important to remember that it's not just the cruelty of deaths, but that while surviving, thousands of sheep and animals suffer unbearable heat stress and distress. Labored breathing, open-mouthed panting, and extreme discomfort is experienced by animals. Deaths are caused by a range of factors, from heat stress and disease to injuries developed on board. This is considered routine and fine as long as exporters keep their voyage mortality rates under what the government considers an acceptable level. However, those accepted mortality rates translate to thousands of deaths. How is that acceptable? And since 2006, there have been at least 70 occasions where that so-called acceptable mortality level was exceeded. Animals suffering from heat stress literally cook from the inside out. They can suffer for days as their organs shut down one by one on these crowded floating ovens. Whistleblower live export vet Dr. Lynn Simpson says she once took the temperature of a fallen sheep on a ship and was blown away to find it was 47 degrees Celsius, almost 10 degrees higher than normal. Their fat was melted and like a translucent jelly, she said. They were cooking from the inside. After that, any animal that looked like it was about to collapse, I killed. 
Lynn is one of the many brave whistleblowers who exposed the cruelty of the live export trade at great personal cost. Trainee navigator Fasulullah is another, and I pay tribute to them today. Their courage led to the Northern Summer Ban in the first place. The ban officially came into force in 2019 in recognition of the fact that the risk of heat stress for sheep on live export ships to the Middle East during the Northern Summer months is simply too dangerous. Unfortunately, the ban only prevented live sheep exports from June to September, though science clearly tells us that it should be from 1 May to 31st October. Nonetheless, the ban has been important in reducing mortality rates and in keeping sheep off ships at the most dangerous time of the year. And now, instead of listening to science and expanding the ban, the Department of Agriculture has wound it back. The Export Control Animals Amendment Northern Hemisphere Summer Prohibition Rules 2022 reduces the ban on exporting sheep to Red Sea destinations by two weeks in June and reduces the ban on exporting sheep to Qatar by 10 days in May. Animal welfare experts agree that this reduction is alarming. In its submission to the Northern Summer Prohibition Review, RSPCA Australia stated, the RSPCA does not support the proposal to reduce the prohibition to or through the Red Sea by a further 14 days because the Indian Ocean equatorial region is hottest in May and June. Updating the animal rules in support of this proposal would be irresponsible given the scale of known animal welfare risk and the government's responsibility to protect animal welfare. The RSPCA understands that Red Sea destinations represented 22 0.6% of the sheep exported from Australia under the current regulations in the three-year period between 2019 and 2021. The Alliance for Animals, whose members include Animals Australia, Voiceless and Humane Society International Australia, were also firmly against these changes, stating that allowing sheep to be exported through the Red Sea in June would push them to their biological limit and risk a significant mortality event. Perversely, the department claims that the instrument is a win for animal welfare because the rules also ostensibly introduce stricter conditions for a 10-day period to some Persian Gulf destinations in May. However, there are no additional monitoring and enforcement measures to ensure these conditions are met. Given that the current monitoring and enforcement framework is already inadequate, we can safely conclude that these conditions will be meaningless. And the Greens aren't alone in this view again. The RSPCA were also critical of the effectiveness of imposing additional conditions, stating such conditions have not proven to protect animal welfare to date due to inadequate inspection requirements and insufficient enforcement. The insufficiencies are significant. For example, the additional new conditions include that each individual sheep be of a certain weight and have a certain length of wool to mitigate against heat stress. But the enforcement framework does not require sheep to be assessed individually. They are assessed in groups, which makes it impossible to ensure that necessary heat mitigation conditions are actually being met. There is also a lack of independent third-party inspection arrangements and a lack of independent and appropriate veterinary care. Only one accredited veterinarian is required on long-haul voyages and that can carry tens of thousands of sheep at one time across multiple decks. The Department of Agriculture justified rolling back the ban based on climatology data, but in a warming world, this is a patently laughable excuse. In fact, the department didn't even consider the increasing temperatures associated with climate change before deciding to send more sheep to the Middle East in the hottest times of the year. Predictive climate analysis on expected future temperatures was also not considered, despite these being an important indicator of the level of heat that sheep would be exposed to. And even worse, the department made these changes before it had even finished its own review into the ban, which we are still waiting on. It's hard to conclude that the changes were based on anything other than the commercial interests and profit margins of live exporters, who have been lobbying the department to wind back the ban. Sadly, the department's capitulation is not surprising. It has a long history of failing to adequately prioritize animal welfare. The department is inherently and fundamentally conflicted because it is also responsible for promoting the interests of farmers and exporters. Animal welfare will always come second to profit-making. 
And I don't make these assertions lightly. In 2018, Philip Moss released a comprehensive independent review into the regulatory capability and culture of the department. The review found that there had been a catastrophic failure to regulate the live export industry and that a culture of fear within the department meant staff were not reporting their concerns about animal welfare within the industry. It was a pretty damning indictment. The report found that on occasions, in our view, reportable mortality reports were revised or redrafted to dilute or expunge findings which adversely reflected on the regulatory framework. Following the Moss report, John Lawler was appointed to investigate whistleblower allegations that staff were dissuaded from reporting the full extent of animal welfare breaches. This investigation stopped due to whistleblower protection laws. Those accused of wrongdoing and have never been forced to explain their actions. Nor do we know if the culture of secrecy and fear within the live exports regulator has been adequately addressed. The community should have no faith in the ability of the live exports industry to operate ethically or the regulator to in fact oversee animal welfare. The rot is set too deep. What we desperately need is an independent office of animal welfare to protect animals from cruelty and exploitation. As long as animal welfare remains the responsibility of the Department of Agriculture, the interests of animals will be ignored. The end of the Liberal National Government is welcome news from any perspective, particularly from an animal welfare perspective. Labour may have gone to the election with a promise to end live sheep exports, but they have refused to commit to a timeline since coming to office. Prime Minister Albanese has ruled out an end to the trade in this term of government, and it is a bit of a slap in the face of anyone who cares about animal welfare. And it would be another slap in the face if Labour voted against this motion. It would practically guarantee the Morrison era changes to the ban would continue and seal the fates of thousands of sheep. Senators here, and especially the Albanese government, have a chance today to show that they care about animals by supporting the Greens motion and by introducing a new instrument which expands the northern summer ban so that it extends from 1st May to 31st October, just as experts are calling for. Then, let's quickly move to end this brutal trade once and for all. But whatever happens, the Greens will keep pushing for a clear and swift timeline for the end of live exports, with a careful transition for workers and a plan to transform the live sheep export trade to a locally processed chilled meat trade. A clear majority of Australians agree with that position. 58% of people in Australia support a ban on live sheep export within this term of government, according to a poll conducted by Lonergan Research in June. RSPCA Australia commissioned an ind independent poll in January 2022, and the results showed that around 8 out of 10 people in Australia are opposed to reducing the northern summer prohibited period for live sheep exports. Two-thirds want an end to the live export of animals, including 66% in rural or country areas and 70% in Western Australia. So I implore the government to listen to our communities. Don't unwind the northern summer ban and commit to a deadline to end live export in this term of government. The Greens have been steadfast in our position. We first introduced legislation to end live exports back in 2011. In 2018, my bill, co-sponsored by then Senators Hinch and Storer to ban live sheep export, passed the Senate but languished in the House. In 2019, we again introduced legislation to end live export. And we will continue to fight for animals in this term of Parliament because animals are not mere cargo. They are living, breathing, sentient beings. They are capable of fear and suffering. They have meaning and worth beyond their commercial value. Today, this Senate has the power to undo these cruel cuts to the Northern Summer Ban and insist that sheep deserve better than, than to be shipped off to cook at sea in torture chambers at the hottest time of the year. I urge everyone in this chamber to make the right choice and support this motion. Yeah, yeah. So the... Senator Farrell, you <laughs> seeking the call. I am. In the order of precedence, I'll give it to Senator Farrell, then I'll give it to Senator Davies. 
Thank you, Deputy President. Um, the government is committed to protecting uh, animal welfare, and that is exactly why we are opposing this motion. At the May election, the Australian people endorsed Labor's policy to phase out the trade of live sheep by sea. Labor is committed to ensuring that live animal exports are well regulated uh, while we work uh, with industry to uh, implement uh, this commitment. We were surprised to learn the Greens were seeking to move this disallowance. If this motion were to pass, it would produce worse outcomes for animal welfare. In April this year, amendments to the Northern Summer Prohibition Rules were made to improve the management of heat stress risks for sheep exported, exported in uh, late May. The rules introduce a 10-day conditional prohibition period, preventing export to some Persian Gulf destinations off the back of new data that showed an increased risk of heat stress during this period. Uh, <clears throat> that change to the rules strengthens animal welfare. The rules further impose additional conditions a targeted heat stress risk reduction that must be met during the designated period. Again, those changes strengthen animal welfare. To disallow this uh, instrument would force the uh, regulators of the uh, live sheep exports to find new and likely weaker measures to protect animal welfare. The government uh, does not want that. The Australian people do not want that. So why are the Greens voting for it? Voting for this disallowance is a bad outcome for both animal welfare, animal welfare and exporters. The government's commitment to phase out the trade of live sheep by sea reflects community sentiment. Balancing community expectations and the Australian industry remains a key priority for this government. That's why we will continue to support regulators to protect animal wel welfare as we work with industry to phase out the trade of live sheep at sea. Senator Davey. Thank you. Um, well, we know what the Greens actually want to do. The Greens want to ban all live export. And we know what a lot of the organisations that the Greens have quoted in their justifications for this disallowance. Uh, actually stand for, and that is to end all livestock industries. I mean, if you're quoting from the Alliance for Animals or Voiceless or Animals Australia, you know, you're really scratching at the anti-livestock industries barrel. But as uh, Senator Farrell quite rightly said, disallowing this instrument will lead to worse outcomes. Disallowing this instrument will also disallow new animal welfare standards. And let's face it, Australia's live export industry now has the best animal health and welfare standards in the world, bar none. Since 2018, the former Liberal and Nationals government working with industry, working with the veterinarians uh, and the department have developed some of the strongest animal welfare standards in the world. We've used new technologies where we can now actually count the amount of pants per minute a sheep does. We've in increased or decreased the amount of sheep per pen on boats. We have constant monitoring. Every ship has to have an accredited vet uh, on a long haul journey. And we have significantly significantly improved the animal health outcomes. But the Greens don't accept that. While the Greens say we've got to listen to science, listen to science, they only want you to listen to the science that supports their argument. They don't want you to listen to the many vets who have seen the improvements in animal health and welfare standards that we have put in place since, yes, that dreadful dreadful event on the Awasi Express that uh, Senator Faruqi mentioned. But that was four years ago. We can't live in the past. We've got to move forward. 
The other issue that this disallowing these amendments would create is we would just be exporting our problem. Because I can promise you that the countries we export to, the countries that culturally and practically rely on a live animal market, will look elsewhere. They won't go, oh, Australia is not going to send us sheep anymore, so we'll, uh, yep, we'll pick up the phone and we'll order a couple of boxes of frozen meat. They won't do that because it doesn't work in their countries, it doesn't work for their culture sometimes, and it's not practical. Some countries, they don't have refrigeration. They don't have easy access like we do to a Coles or a Woolworths. Um, so it's not practical for them. So they will go elsewhere to fill that live market gap. And that elsewhere will have worse animal health standards. But this is typical of the Greens, because the Greens are very much not in my backyard. They're like, as long as we don't see it and we don't do it here in Australia, then it's all good. I mean, it's like their stance a few years ago saying we shouldn't grow rice in this country. Someone else will have to grow the rice that we grow to feed the world. But that's okay because it's not happening here, it's not our problem. It's a bit like former leader of the Greens, Bob Brown, with his NIMBY stance on wind farms. I want the world to move towards renewable energy, but not if you're putting a wind farm off the coast of Tasmania, because that's too close to home for the Greens. And that's what the Greens' mentality is. I must commend uh, Senator Farrell um, and the way he outlined the position of Labor on this uh, disallowance motion, and I must commend Labor for their stance on this motion. But I also must uh, highlight that Labor are still threatening our live export industry with closure of the sheep industry, in West, particularly impacting Western Australia, although they say not this term. Well, I hope they use this term of government to get on the ground, to talk to the live export industry in Western Australia to really understand what closing that industry would do. I hope Labor learnt from the debacle of the closure of the live export industry under the Gillard government that saw a very successful class action uh, and record payouts having to go back to the farmers that were absolutely crippled due to an ill-conceived reaction um, instead of working with industry, which is what our government did after the OIC Express. The Liberals and Nationals in government worked with industry to identify the problems, to find solutions, to implement the solutions, to regulate the solutions and to make sure that we now become the envy of the world. And when we're talking about the live ex industry, it's not just the ship owners, it's not just the sheep producers, but we're also talking about the truckies. We're also talking about the wharfies. We're talking about the stockmen and women. You need go no further than the Young Live Exporters Network that uh, have shining examples and case studies of men and women from around Australia who are proud to work in the live export industry, who are proud to say that they are very concerned about animal health and welfare standards who are proud to know that their industry strives every day to improve those standards. We can't rest on our laurels. We did a lot from 2018 to, to today. We have done an awful lot to improve standards, but that doesn't mean that we're stopping, that the industry will now throw their hands up and go, that's it, there's no more to do. Every day they are working to make sure that we continue to have the best record for animal health and well-being in the live export industry. The work we have done and the work industry has done on new developments in heat stress management for the live export of sheep 
should always be considered as it becomes available. And this is what I mean when I say industry is constantly striving, constantly working, to the point that we now have the lowest mortality rates, rates in sheep export ever. And when people say, well, the live export industry is in decline, I beg to differ. Because in March 2022, the forecast export value for this financial year was 107 million. That's a pretty impressive figure, but that's going to grow to 119 million for the 22-23 financial year. And that was before any ban was proposed. The Northern Summer Hemisphere trade is important, particularly to Western Australia, where the majority of this annual live export is met. Industry believes live export is key to the preservation of the entire Western Australian sheep industry. And there is a huge demand for those sheep from Western Australia in the Middle East. And as I said before, this demand is not only on a cultural value a basis, but also on the basis that they don't have the cold storage facilities. This is about food security in these nations. This is about food security across the world, and it's also about industry security here at home. If the live sheep export industry was shut down, then countries with poorer animal welfare standards will fill the void and take Australia's market share. And I implore the Chamber not to export our problems, not to push issues offshore and then pretend that it doesn't happen, but to work with industry and to work with our trading partners. Because that's the other thing that, that a ban ignores. We're actually, we have people onshore in our trading markets working with the purchasers of our animals to ensure that our animal welfare standards go from Australia to the ship and to the port where, where they are exported to, and even into the markets, because that is our commitment to animal health and welfare. So I implore the Chamber, don't export our problems. Don't hide your head in the sand and think that if it's offshore, out of sight, out of mind, and it doesn't happen. We have a responsibility as a trader. We have a responsibility to our international friends and colleagues to make sure that we retain the best animal health and wellbeing uh, statistics, but also that we do our bit to feed the world. And we don't do it um, ignoring cultural and practical issues. So we will not be supporting this motion in any way, shape or form. And I am pleased to hear that nor will the, the government. Uh, and I urge the rest of the chamber to also not support this disallowance. Thank you. Mr Smith. Afternoon, just to make a few remarks in support of this matter also, and just to follow Senator Perrin, who has made it very, very clear that the Coalition will not be supporting this, um, this position put by Senator Farouk in the Australian Greens. And I speak, of course, as a West Australian senator, and this is an agricultural industry that is very, very important to the livelihood of Western Australia. Western Australian regional families, Western Australian regional communities. And just to quantify that uh, for people, that in 2021-2022, the industry was worth in excess of $100 million to Western Australia, and in 2022-2023, in excess of $110 million. So it makes a very sizeable contribution to the welfare and prosperity of our state. I think there's a very, very important point to be made and indeed a point to be reiterated. 
and that is that if the position of the Australian Greens is to be supported and is to be upheld, then we actually have this perverse outcome that countries with poorer animal welfare standards will be lifted and raised in the global trade to fill the void left by the Australian and indeed the West Australian trade. And I think that's a very, very important point. And as Senator Davey remarked, if Australia and Western Australia in particular was to leave the live export industry, it does not mean that the trade gets better. In fact, the very, very real outcome is an industry, a global industry, that has lower standards than currently exist. It's the participation of the Australian live export industry, I believe, that maintains very, very high standards across the world. And indeed, it's the existence and participation of Australian traders that ensure that the highest standards are in fact replicated. Over the last few years, I think the industry has met and understood the changing community expectations that exist around the live export industry. And not only does the trade generate important wealth and income for the Australian economy, supporting thousands of people employed across associated industries throughout rural and regional communities, and like I said, in particular in my home state of Western Australia, the ongoing success of the trade depends also on the very hard work of producers and exporters and their strong and continuing commitment to world standards in regards to animal welfare and their very, very strong endorsement of robust rules that are based on science and evidence. And I think that's an important point, that when I think about the live export trade in Western Australia, I am reminded that the industry has been very alive to changing export, ex community expectations. I'm alive to the fact that they have used an evidence-based approach to lift standards and, in particular, new developments in regards to heat stress management for the live export of sheep should always be considered as they become available, and that is an experience and a practice that the Australian industry uh, does endorse. These amendments take into consideration new data to continue to manage heat stress. The focus on animal welfare has resulted in historically low mortality rates in sheep exported in recent years. Labor have indicated they will ban the live sheep export trade, but not in this term. And that's a very, very stark warning. That should be an alarm bell for West Australian agricultural producers, that while Labor has said that they will not ban it, that is not their future position. Labor have indicated they will ban the live sheep trade at some point in the future, just not in this term. In June, the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestries claimed that there was no evidence the animal welfare issues with live sheep exports could be addressed. That's a position that West Australian senators like myself and indeed other members of the West Australian Federal Parliamentary Party, including Rick Wilson, Slade Brockman, Senator Matt O'Sullivan and others, all agree and all support. Labor have also indicated that the industry is declining. I invite them to travel across regional Western Australia so that they can see for themselves just how important this industry actually is. So, in those brief remarks, may I just add my support, my strong endorsement for the success of the West Australian live export industry and the great weight that they do, the great work that they do in not just meeting and exceeding community expectations, but rising to the challenge of making sure that the trade is based on the best possible science is evidence-based and is making a really important contribution to Australia's agricultural wealth and the wealth and prosperity of every West Australian town and family. Uh, thank you, Senator Smith. Uh, Senator Cheney. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, and look, I want to make a, a very brief remark this evening um, on, on the disallowance motion that's been put here in the Senate uh, tonight by the Australian Greens, um, and echoing, I guess, the, the comments that we have heard not just from Senator uh, Dean Smith, uh, Senator Perrin-Davey, but also uh, Senator Don Farrell as well. 
Um, the motion that's been put before us here tonight, Senators, um, I think fails to really deal with the substance of the policy area which we need to really deal with, and which is animal welfare. And the, the point that's been missed in the debate by some, some of the contributions tonight, the, the animal welfare standards in this country are at the strongest that we've ever seen. Uh, yes, there have been um, Senate inquiries and, and, and other reports and, and reviews into the animal welfare standards in this country. And, and, and for good for good measures too. Like we should be having the world's best practice, in my opinion, uh, when we do export uh, live animals uh, overseas. But we also should do it in a way that supports industry, supports the economy, supports jobs, many regional jobs that uh, are really reliant on on this industry. Now, and that's not to say that the industry has uh, hasn't got issues and has not had um, times where it needs support. In, in dealing with how we best export, uh, particularly in this case, sheep. And we've seen some very distressing footages uh, that have been aired through the media on how um, some animals have been treated. And it, quite frankly, you know, shameful by those operators who have done the wrong thing and brought great shame to an industry that many people, many workers rely on for their livelihoods. But if the Senate was to pass this motion, um, it would actually produce worse, not better, outcomes for animal welfare. Earlier this year, in the previous parliament, amendments to the Northern Summer Prohibition Rules were made to improve the management of heat stress for sheep exported in late May. And comments that we heard earlier uh, this evening, um, I think unfair comments attacking the department the officials who I think do a, a, who do a fantastic job at not just upholding the rule of law, but they do have animal welfare close to them. It, it is central to their job to make sure that the animals that are exported are done so with the highest standards. But it is also good to see that at the state and federal level, governments have worked together to address the, the shonk operators the shonky operators that have, been, that have given the industry a bad name, and it is important that the changes, the changes that the Northern Summer Prohibition Rules were based not just on science but also data, updated climatology data, which indicated that changes were necessary to reduce the risk of heat stress. Now, the rules introduced a 10-day conditional prohibition on exports to some Persian Gulf destinations. The rules also impose additional conditions during the designated period designed to reduce the risk of heat stress. These include shorter fleece length, maximum sheep weight limits, minimum pen air turnover rates and increased pen space allowances. These actions all strengthen animal welfare based on science and data that we have available to us. Which is why I think many of us were surprised when this disallowance motion was brought before the Senate. The, uh, the, the Greens uh, moving this disallowance really, I think, failed to understand the real issue that they're trying to deal with here. You know, we, we do hear from time to time um, that they are somehow the champions of animals. The champions of animals. Order. And as we heard the contributions from this, from this evening, um, putting animal welfare, somehow we need to not just look at uh, one part of the disallowance, but we need to look at the whole disallowance, quite frankly. And, and if, if what has been proposed by the Greens tonight would not it would just hurt animal welfare standards in this country, it would reduce the standards in this country, but also impact the livelihoods of many people around, around this country, particularly from the state of Western Australia. Uh, and through the contributions that Senator Smith and others have made this evening. So I was very surprised that we are dealing with this disallowance motion tonight. So it is actually quite shocking that we are having to deal with this instrument, or this motion, uh, that would override and, and fail to actually improve animal, animal welfare standards in this country. But um, let's also not give this instrument the chop. There are important rules and enforcement mechanisms contained in this instrument, and presumably the Greens want us to think that if we were to scrap it, the welfare of sheep will just magically improve. 
But in reality, this would force the regulator to find new, likely weaker measures to protect animal welfare. Is this what we want? Is this what we want? Weaker, weaker measures to protect those animals that we are trying to export. Well, I don't think we should stand for it. And a stunt that not always wastes this chamber's time, if it were to be successful, would, ha would likely have a detrimental effect. A detrimental effect. Now, are we surprised by the hypocrisy of some here in the Greens? Well, trying to act high and mighty for their own political games while we're actually damaging the cause that they claim to be supporting. And I haven't even mentioned the economic pain that would be caused by, ripping, by trying to rip the live sheep export trade overnight without any consultation. And that is something that this government has committed to do, to consult with industry, to consult the WA government. That's what a, a government, a party of government does. We sit down and we talk. We talk to the industry. We talk to those who are concerned about animal welfare standards. We talk to uh, our, our friends over in, in Western Australia, the Western Australian government, about the impacts of phasing out this industry. But we are committed to supporting the regulators to protect animal welfare while we consult with the industry. We cannot just pull the rug under the industry. Like any change that responds to concerns from the community, this change has to be done in a way that is sensitive to the impact on individuals and communities that currently rely on the live export of sheep. Careful consultation and a considerate approach might not get as much traction on social media, but good government and sound decision making is more important than likes and shares. Thank you. Senator um, Napa Jimpa Price. Um, I stand with my colleagues tonight um, to oppose um, this motion brought forward by the Greens. I am the Senator for the Northern Territory. I also represent the concerns of those in the Northern Territory. Make no mistake that when the Greens want to shut down live export of animals, they won't stop at sheep. They will move further beyond that. And our grave concerns, not only for the, the, the sheep uh, export trade of Western Australia, who will most detrimentally be affected by such a motion, but also for the Northern Territory uh, and our vast cattle industry as well. The coalition put the work in place to ensure that Australia has now got the highest standards for animal welfare in terms of the live industry, live export industry. It's the highest standard in the world. What concerns me is the fact that the Greens fail to consider the livelihoods of everyday Australians, those that work hard to ensure that there is food on our tables as well as a, a strong economy. In the Northern Territory, the Australia's live cattle export industry, with excess of 40 per cent of the nation's live export trade, goes through the Darwin port. So it is close to me. The latest comprehensive economic assessment completed as part of the Northern Australian Beef Situation Analysis indicated the cattle industry's estimated economic value in, the North in Northern Australia is worth approximately 5.03 billion, of which 3.7 billion was attributed to the production at the farm gate level. This is what the Greens propose to put at risk when they put up motions such as the disallowance motion that we're now debating tonight. And I find it ironic that instead of uh, standing here and debating this, I would like to be uh, just over in the Great Hall where tonight the Agri Futures Rural Women's Award Gala Dinner is taking place. I would urge the Greens to go over there, go over and speak to those women, women farmers who live this. This is their livelihood. This is the way in which they pay for their children's futures, their children's educa education. This is the way in which they uphold our communities. 
not just the Western Australian communities, not just the territories communities, but for communities right across Australia in the way that they contribute. Now, just recently, the Northern Territory Cattle Association released a statement speaking to live export bans, remembering what took place in the Northern Territory. Back then, of course, in their statement, they reminisced about the then Minister for Infrastructure, who was now our Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, and his comments made on ABC's Q&A in defence of the decision for the live export ban at the time. He stated it was the right thing to do. I'm glad he's changed his position on this. I am. But if I read this, continue to read their statement, and if you can imagine, instead of Labor in this case, we're talking of the Greens, it's just as relevant now. These concerns are huge. So at the same time Mr Albanese made these comments, Northern Australia was in turmoil. Members of the NTCA and beef producers across the north had been forced into letting their staff go, bringing their children home from school and university while desperately trying to decide what to do with a business that no longer had a market to sell to. Even before the ban, many of these families were struggling through drought, something the government knew at the time. As the ban continued, trucking companies— Senator Nampajimpa Price, uh, it now being uh, 7.20. I propose that the Senate now adjourn and you will be in continuance uh, on this motion. I now call Senator Andrick. Thank you. A wise man once said, breaking someone's trust is like crumpling up a perfect piece of paper. You can smooth it over, but it's never going to be the same. In 2022, Australians have a right to feel this way about many institutions they used to trust. Our government departments are now highly politicised. They subscribe to ludicrous ideological claims along the lines of race, gender, sexuality, and refuse to deviate from them for fear of angering the intolerant diversity, inclusion and equity brigade. Yet they can't even tell us what a woman is. Why? Because they're highly politicised. Sadly, leftist political ideology has invaded every sphere of life, from sports teams being forced to wear pride guernseys and bending the knee for Black Lives Matter to the entertainment industry relentlessly pushing uh, propaganda onto our children and our educational institutions seeking to erase every hint of our great heritage from the curriculum. We've also witnessed our educational institutions and once trusted academic journals become captured by ideological zealots. The key to understanding this phenomenon is understanding the long march through the institutions, a term coined by German Marxist intellectual Rudi Deutschke who advocated for Marxist revolution not by violent means, as Marx did, but by a gradual infiltration of Western institutions and subversion of their principles from within. The revolution would take place not by tearing down buildings, but by changing what occurs within them. They have gradually infiltrated the universities, the media, the bureaucracies, where these theories don't have to work to be taken seriously. It is also why Marxists are interested in controlling our educational institutions, which shape the minds of future generations. There, left-wing curriculum makers seek to deny children the opportunity to learn about their Western heritage and replace it with a false notion that Australia is a racist country. This disrupts social cohesion and fosters resentment, making it easier to replace our heritage with a Marxist worldview of the power struggles between groups. So the long march has been successful. The principles of our institutions have been dismantled and replaced by a left-wing ideology obsessed with oppression and oppressors. People who don't subscribe are vilified and face social penalties for not conforming to the woke status quo, even losing their jobs. You're right to question your institutions. The Therapeutic Goods Association told you that the experimental COVID mRNA shots were safe and effective, but they were neither. Your public health bureaucrats locked you in your homes, and it didn't work. <clears throat> professional bodies have swapped professional advocacy for professional activism. All have failed because rather than focus on their work, these institutions have become, have become exploited by politics. Public health is now politicised. The education system is now politicised. Sport is now politicised. Entertainment is now politicised. Advertising is now politicised. The corporate sector is now politicised. And even your job is politicised. They're wrong to tell you you're a racist for believing every Australian should enjoy equal opportunity. They're wrong to call you a transphobe for knowing what a woman is. 
They're wrong to call you homophobic for believing that our children deserve a mother and a father in the home. Their isms and phobias are meaningless insults used to intimidate you into silence so that their revolution can proceed. The woke brigade lose their unearned credibility when we deny them the high moral ground. They attack people for opposing equity and social justice while trying to destroy their connection to history, their right to speak freely and their right to protect their children from these influences. In South Australia, at least, the grassroots movement is changing the trajectory with the aim of building institutions that receive the wisdom of the past with gratitude. Many quiet Australians who hold the true values of the Liberal Party are joining our political ranks to support like-minded types and take back political ground from the radical left. The movement is one of regeneration, of building up rather than tearing down, and of the treasuring of our traditions of the forebearers that gave us these traditions carelessly rather than discarding them. We are slowly reclaiming ground. We will win back the institutions. We will straighten out that crumpled piece of paper and we will win back people's trust. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Uh, Senator, sorry, Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Last week, the government held a Jobs and Skills Summit and congratulated itself for inviting everyone to the table and for being open to all ideas to upskill Australia and address workforce shortages. Equal opportunity, visa changes, training opportunities and skilled migration were hot topics on the table. But in fact, not everyone was at the table and the equal opportunity talk was pretty superficial because, as usual, refugees and people seeking asylum were ignored. In recent weeks, my office has been inundated with messages from refugees and people seeking asylum who are desperate to upskill, study, work and contribute to society. Many of them sought asylum a decade ago and have long been recognized as refugees, known as the legacy caseload, as if they were not people with feelings, hopes and dreams. They have spent years under the cruelty of the offshore detention regime, then in limbo, trapped in a cycle of endless visa renewals and often without access to basic rights. The cruelty is calculated and deliberate. Both Labour and the Coalition refuse to treat people seeking asylum and refugees like humans who deserve dignity because they want to use them as examples to discourage more people from coming to our shores. Effectively, these governments have said, look here, this is how badly we will treat you if you dare to come here. Such is their level of cruelty that they would rather people suffer persecution than find a safe haven here. The dehumanization does not end when refugees are finally allowed into Australia. The thousands that are living in limbo here are effectively kept handcuffed in the margins by virtue of their temporary visa status and strict visa conditions, which force them to exist as second-class citizens. The most heartbreaking injustice is how the government denies young refugees the right to higher education. Denying people their right to study and learn is nothing short of sadistic. I want to speak about two young women who have reached out to me and whose experiences illustrate this cruelty that so many others are encountering. I won't name them to protect their privacy. When she was nine years old, the first of these women came here by boat and was immediately sent to Nauru. While detained, she was subjected to trauma, which no child should be subjected to, including witnessing suicide attempts. Her mental health was severely impacted. She was finally evacuated from Nauru in 2018 on medical grounds. Once in Australia and in community detention, this woman, a recognized refugee, began attending school where she excelled. Last year, she was granted a full scholarship to a university. Then she turned 18 and the government stripped her of her study rights because of a temporary visa status. status. She had to forfeit the scholarship, and just like that, the window of hope for a better life slammed shut. The second of these women has a similar story, arriving 10 years ago as a 19-year-old and then being sent through straight to offshore detention on Nauru. On Nauru, she was subjected to horrific treatment, including solitary confinement. No one was ever held accountable for these injustices. She was finally evacuated on medical grounds and has spent the last two years repeatedly urging the government to let her study. Before she fled her country, she was studying medicine. I understand that these women have both contacted um, the minister, but to no avail as yet. There is a simple fix. Transition people onto permanent visas and grant them the right to study, work, and live here. This is consistent with international law which recognizes that everyone has a right to an education. 
including refugees. So many young refugees are being denied study rights by this government. They are full of promise and potential. They have had many of their childhood and adolescent years stolen by the Labour and Liberal governments. But they are determined. As Sabah Vasefi, a refugee advocate, wrote in The Guardian recently, but some who are now adolescents continue to experience the punitive effects, legal limbo and structural violence of Australia's deterrence system. They are not asking for compensation or an apology or a handout. They're just asking to study. But both Labour and Liberal governments should hang their heads in shame. The women I met are some of the most passionate and strong people. They and others like them have suffered too much at the hands of Australia's cruel policies. Earlier this week, Senator Wong expressed expressed dismay that girls in Afghanistan could no longer go to school. We should be extending the same concern for refugees and those seeking asylum in Australia who want to study here. So I urge the Labour government and Minister Giles to urgently make the changes needed to allow them to study. This country, any country, would be lucky to have them. Let them study. Let them stay. Senator Grogan. Thank you. Um, last month, the South Australian government, um, namely uh, Susan Close, the Deputy Premier, uh, announced the appointment of Richard Beasley as the inaugural South Australian Commissioner for the River Murray. Mr Beasley's appointment is so important to South Australia and so important to the health of the river in general. As we push for real action on the River Murray, and as we aim to get past significant numbers of years of the river being ignored and the health of the river and the commitments in the Murray in the Royal in the Murray Darling Royal Basin Plan. <coughs> Sorry, frogging me throat. <coughs> the commitment uh, over ten years that just has not been delivered. The Commissioner is going to make a fundamental difference to how this is going to be dealt with. We've heard from um, Peter Malinowskis, the South Australian Premier, and he believes that this appointment, and I'll quote, sends a clear message that South Australia is serious about defending our water rights and protecting the river, including delivering on the 450 gigalitres that were promised but not delivered. Now, as I've said numerous times in this chamber before, the Murray River is the lifeblood of South Australia. The agricultural sector, the community, the environment are all dependent on the river. And all can live together in harmony if we have enough water in the river to keep it healthy. If we stop that flow and we do not allow the river to be healthy, then our agricultural sector will not thrive either. This is not a binary decision about whether we wish to prioritise the environment or whether we wish to prioritise agriculture. This is a scenario where we need to have everything working in harmony. Delivery of that water is critical. And I have a huge amount of faith in Richard Beasley and I have a huge amount of faith in what the South Australian government has committed to in terms of his role. Now, his role will encompass a whole range of engagements, including working with community, working with the federal government, helping secure that flow that has been promised to South Australia for so long. From the Lower Lakes, the Coorong, across the whole gamut of the river, his work will make a fundamental difference. It will help us get that water. And now that we have a federal government who is determined also to deliver on the promises in the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, I have great hope, great hope that the South Australian government, the federal Labor government and the commissioner and the relevant ministers can, between them, in concert with the stakeholders and with those people whose lives depend upon that river, can work together to get an outcome that will protect the environment and will also protect our agricultural sector. I look forward to working very closely on this project that uh, Mr Beasley is about to engage in 
and I really look forward to us seeing some genuine outcomes delivered and reported on in this place about how we will improve the health of the River Murray. Thank you. Senator, Senator Canavan. President, uh, uh, I'd like to, to, uh, to ring a warning uh, bell this evening, a, a warning bell that should be uh, ringing a lot louder <clears throat> than it is uh, across uh, our land, uh, uh, because last week uh, uh, energy regulators, our major energy regulator, the Australian Energy Market Operator, revealed that we can't guarantee that the lights will stay on in Australia over the next three years. We're a developed nation. We're a nation blessed uh, with energy uh, reserves, the world's largest uh, coal and liquefied natural gas uh, exporter. Yet in the next three years, we cannot guarantee to Australians that their lights will stay on. It is a damning indictment of the policy settings that have been, uh, we've been obsessed with over the past decade in this place. I've been critical of my own side on those settings. We've been obsessed with installing unreliable renewable energy, and our energy system is about to crash unless we do something about it. Uh, we are installing solar and wind in Australia faster than anywhere else in the world, by, by many margins. Don't listen to the rhetoric from the new government on the other side that somehow the coalition government didn't invest in renewable energy. That is a lie. That is a total dead set lie. Uh, we are installing, and the Australian Energy Market Operator also said this uh, a few weeks ago in their integrated system plan, we are installing solar and wind at a rate four times higher than in Europe or North America here in Australia. We have retired 4.1 gigawatts of reliable power over the past decade, dispatchable power in the, in the jargon. That's, that's about four major power stations. Um, and we have only replaced that uh, with less than one gigawatt of reliable power. We've got a reliability deficit in this country. When the sun sets and the wind doesn't blow, we are in big trouble. In this latest Australian Energy Market Operator report, they say that over the next three years, three states will fall into deficit in being able to meet the reliability standards to keep the lights on all the time in this country. First South Australia next year, they're first on the chopping block, then Victoria, and then the year after that, finally New South Wales as well. Later Queensland also so has some issues later in the decade. We need to change now and change fast. Yet instead, this new government is doubling down uh, on the failed policies of the last decade, the failed policies in Europe, the failed policies in California. As I speak today, California has had blackouts. Another nation, another region leading the world in renewable energy, uh, doing so well. Uh, we are doubling down on this despite the warnings of people like Paul Broad, who has resigned as the CEO of Snowy Hydro because the new minister, Chris Bowen, won't listen to common sense. Won't listen to common sense. And if the lights do go out in the next three years, if we do get blackouts, they're, they're, we can blame one group of people in here. There is one group of people we can blame is the Australian Labor Party who are ignoring the expert advice. Chris Bowen is clearly ignoring the advice of Paul Broad, who has said to him in no uncertain terms, he said publicly since in an interview with the ABC, that green hydrogen cannot be added to the curry curry gas plant next year. Uh, and we should proceed with that gas plant just on gas to start with as per the original plan. Instead, Chris Bowen has effectively sacked uh, Paul Broad, and the rumours around the industry is that he was effectively told to go by the minister. The um, um, totally scandalous intervention, ministerial intervention on what should be an independent statutory authority. He's ignoring that advice and pers persisting with a technology which has not been tried anywhere, putting in hydrogen to a gas plant. We don't even know if it's going to be safe. It's a very flammable material. This is ridiculous. Uh, we need to keep our lights on. Further than that, too, further to that, uh, I give credit to Paul Broad for having the courage uh, to resign his position instead of being asked to do something that he knew uh, would increase risk and not deliver results for the Australian people. But he's further advised the Australian people in an interview that in not, not just curry curry, we should be building more gas plants, more than just curry curry. And that is clearly shown in this Australian Energy Market Operator report I started my contribution with tonight. That report says we have inadequate uh, investments in reliable power in the years ahead to guarantee electricity supplies. When are we going to listen? When are we going to wake up? Uh, are we going to wait until we have another South Australia and the lights go out everywhere? Are we going to wait until thousands of more manufacturing jobs leave these shores uh, for, to, to benefit the Chinese Communist Party and Vladimir, Vladimir Putin's Russia? Are we going to wait until we end up in a situation like the United Kingdom is facing now, where people's electricity bills, energy bills for this year are 6,200 Australian dollars, 3,549 pounds. 
and they're, they're es estimated to go to over $10,000 Australian over the next year. Are we going to wait until Australians are suffering in poverty and energy deficiencies before we act and make common sense decisions to guarantee the basic essentials in a developed country blessed with energy resources? Senator Steelejohn. Tonight, to use my voice in this place on behalf of the community of Western Australia to urge Labor. Do not continue uh, with your plans to give $243.5 billion to billionaires. From the university student living in the Perth CBD uh, to the dad living in Bassendine to the FIFO worker I met at my local shop uh, in Baldivis, all are united. Uh, billionaires do not need more money from this government. Not now, not ever. Labor's plan, the so-called Stage 3 tax cut, uh, would see them give, again, of, just for the record, folks, $243.5 billion with a B uh, over uh, to the mega-wealthy over the course of the next 10 years. It is hard to imagine just how big that amount of money is. So let me break it down uh, for those following along tonight. With that money, uh, we could end homelessness, build enough accessible housing in the next 10 years to ensure that every single person on the public housing waiting list has a home to live in. And we could improve the mental health and well-being of our community, investing in prevention, ensuring everyone has access to a psychiatrist, a psychologist or a peer worker, with cost being no barrier. And in addition to that, we could give everyone the opportunity to go to the dentist and get the services they need to put a smile back on their face. And we would still, after all of that, have money left over uh, to be able to do the additional things, uh, to increase the level of pension support payments, for instance. We would, together as a community, have the ability to provide a home, support, free mental care, trips to the dentist, uh, for me, for you, for everybody that is eligible for Medicare, and there would still be money left over. This parliament, this parliament is all about choices, and Labor is choosing to side uh, with the billionaires instead of providing the community with the things we need right now. Now, getting dental care uh, is considered or well, is made to feel um, like a luxury. It is out of reach for too many uh, members of our community, and it is simply, it is simply too expensive. Now, this is, a, this is a political choice. The system has been designed in a way that locks people out. I have heard from members of the community particularly in Western Australia, uh, that they have been unable to eat properly, have missed work due to tooth pain. They have delayed the removal, for instance, of their wisdom teeth, living for months uh, with head and neck pain as they attempt to save up the hundreds of dollars necessary for the treatment. They have, had teeth uh, they have failed to have teeth removed, uh, not been able to have them replaced uh, because they could not afford uh, restorative work um, or a new tooth. And are sitting right now uh, with a seriously loose uh, set of teeth, for instance, uh, with their only current avenue uh, to hope that it does not fall out. Our community deserves better than this. It is time for Medicare to be expanded to include our teeth. The Greens have a plan to make dental care free. We must move to a universal dental system that tackles dental disease proactively. Everybody uh, could go to the dentist for free uh, under this scheme, ending the worry of paying for dental services. Importantly, it would include a broad range of services. So whether you have a tooth that needs restoring, a cavity that needs filling, or your kid needs orthodontic work, the Greens want it to be covered by Medicare. 
If you're listening and thinking to yourself, well, that sounds nice, but it's surely not possible. I am here tonight to tell you that it is. It is a matter of choices. And the Labour Party has a big choice to make. Right now, they are choosing to continue with their plan to give over $243 million to billionaires. That is more than three times the amount that it would cost to give everyone free dental care. Shame on them. Shame. Senator Polly. I rise to speak about the care economy and the work of Professor Rajiv Kashler and his work in robotics and innovation space. The tireless work of Professor Koshler and other stakeholders is now coming to fruition after more than a decade of hard work and professionalism and a commitment to helping people within our community. The work of Professor Koshler started many years ago at the La Trobe University and now is the CEO of Human Centred Innovations. Professor Koshler's work is cutting edge and he has accomplished things that no one else has done before. So it's something that you and the team should be very proud of. More importantly, he is improving the dementia journey for many and bringing joy to people living with a dementia diagnosis. It doesn't matter your age. We all want to experience the joy at different times in our lives. And Just because you have a dementia or you have a disability diagnosis does not mean you can't experience joy and fulfilment in your day. During my advocacy over the many years within the aged care sector and as the Centre for Tasmania and as the former Assistant Shadow Minister for Aged Care, I have mentioned Matilda and Professor Cashler to countless people. I do admit, though, that Matilda is often difficult to describe to people how exactly she functions and what she brings to someone's day-to-day -day experiences without seeing her in action firsthand. Matilda isn't just a social assistive uh, robot. She is an embodiment of a decade of research and development, an embodiment of the people who created her. I think it's fair to say that you, uh, Professor Kassler, has developed Mat Matilda in your own image. She's intelligent, innovative, caring and compassionate. Therefore, I think it would be reasonable to say that she's almost a sentient being. She has the qualities of a human being. She responds to what she interprets and perceives in her surroundings. And those interactions with individuals shape her ability to help who is in front of her and who will utilise what she can offer in the future. Matilda isn't just Professor Kessler and his team's um, innovation. It's an empowering tool for individuals, families, researchers, business and the sector, and it inspires them all to do better, to strive to make aged care better, to strive to improve dementia-friendly communities. The government believes that every older strain deserves love and care in their senior years. Our parents and our grandparents deserve to have someone or Matilda to sit and engage with so they can feel wanted, needed and, most importantly, respected. A study found that Matilda can remind people living with dementia about their daily schedules, communicate to them the news of the day, the weather, engage with them through music and bring back those memories that are still deep within them. We can't just look at Matilda in a binary way. She is multifaceted because she can also provide respite for carers. In the disability sector, she has improved the social and communication skills of children with autism. Matilda is working in the care economy, and by the sounds of it, she is like every aged care worker across the country. She deserves a pay rise. For those who want to know more about this innovative and evidence-based research, the findings have been published in the International Journal of Human-Computer Interaction. So I would like to congratulate Professor Kossler and the team, of human, uh, the team at Human Centred Innovations for continuing to involve and progress Matilda and her work. And already she can now, they've advanced that much more that she can uh, interact without being online. Uh, she can speak 34 languages. So this is really innovative when it comes to people that are on that dementia journey when they revert back to their first language. It's encouraging, it's inspiring. But I think it also says um, something about 
this government, the Albanese government, that we are about reforms. We want to improve the aged care sector. We want Professor Kassler's plan for further innovation to work in unison. We have a strong ambition to provide high quality and dignified care for older people and people with disabilities. This will not happen overnight, but we have started the process and it will be a journey that we will see through to the end. And I encourage people in this chamber and anyone else that's listening to invest a bit of time because Matilda, my husband, has already said he wants one as we age at home. I think it's a fantastic tool and I congratulate Thanks. them for all their work and research. Thank you, Senator Polly. Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. It's been cold here in Canberra, but when it's cold like this in Tasmania, that's when Tasmania really hits its stride. The ground might be covered in slippery white frost, the days are shorter and the thermometer hits minus territory, but that's when Tasmanians come out to play. Instincts might tell us to stay in and rug up, but anyone who has visited Tasmania during the cooler months knows getting outside to enjoy the state's cultural events has become a popular winter pastime. Mainlanders and international travellers are following Tourism Tasmania's advice to come down for air in droves. Marketed to visitors as the off-season, the most recent tourism campaign positions the state as a must-do winter experience. Not only does this support our tourism and hospitality industries, both of which were hit hard during the COVID-19 pandemic, but it shows off Tasmania's wintry attractions to a new audience, or to those who already know how good a winter party can be. Celebrating Tasmania's cool climate has been a tourism campaign winner since the late 1800s. The state was marketed as a health destination for mainland Australians and visitors from India and England escaping warmer climes. Indeed, the Tasmanian Government Tourist Bureau promoted the opportunity to cool off in Tasmania in 1929. This tourism campaign by artist Harry Kelly features a man pointing to a th thermometer hitting 62.3 degrees Fahrenheit or around 17 degrees Celsius. The same artist produced the Switzerland of the South poster for the Bureau in the 1930s, which depicted Mount Ida and Lake St Clair. Some of the biggest attractions are our winter festivals, where we don our Tassie tuxedos, huddle around log fires and watch as creativity comes out of the dark. Starting the winter festival season with a bang was Dark Mofo's 2020, 2022, offering a resurrection, which celebrated the opportunity to come together again after the forced isolation of COVID lockdowns. Dark Mofo included the winter feast and live performances of dance, song and light that culminated in the nude solstice swim. Crowds flocked to Dark Mofo events at both ends of the state this year, with more than 300,000 attending festival venues. Visitor numbers in 2022 were just shy of 2019's pre-COVID levels. Revenue generated topped $3.5 million and of Dark, Folk, Mo, Dark Mofo's 45 ticketed events, 65 per cent were brought by interstate visitors. The revenue and visitor statistics from Dark Mofo alone show just how popular Tasmania is in winter. But the cold season is not just about Dark Mofo. There is much more on offer throughout winter. Festival of Voices take up the baton with a mission to improve lives through singing. This was the event that started the idea of celebrating Tasmanian winter culture 17 years ago. In fact, Tourism Industry Council Tasmania Chief, Chief Executive Luke Martin considers this festival of song, choirs, composers and stories to be the unsung hero of winter tourism. Then there is the Huon Valley Midwinter Fest at Willie Smith's in Grove, with live music, poetry, storytelling and the wassail ceremony to awaken the Huon's apple trees as the bonfire crackles and Big Willie burns. The temperature drops again for the biennial Australian Antarctic Festival in Hobart, the gateway to Antarctica. This festival aims to inspire Antarctic adventures and careers while sharing stories about the pioneer who explored the continent and raise awareness of the work to conserve Mawson's huts. Smaller in size to the other events but big on flavour, the Tassie Scallop Fiesta celebrates the North East region's fishing and maritime heritage. There is plenty of produce to eat and drink, chef demonstrations and wine masterclasses, live music and a full program of fringe events. Science and art come to the fore during the Beaker Street Festival in August. This event challenges our ideas about the way the world works and allows us to engage with scientists and innovative art at talks, dinners and join the Tassie Science Road Trip. 
Science of a different kind steps up during Tasmanian Whiskey Week. More than 30 of Tasmania's whisky distilleries share their stories and spirits with whisky lovers via tastings, dinners, meet the maker events and the Tasmanian Spirits Showcase. And this year, for the first time, the Winter Light Festival was held in Hobart at the Salamanca Arts Centre during August. This arts festival was created to attract a new demographic to Tasmania by celebrating the end of winter and the coming of the light. These events have truly transformed what was traditionally Tasmanians quiet, Tasmania's quiet and dormant off-season, providing a welcome glow for visitors near and far. Thank you. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Given that you fellas always want black fellas to provide cultural awareness training for you all, Today, I thought I'd teach you a little bit about our language and our culture. Today, I'll talk about the term gammon. Labor are really great at being gammon. They got that down pat, committing to 43 per cent emissions reduction while opening up over 46,000 square kilometres of our ocean for oil and gas exploration, now that's gammon. Approving the Barossa project gas drilling in a marine protected zone despite the clear opposition of Tiwi Island traditional owners, that's gammon. Committing to 43 per cent emissions reduction and protection of cultural heritage while fracking in the Beedaloo Basin, poisoning our water. That's gammon. Committing to First Nations justice and protection of cultural heritage while approving the Perdamon fertiliser plant on the Burrup Peninsula, railroading traditional owners and destroying sacred Murujuga art sites, art sites which are under consideration for, get it, World Heritage Listing. Well, Labor, you're too gammon. Committing to give First Nations people a voice to parliament, but not actually listening to traditional owners, that's gammon. Saying black lives matter and talking about closing gaps and reducing Aboriginal deaths in custody, while well, three decades have passed, since the 1991 Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody, with no indication from this new government, the new deadly Labor government, no indication when they're going to review those recommendations that they never implemented when they were last in power, which is however long ago that was. Not only that, they have never given us any information about implementing them. That is completely gammon. And talking about achieving justice for First Nations people, but not committing to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and free, prior and informed consent, not even having a reporting date for what we've been fighting for, for how long to have our rights observed and respected in this country, the new Labor government, they're trying to push it down the road as far as they can because they know what it means for First Nations people. And that shows how gammon Labor really are. Gammon, if you haven't worked it out in our little cultural awareness session this evening in the Senate, is pretending. Gammon is fake. Gammon is pretending that you're, you're someone's friend when you're actually not. You become gammon. Well, the Greens aren't gammon because we, what we say we actually act upon and what we say is what we mean. And we'll put our bodies on the front line to protect country, but Labor, because they're so gammon, they won't do that. Labor will wave the flag and have Black Lives Matter posted on the front windows 
of their electorate office, yet they're stabbing us in the back at the same time. That's gammon. Well, for those gammon Labor mob that want to continue to be gammon and wear your, your Aboriginal earrings and Aboriginal flag T-shirts and look all deadly looking like an ally, it's actually gammon. And blackfellas see right through gammon allies who pretend to be our friends while they destroy the very essence of who we are as First Nations people in this country. So, Labor, give up the gammonness and get on with the real action. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I have a confession to make, and I would confess my sins in a church, but Lambie's in a church and worrying about the ceiling falling in. I tell you, it's a bit too much. So I've made a mistake. In the my first days of the last parliament, I was asked to vote on the Morrison government's tax cuts. Stages one, two and three all together, in a bunch. No splitting, no picking and choosing, all or nothing. One, two and three. And in case you missed it, I supported the package. I want to, I want to run through why. This is what I said in my speech on the tax cut bill before the vote happened. If the economy gets worse between now and then, as this has, it takes a week to change the tax rates. If in six years' time the economy can't handle a huge tax cut, then people expect their politicians to say so, be upfront and be honest. If the risk is too big to justify, people will understand rolling it back or putting it on hold for the time being. The only way you can think that the worst bits of this tax bill are permanent is if you believe that nobody in this place can do the right thing and the responsible thing. I am not prepared to give up on the possibility that Parliament can show a little bit of guts and do the right thing when the time is right. I am not prepared to walk away from tax cuts for low-income workers starting next week, simply because we don't know if we'll be able to afford tax cuts for everybody else five years from now. If we can't afford it then, we don't go ahead. It is that simple." End quote. I look back at those words now and I think how optimistic I was. On the other hand, I say how bloody naive I was. But I, simply, but I sincerely thought at the time that there's no way a government would barrel through on a tax cut that the budget could not afford. Fast forward five years and look what we have. Look what, where we are. A government barrelling through on a tax cut the budget can't afford. It's not even a tax cut they like. They agree it's bad for the budget, they agree it's bad for the economy, and yet they're still doing it. They say it's not their policy, but when you're given the chance to change something and you decide to keep things the way they are, then your policy is to keep things the way they are. This is actually not, a comp this is not complicated. If Labor put a bill into the Senate today to delay or amend those stage three tax cuts, it would pass without you even breaking a sweat. Easy job, no worries. But you know what? They won't. And I think that's really, really bad policy. So why are they insisting on inflicting bad policy on the Australian public and the Australian economy? What's the point? This puts the budget further into the red. We're told we can't afford anything because Labor's got a budget mess to clean up. It's like a garbage bag has split and fallen all over the floor in your kitchen and you're wiping down the bag. Fair go. Don't forget, this is the government that started this parliament saying we have to cut crossbench staff by 75 per cent to save $3 million a year, but they're going to plough through with a tax cut that are going to cost $3 million an hour. Ugh, you've got to be kidding me. But look, I said I made a mistake and I did. The mistake was backing the tax cuts. The mistake was believing five years into the future we'd have a government with a bit of guts and to show some courage. If this it's this Labor government that is being handed the keys to stop the cuts coming through, and they're too goddamn scared to take them out of their jeans pocket. Fair go. You don't get to say that just because the other team legislated them. Somehow you're completely helpless to do anything about it, because that's rubbish. When Labor won the election, they wanted to be more ambitious on climate change, so they increased the emissions reductions target. The previous government didn't want a Royal Commission into robo-debt. Labor did, so they called one. The previous government didn't want to, integrate, to increase the skilled migration target. Labor, Labor did. So guess what? You changed it. Hip, hip, hooray. 
They changed things because they wanted things to change. You wanted things to change. They're not changing stage three tax cuts because they don't want things to change. Not because they can't. I want every Australian person out there to know. Not because they can't, because they do not have the will. They don't want to. They're too frightened to. They don't have the guts to. Three months in, three months in, they don't want to remove those stage three tax cuts because they don't have the courage and because they know that is the best thing forward for this country in the economic climate we're in right now. Lacks the guts three months in. I can tell you now, if you're not going to change the state three tax cuts because you don't want to change, you don't want things to change, that's a decision for the Labor Party, but you wear it. Thank you, Senator Lambie. Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Prior to the election, the coalition government was supporting our regions and agriculture sector with record levels of funding for water infrastructure. This investment was especially critical in my home state of Queensland, yeah, yeah. where there have been, I don't think, a single dam built in um, the last 20 years. And when you think of the record amount of rain that has fallen on our state and gone to waste during this La Nina cycle, would it not make uh, sense? to invest in water infrastructure to improve water security and drought resilience. At present, the jewel in the crown of Queensland water projects is undoubtedly Urana Dam, which the former coalition government supported to the tune of $498 million. This 970,000 megalitre dam is part of the visionary Urana scheme, which includes the Bowen Renewable Energy Hub, the largest renewable baseload energy project in North Australia. Once operational, it will generate over 1,400 megawatts and reduce carbon emissions. The pumped hydroelectric plant has a storage capacity of eight hours and is co-located with solar, wind and a hydro electrolyzer to support export-scale hydrogen production. Not only this, but Urana Dam will feed the 20,000 hectare Collinsville Irrigation Scheme. This will deliver affordable water for the agriculture sector and open up opportunities to grow high-value crops on a large scale and facilitate export opportunities. Water security enables communities in central Queensland to drive economic growth within their local economies and create long-term jobs in the regions. Urana Dam alone will create 1,800 ongoing jobs. However, the benefits will be felt far beyond central and north Queensland, with the project to deliver $10.5 billion in economic benefits to Australia. Given all these benefits, <coughs> it is exciting to see investment interest flowing in from all over the world. Danish fund Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners are in advanced talks to partner in the project, which would power up to half a million Queensland homes. Copenhagen Infrastructure has identified the Bowen Hub's component as one of the most promising investments type of its one, one of the most promising investments of its type in Queensland and is working closely with Bowen River Utilities and Renewable Energy Partners on co-development and equity partnerships. This is the future of water and energy in the great state of Queensland. This is na nation building infrastructure that any good government will support. So I call on the Albanese government and the state Labor government in Queensland to support the Urana project in whatever way it is required to get it built. Queensland's future prosperity depends on it. The project stacks up. It is good for Queensland. It is good for Australia. Let's get Urana Dam built. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. On uh, the Saturday just gone, I had the absolute honour of attending the opening of an exhibition called The Public Exhibition on Crimes of Communism, hosted by the Vietnamese Community in Australia, Queensland Chapter, and also World Victims of Communism Association of Australia, Inc. It was a great honour to attend that exhibition and to make some comments at the opening. Just as it is an honour every 30 April for me to attend as my, in my capacity as a senator to the commemoration of the fall of Saigon to the communists on 30 April 1975, and just as it was a great honour, a deep honour, to be presented by my good friend Dr Quang Bui, a M, a colour with the tie, with a tie, I should say, with the colours of the Republic of Vietnam, which is still worn, uh, still worn with great honour and dignity by members of our Vietnamese community in Queensland. 
Dr Bui has been an extraordinary leader for the Vietnamese community and the broader multicultural community and the whole Australian community in my home state of Queensland. He fled Vietnam many years ago in 1975. He knows many, many individuals who lost their lives during that flee from communism in 1975 and subsequently. At the exhibition, Mr Acting Deputy President, you can see the horrors of communism. From photos of people who were seized from the Baltic state of Estonia and sent to starve in the Gulag Archipelago in the Soviet Union, from the killing fields of Cambodia to the devastating consequences of the so-called Great Leap Forward in China, where millions upon millions of people died in the devastating famine which was triggered by the policies of the Communist Party of China, through to the Gulag Archipelago, through to a Hungarian flag which, which was on display, which had the hammer and sickle carved out of the centre so that the, the Hungarian flag had a hole in the centre, which is, of course, the flag that was used by those who rose up in Hungary against the Communists in 1956. And perhaps, perhaps most movingly, we heard a presentation from a Hong Kong de democracy activist who told us about the horror of what is happening on the ground in Hong Kong today under the rule of the Communist Party of China. So at the exhibition, Mr Acting Deputy President, I made a number of reflections in relation to the exhibition. First, in relation to the inherent evil of communism and how it is anathema, absolute anathema, to the fundamental freedoms of the individual, the freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of association, freedoms which all of us in this place hold sacred. How the evil of communism is totally anathema to the family as the essential building block of our society, which puts the state above all else in our society. And how the evil of communism is anathema to economic progress and prosperity. The second reflection I made was that Australia has become the home to so many people and generations that have, uh, that have lived and prospered here who have fled the horrors of communism, whether it was from those Baltic states, including Estonia that I referred to, from Poland, from Hungary, from Soviet Union, from Vietnam, from Laos, from Cambodia from Cuba, from other countries all over the world that have had suffered the scourge of communism. So many people have lost their lives fleeing communism, including hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese. The third reflection I made was the importance of the exhibition in terms of shining a bright light on the horrors of communism. And in that respect, I had a conversation with a member of the Vietnamese community called Tony who was explaining to me how he is in the process with support from the United States government of exhuming the remains of one of his family members from a re-education camp gravesite in Vietnam, modern-day Vietnam, and that that is occurring in darkness at night because the Vietnamese government doesn't want photos to be taken of the exhumation. And that surely is the best example of why it is necessary to have exhibitions such as this to shine a bright light on the evils of communism and all those who have suffered from communism over generations. So I say to the people of my home state of Queensland, take your children to see this exhibition. Take your children to see this exhibition and show them the horrors of communism. But not only that, not only that, Take your children to see this exhibition so that they can talk to the survivors of communism and what they experienced and how much it means to them that they've found safety in our beautiful country of Australia. And I should note, Mr Acting Deputy President, I said a few words earlier in the week about the fact that the Greens member for Ryan, Ms Elizabeth Watson-Brown, refuses to display the Australian flag in her electorate office refuses to display the Australian flag in her electorate office. That's the member for Ryan, Ms Elizabeth Watson-Brown, MP. 
And my good friend Senator McGrath has drawn attention to this fact that Ms Elizabeth Watson Brown, MP, member for Ryan, refuses, refuses to display the Australian flag in her electorate office. Well, I suggest through you, Mr Acting Deputy President, that Ms Elizabeth Watson Brown should make her way, should make her way to that exhibition against the communism, the evils of, of the evils of communism. Ms Elizabeth Watson Brown, MP, member for Ryan, who refuses to display the Australian flag in her electorate office, should go to that exhibition, which is being put on by the Vietnamese community in Queensland. She should go to that exhibition, she should consider that exhibition, and she should consider the fact, she should consider the fact that the Vietnamese community at that exhibition is proudly flying the Australian flag. And the fact that I and Mr Milton Dick MP, member of the other party in the, uh, in the other place, speaker of the other place, presented, presented the Vietnamese community with an Australian flag that had flown in this chamber, in this chamber, and the Vietnamese community, though that wonderful community, hundreds of thousands of people who have made their way and prospered in this country, who sought refuge and gained refuge in this country, they, they are displaying our beautiful Australian flag in that community centre, because they understand the significance of the flag, and they understand what it means to them, because this country provided them with safety. And how appalling is it? How appalling is it that the Greens member for Ryan, the Greens member for Ryan, Ms. Elizabeth Watson Brown, refuses refuses to display the Australian flag in her electorate office, when the Vietnamese community across the river in Dara at their community centre is displaying proudly with honour an Australian flag that has flown in this Senate chamber, in this Senate chamber, because they, our Vietnamese community, appreciate the values of this country and what it represents to all those people who have fled from persecution and the evils of communism and other extreme authoritarian regimes all over the world. They appreciate the significance of that flag, our Vietnamese community, Dr. Bui who Milton Dick MP and I presented the flag to, they appreciate the significance of that flag, but the Greens MP for Ryan, Ms Elizabeth Watson-Brown, can't bear to display the flag in her electorate office. What an absolute disgrace. What an absolute disgrace. So I say to Ms Elizabeth Watson-Brown, Greens MP for Ryan, come across the river to Dara. It used to be in the federal electorate of Ryan. It used to be in the federal electorate of Ryan. Hopefully it is at the time of the next federal election, because I look forward to talking to the Vietnamese community about Ms Elizabeth Watson Brown, Brown, MP, who refuses to display the Australian flag, so she can see the significance of that flag to one of our wonderful communities who found refuge in this beautiful country from persecution. So, Mr Acting Deputy President, we should always remember, we should always remember the horrors of communism, the evil of communism, the 100 million people who have died at the hands of communism. We should all, always remember. We should always remember that so many people found refuge from communism in our beautiful country, and we should we should acknowledge and honour our wonderful Vietnamese community who have been so successful, so successful in our beautiful country since fleeing from communism, and are now part of our wonderful Australian story. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Okay, uh, thank you, Acting uh, uh, Mr. President. <clears throat> uh, tonight, I just want to uh, basically talk again about the lack of safety testing that was carried out with the vaccines, uh, and I also want to discuss the biochemistry once again because there's a lot more uh, elements that I need to discuss that I didn't get to last time. Uh, if you want to look at my last clip, you can still see it on my website, um, but I will recap just the, the finer points of it. Effectively, this, this vaccine produces a spike protein. It's uh, unlike a normal vaccine that produces 28 proteins and the virus uh, that has 29 proteins in it. This uh, vaccine only takes one of those proteins. Now, because of that, it is a much, much smaller molecule and it can cross fire the endothelium uh, into the capillaries uh, and go throughout the bloodstream. And we know that because in the uh, TGA non-clinical report on page 45 was a distribution table of the rats where it showed the distribution of the spike protein throughout the oh, sorry not the spike protein my apologies of the lipid nanoparticle throughout all the organs in the actual rat. I did say spike protein, but that's not true because they never actually tested the spike protein at all. 
I mean, that's like testing a bomb without the actual explosives inside of it. What is the point of actually testing the vaccine if you didn't put the spike protein in it? No, what they did was they used a benign enzyme called luciferase and they tested that in the rats. Um, but anyway, long story short, went throughout the whole body, despite the fact that we were told initially that it was only going to stay close to the injection site. Now, the second point we need to note out, and I'm going to come back to this in a minute, is the fact that they used this process called transfection. Now, what that means is it bypasses, this is a, uh, makes the lipid catatonic, cationic, cationic, I'll get it wrong again, cationic, and means it bypasses the ACE receptor and the transmembrane serine protein that is required for the virus to actually enter the cell. So, therefore, it is a lot more infectious. Okay, the other thing is that the protein that they did deliver, the spike protein, is not the same as the spike protein in the vaccine, uh, in the virus, sorry. The vaccine spike protein replaced uh, uridine with a synthetic molecule that's not found naturally in the human body called methyl pseudouridine. Uh, now, studies showed they used that because they wanted to avoid uh, evade the immune system when the actual lipid nanoparticle was delivered to the cell membrane, uh, step one, and it was also shown to have greater self-amplifying properties, which, in other words, it made more of the protein. It also had another 70 adene uh, a nucleotide stuck to its polytail, which meant it lasted a lot longer in the body, and it also had two proline insertions, prolines and amino acid, in position 986 and 987 to give it greater strength and stability. Right? So, in other words, it's going to take longer to break down in your body uh, than the normal virus. Um, now, the other thing that we need to touch on is in the studies, they actually showed that your body delivered an IG, uh, IgG response, uh, which is the antibody that you see that you know, basically is your prime antibody in your blood. Uh, now, the problem with that is, is that it's a respiratory airborne virus, so it comes down through your mucosal system, and your, your predominant antibody in your uh, mucosal system uh, is your immunoglobin A. So it's all very well getting an immunoglobin G response or a T cell response, but that's only one half of the equation. The other half of the equation is, is that you need to see that it's actually going to sterilise the antigen. Right? It's like a football team. You know, my son's football team runs off the field and I say, how did you go, son? And he said, oh, we scored 10 points. Well, that's great, but what we need to know is, is that he actually beat the other side. So if the other side got 30 points, does, you know, it doesn't mean that you won. So you can produce an antibody, but it's got to be, you've got to demonstrate that it actually sterilised the antigen. Now, so I touched on that before and I'll leave it at that. But what I want to touch on is some of the press cracked it last time when I actually spoke about this because I made the mistake of actually comparing the lipids to sausages and they thought I oversimplified that issue. Now, I should just clarify, that wasn't actually my terminology. That was the terminology of the head of the TGA, Professor Skerritt, that he used towards me, uh, said to me in uh, estimates. And I'm just going to quote uh, what he said to me. Uh, I, I asked the question. Uh, uh, you know, about the lipids, and he goes, the dose of lipids in the vaccine is below the threshold that, in, that internationally is assessed for genotoxicity and carcinogenic, uh, carcinogenics. So, in other words, you know, yet again, I've said this before, they didn't test it for genotoxicity uh, and, and, and basically cancer. Now, these lipids, this is, this is where Skerritt has misled, Professor Skerritt, uh, head of the TGI, has misled me. These lipids are commonly used in a range of other human therapeutics and even at a higher and higher level, there isn't evidence of anything. Now, let me say this. An absence of evidence isn't uh, evidence of absence. Okay? You need to demonstrate that there are no ill effects. But then he goes on to say that the lipids are hyd hydrolyzed uh, and, and destroyed by the bo uh, body fairly rapidly, as are dietary lipids, uh, and they are distributed through a range of parts of the body, as are lipids, that if you have a sausage or steak for breakfast. Okay? So before you start having a crack at me, uh, Ray Hadley and Alice Wokeman. Uh, just make sure you go and actually read what was said in estimates initially. Now, the reason why Professor Skerritt has actually misled me on that is that right here I have documents right from Pfizer on their website, uh, and it talks about how they developed their own raw materials to ensure a steady supply for the COVID vaccine. Okay, so it goes on to say that a, a Melissa French, who worked for Pfizer, got the message Pfizer needed large quantities of something called a cationic lipid that was critical to the COVID vaccine. This isn't an everyday lipid that's readily available. Well, 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 well. So we've got Pfizer actually admitting on their own website that the everyday lipid that's been, or the lipid that's been used isn't, isn't an everyday lipid. So when Professor Skerritt said that it's something that you know, is in your sausage or steak and it's you know, been used in higher levels previously, that is not correct. And this article, goes on to say how the, the Pfizer team had to work overtime to actually get this lipid 
uh, into production and get it manufactured. So I find it a very concerning that Professor Skerritt would mislead uh, a senator in estimates on that. But we need to talk a little bit further about this, these cationic uh, charged lipids, okay? Because they can be toxic. They're known, or they can uh, disrupt the mitochondrial cellular respiration that's responsible for consuming oxygen for producing energy. If this activity is disrupted, then the oxygen is not reduced all the way to water and instead to some intermediaries, which are called reactive oxygen species. Okay? Wow, big term, right? Now, reactive oxygen species are intrinsic to cellular functioning and are present at low and stationary levels in normal cells. However, these can cause irreversible damage to DNA as they oxidise and modify some cellular components and prevent them from performing their original functions. This suggests they have a dual role and, and they can be harmful or protective uh, depending on the balance between their production and disposal at the right time and place. Now, we've got to ask the question why this wasn't tested in humans before it was rolled out. Before it was rolled out. But that's, you know, this, there isn't anything new to this. If we go and look at uh, TGA Disclosure Log 2387, there's a risk management plan that these guys came up with in January 2021. And I just want to go to Table 3, uh, and this, of course, is off the TGA website, so Facebook fact checkers don't get upset for actually quoting uh, Pfizer's own source documents and the TGA's own source documents. Table 3, a summary of safety concerns in the EU RMP. Okay. Important identified risks, anaphylaxis, important potential risks. Vaccine associated enhanced disease, right? Lovely, charming. So they actually knew about this, and the response to all this was to actually, even though that they knew this was a risk, uh, is to basically, uh, now what did they say, go on and say here? It could lead to uh, adverse responses, and it needs to be carefully evaluated once a COVID vaccine rollout commences. Now, I don't know about you, but if there is a risk of having a vaccine-enhanced disease, wouldn't you actually test it before the rollout commenced? Uh, and I'll just give you another brief uh, description of what vaccine-associated enhanced disease occurs when an individual who has received a vaccine develops a more severe presentation of that disease when subsequently, subsequently exposed to that virus. Now, this is a well-known phenomenon with dengue fever. There's four different strains of dengue fever. If you get one strain of dengue fever, then your body will uh, basically produce antibodies to that. If you then get another strain of that dengue fever later on, those initial antibodies will kick in, but, but because it's a different strain, your immune system won't react the way it should as quickly as it should. And that's because the different strain will have a different spike protein. Now, with all these different mutations going around at the moment, if you keep boosting in, you basically run the risk of pathogen priming, okay, which is effectively where you know, the, uh, uh, the viruses that mutate have a greater chance of surviving because your body has only got the antibodies to the initial spike protein and not the nuclear capsid. So you should always have antibodies to not just the S protein, but the N protein. And if you look at people who have gone and got their antibody testing after they had COVID, they have antibodies to both the S and N uh, uh, protein. And that's very, very important. So anyway, look, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I'm just about to run out of time, and it looks like I'll have to come back for another session next week. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. Today I have the privilege of sharing four stories of people who are struggling to survive on meagre in income support payments and navigating our broken social security system. To start, here is Nicholas's story, in their words, about living on income support. Hello, my name is Nicholas. I'm 24 years old. And unfortunately, in 2020, just before full COVID lockdowns, I was diagnosed with a prolactinoma. It's a brain tumour on the pituitary gland. They found it, as I was having and still do have constant head pain, headaches, migraines, pressure and nausea. I've been on JobSeeker since, as I've had to stop working full time and also studying. I've applied for the disability pension three times now, and I've been declined every time, as there is a chance I could get better. This is completely unfair. I have supplied all the relevant information from my doctors, but they refuse to allow me to be on it. My doctors don't want to do surgery as it's currently not life-threatening, just life-impacting. Quality of life has plummeted. And the medication I am on is helping a little bit, not enough, that I could return to how my life was before. 
Not only does the amount need to increase, but there needs to be an in-between payment between job seeker and the disability support pension. I have to constantly supply three-month medical certificates from my GP that I am still unwell to work. But if I'm delayed by not even one to two days, then the job seeker agencies swoop in and demand I see them, otherwise my payments will be cut. It is a shameful, humiliating experience having to deal with them and Centrelink. Being on JobSeeker, I receive approximately $700 a fortnight with rent assistance. My rent has just increased to $360 a week. I live out of home with no chance of being able to move back home to my parents as there just isn't any room. I'm lucky that I have a partner that's happy to support me, but it's humiliating having to live off your partner's income. My money from Centrelink goes straight into rent as well as trying to help out wherever I can with other bills. I can't even afford my own groceries, as a majority of it goes to my side of rent, and whatever is left gets, generally gets eaten up by other bills—electricity and car-related expenses. I've gone through any savings I had, and most weeks I'm left with not even $10 to spend on myself. Something needs to change, as our most vulnerable are living in poverty. How could anyone actually look for work that would help them improve their lives or their children's lives if they can't even provide food or a roof over their heads? How is anyone that is sick but not sick enough for disability supposed to focus on getting better when they are too busy trying to figure out how they are going to eat, where they are going to sleep? We should be doing everything we can to make the lives of everyone around us better. If something happened to you, and you suddenly found yourself with no income but Centrelink, how would you feel? How would you feel if you were stuck on Centrelink because you couldn't work due to illness and could barely afford your rent? Now, this is Kelly's story. Hi, I'm currently 45 years old on the disability support pension with chronic health issues and severe mental health issues, and I'm currently homeless due to my very limited income. It's near impossible for me to find another rental. I was evicted six months ago from my previous rental of nine years because the real estate wanted to double the rent and couldn't do so with me in the property. I'm currently staying in a caravan park, which is dangerous and very unsafe for my health, paying $350 per week, with no cooking facilities, no heating, no in-home bathroom facilities, etc., and my health and mental health have never been so bad. I'm also now separated from my carer and my family members again dangerous to my health, as there isn't enough room here. And now Elizabeth's story. I'm a 33-year-old woman on the disability support pension. I get the privilege of paying about $7,500 a year out of pocket for my treatment and live in an NRAS studio apartment, which is $13,000 a year in rent. My annual income, according to Centrelink for this financial year, was $23,000. As a disabled person, that leaves me $3,000 a year to eat, pay utilities and travel for treatment. Home ownership is not a possibility for me. I've resigned myself to the fact that I won't be able to have a family because I can't even afford to socialise with peers, let alone date. Yet I've had to endure robo-debt collections, job service providers cancelling my payments because they didn't attend the meeting they set, being told to search for eight to ten jobs a week when I've supplied documents saying I'm in hospital, recovering from having, having an organ surgically removed, threats of being forced into Certificate I vocational training classes when I have an undergraduate degree. The problem is not that I don't want to work or that I can't navigate recruiting processes. The problem is that to the Australian government, my value as a human is tied directly to my productivity and the amount of income tax I can pay. I want to work. I know I've got skills and experience in communication, advocacy, event planning, executive assistance. I've run my own business in the past. I've got a tertiary education. Job service providers would tell me to apply for factory work, despite physical impairments, an inability to get to the job for the 5 a.m. start time and my inability to actually complete that type of work. Recruiters wouldn't consider my application seriously anyway. Yet I'd be bullied by the provider into applying to meet my obligations and not have payments cut. How can any government say they are representing the people who vote for them 
when they intentionally look at a group of people who are physically incapable of work through age, impairment or an inaccessible job market and decide to intentionally force them to endure being bullied by service providers, all to have to call Centrelink and beg to receive payments well below the poverty line. Quality of life is non-existent. It's humiliating, dehumanising, psychologically harmful and, as proven by robo-debt, potentially fatal to have to endure. I've thought on more than one occasion I literally cannot afford to be alive right now. And finally, I'd like to share the experience of someone who was on income support while they were studying. I left a full-time position in 2016 to attend university, relying on Centrelink to support my studies as I was unable to find find an appropriate part-time position willing to be flexible around my uni schedule. Despite dumpster diving for food and living in cramped shared accommodation, income support was so low that I often couldn't afford the bus to class, which severely affected my ability to study. Due to my poor standard of living, I got really sick and could not access the diagnostic tests my GP recommended as there were out-of-pocket expenses that were not covered by Medicare. I suffered with an undiagnosed, treatable illness for nearly five years because Centrelink is too low to access medical care. This obviously prolonged my degree and therefore cost the government more money to support me while I finished it. The income support over COVID meant that I could access the tests I needed. I was diagnosed and went through surgery in late 2020. Since then, I've been able to finish my degree, get a job in my field and resume paying tax. My heart breaks for people still trapped in poverty while the cost of everything skyrockets around us. Please do something. Thank you to Nicholas, to Kelly, to Elizabeth and to everyone who has shared their stories with me and given me the opportunity to share them here in the Senate tonight. These stories reveal an income support system that is broken a system that is punishing people in poverty and failing to dismantle barriers to employment. It is time for the Albanese government to listen to people on income support. It is time to raise the rate of all income support payments to above the poverty line and to abolish punitive mutual obligations. Come on! this new government. It is time. This Senate stands adjourned and will meet again tomorrow at 9.30am.